Hooray! This is episode 350 of The Scene and the Unseen and I don't know how I got here but I'm so glad I did and I'm going to keep going. The show started seven years ago and week after week I've just gotten the job done. In fact, even now I'm not going to think about episode 400 but about episode 351. My approach towards The Scene and the Unseen is this. I do every episode with full-on intensity but the moment it is done, it is done. I shift my full focus to the next one. And every time it is Kator Ribhaji, Kator Ribhaji, Kator Ribhaji. If you don't know what that means, check out the episode of Everything is Everything listed at the end of the show notes. Meanwhile, the question arises, what was I going to do for this milestone episode? In episode 200, my friend and frequent guest Shruti Rajgopalan recorded a bunch of questions from many of my guests and I was in the firing line for five hours. In episode 250, I got a dear personal friend, the great storyteller Narendra Shinoy, to tell some stories. In episode 300, my guest was Pratap Bhanu Mehta and his appearance is cause for celebration itself. Episode 299 and 301 are also among my favorites. For 350, I took the approach of 250. Get a personal friend I admire and have learned from. So this is a special episode for me. So once I release it, I will work for the next episode. Ye khatam. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen. My guest today is Sudhir Sarnabhat, an entrepreneur and thinker who has inspired me to be more intentional about many of the things that I do. Sudhir's personal story is fascinating. He came from a humble Marathi-speaking background without any of the privileges city slickers like me take for granted. At every step of his life, he had to fight. Nothing came easy. But by sheer force of will, he made himself a career, then he built himself a business, sold the business, and has now started another one. But the key reason I admire him is intentionality. He takes nothing in his life for granted and he works hard on every aspect of it. Friendships, relationships, knowledge gathering, self-improvement, etc. etc. He's on a constant quest, a disciplined quest to understand the world better and has now started a business revolving around frameworks of how to think about business. He's lived such an interesting life across two domains, the geographical, physical world we all inhabit and the world of ideas. This is an episode I enjoyed recording. For the first half, around two and a half hours, we do a deep dive into his life. In the second half, we talk ideas and learnings. It's a hell of an episode. Listen in. Do you want to read more? I've put in a lot of work in recent years in building a reading habit. This means that I read more books, but I also read more long-form articles and essays. There's a world of knowledge available through the internet. But the problem we all face is, how do we navigate this knowledge? How do we know what to read? How do we put the right incentives in place? Well, I discovered one way. A couple of friends of mine run this awesome company called CTQ Compounds at ctqcompounds.com, which aims to help people up-level themselves by reading more. A few months ago, I signed up for one of their programs called The Daily Reader. Every day for six months, they sent me a long-form article to read. The subjects covered went from machine learning to mythology to mental models and marmalade. This helped me build a habit of reading. At the end of every day, I understood the world a little better than I did before. So if you want to build your reading habit, head on over to CTQ Compounds and check out their Daily Reader. New batches start every month. They also have a great program called Future Stack which helps you stay up to date with ideas, skills and mental models that will help you stay relevant in the future. Future Stack batches start every Saturday. What's more, you get a discount of a whopping 2,500 rupees, 2,500 if you use the discount code UNSEEN. So head on over to CTQ Compounds at ctqcompounds.com and use the code UNSEEN. Uplevel yourself. Sudhir, welcome to the scene and the unseen. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you so much. So, you know, I've been planning to do this episode for a long time. And this is, of course, episode 350 of the scene and the unseen. And let's sort of start by g- taking a broad view of what you're doing these days. What are you up to these days? What keeps you up at night with excitement? I hope nothing keeps you up with worry. What are you engaged in these days? So these days, uh, I am working on an idea of mine, uh, working on something called uh, How Frameworks. That's a company that, so we have a company between me and one of my co-founder, Mr. Rajendra Bagwe. He is from Nasik. Uh, he is a veteran uh, industrialist, runs his own company and uh, almost retired now. And he's uh, working with 
he's a, he has his own organization called TLC Teaching and Learning Community uh, for last I think since 2005 he's working on it. So he basically teaches uh, certain ideas and management principles to various companies. Almost now more than thousand companies in his uh, stable TLC members are there, and these companies uh, basically are small and medium enterprises, uh, right from Nasik, Pune, Aurangabad, Sangli, Satara, Kolhapur area. And uh, his motto is basically to uh, kind of un- making Indian entrepreneurs succeed, and they are working to reach around ten thousand entrepreneurs by twenty thirty. So I met Mr. Bagwe around five years back. Uh, he is basically a consultant for a company that I work with closely. And uh, whenever uh, uh, we used to go with some problem, pain uh, in the business, he would always not give a solution just like that. He would always uh, give me a structure or a framework and tell me that, Ki, no, no, you are seeing this in a wrong way. See it in this manner. And then he would throw a, a framework at us. And then we used to go back and think about it. And that has been happening for the last five years. And uh, then I said that, Ki, oh, this is something which is very different way of looking at things or looking at your critical business issues. And how can this be kind of structured into some kind of a business which can help uh, Indian entrepreneurs? So that's the idea that kind of uh, got built over the last uh, four or five years. And I thought, okay, fine, uh, let me... Uh, just talk to him and see if I can uh, convert this into a business idea. Uh, We had a chat uh, around uh, six months back and uh, he told me that Sudhir, I am any which way retired. So he's uh, 63 now. Yeah, he's uh, 59 born. So he's almost around 63, 64. He runs a company called uh, Reliable Auto Tech, uh, which is a 500 crore auto ancillary company uh, started by three, two, he and his two partners, uh, friends actually. And it's in Nasik. And he says, I have made enough money that my next 10 generations can eat uh, easily. Uh, his son is in US, so he's not coming back to India and working with him. So he said, I don't want to do anything for profit. I want to work, focus on TLC, teaching and learning community. And I want to kind of help Indian entrepreneurs succeed in whatever they are doing. So he, he said that I don't want to do a business. But I said that there is an idea here and uh, we could work about uh, work around it. So he said, I was anyway thinking about writing a book, but if we can make videos out of this and kind of give this knowledge in structured format, that would be uh, something great. So then we kind of uh, brainstormed a bit and spent some time. I had to really convince him to get into something for profit because he's absolutely not wanting to get into anything for profit. But then we uh, kind of agreed. Uh, we spent a couple of days on his uh, farmhouse, beautiful farmhouse he has near Nasik, almost around 10 acre farmhouse. And we sat there, spent time, uh, kind of played around the idea, what can be done. And we finally said, okay, fine. We have uh, for business. So there are a lot of mental models. I think Shane Parrish, if you see mental models, there, there are so many which are for general behavior or general uh, kind of stuff. But we wanted to do only for specific for business business and that too for small and medium enterprises. So any company which is more than let's say 10-15 crores and up to say 200-250 crores. We wanted to only focus on this segment. So he said that yes I have been thinking on a lot of stuff for last now 15-20 years. I have been teaching um, the all these companies also. So we can build uh, definitely around 4 500 such frameworks. So what we are trying to do is basically build frameworks. Uh, so kind of write down those frameworks convert them into videos. Videos are not more than 10 minutes. So max max is 7 to 8 minutes. And uh, there will be a bank of videos like that. So we are uh, planning to launch sometime in the month of February or March, where we will have almost around 100 odd uh, videos. And in the uh, front, on the front end, there will be an algorithm and a questionnaire where you can answer those questions and we can basically then figure out that, oh, your problem is coming out to be this. And he has extensive experience on SME issues. So he has that uh, kind of structured. And then, okay, if you have this problem, then you could have these five or six videos you watch in sequence and this will give you some kind of a thought process. So now we are not wanting to say that we are claiming that we will give you a solution. What we are doing is that we are making entrepreneurs think about their problem. So what happens is that India per se, a lot of people talk about India's Jugad and say that it's a fantastic thing. And I think I hate that word because I feel Jugad is something that you try to do. It's it's about survival. It's about trying to do some stuff to make it happen. Jugad cannot scale. 
so i have this thought process always that ki if you want to build a two story house you go to a local mason and load bearing walls and you build it but if you have to make a 100 story building if you have to make a large structure then you first go to a structural engineer and that structural engineer will create a framework of the building first so when you are wanting to build an organization then that organization needs to be on certain structures and those structures are what we are trying to kind of think about and kind of give it to entrepreneurs so that those entrepreneurs can then uh, use those uh, to kind of kindle some thoughts and then move towards solution so at early stage any business will have a certain critical business issues and they will move from issues to issues that's the way the business operate but while they are doing this they also need to think in structures for the business and kind of move forward to grow the business so i think that's something that i am kind of working on currently and what's the company called what's the business model? so business is uh, howframeworks.com that's the website and the company is called middle stand business solutions that's the name of the company we formed the company around couple of months back and that's kind of just we we just made one payment a couple of days back so that's how it has started it just nascent fantastic very exciting and th- there's this great line i came across in one of the pieces you wrote uh, or perhaps it's it's in your linkedin profile where where you wrote a few paras about yourself and you said we need to transform doer entrepreneurs into thinker entrepreneurs and i'm very sort of interested in this distinction because it strikes me that when someone becomes an entrepreneur you'll start with an idea so you're a thinker at that point but then you go from tackling one fire after another reacting to things that happen and uh, you so much of the time goes into doing that you don't have time to take a step back and think in broader ways and uh, and is that in your own uh, and though we'll go in detail uh, through your own entrepreneurial journey uh, 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 later in the episode but just at a broader level is that a journey that you found yourself forced to make did you make it late um, were you there early does it take a certain kind of person like some people are more naturally doer kind of people and some people can do the thinking kind of people but then they don't do so in in this situation to take someone running a business and sort of you know show them another lane make them you know skip back and show them the uh, other underlying layers you know what is how has that journey been for you personally and we can begin with that so I think I was a doer, and uh, among my friends who also uh, we have worked together, uh, everybody used to say you are a doer, and I enjoy doing. But over a period of time, once I started, I started my own company in nineteen ninety seven, ninety eight, and once we start growing that company, I started realizing that doing just is not enough. You need to think. and just uh, it's not just do thinking you need to think and do do and think uh, that that combination needs to be there but uh, thinking is very important and thinking in structures is uh, helpful because in business you will keep on coming out with issues one after other and unless and until you go to the basics of the business you you will not be able to solve them in a real format otherwise what happens is that you start solving the symptoms not the real uh, cause of the business so i i look at business as very simple thing that ki create value that's the most important part and then make profit these are the two things if you if you focus on these two things very clearly you can actually do wonderful business everything else then becomes complexity but the pure pure thing is you have to create value you cannot not create value but at the same time you have to make profit because if you want the business to continue you need to make profit so over a period of time i think the journey was that when i was uh, ignorant i was smart or i was actually very confident and then over a period of time i started seeing smarter people i started seeing that kiyas there are blind spots that i have had and then my i didn't lose my confidence but i started seeing things with a little kind of i started thinking about it that ki am i doing things right is there a blind spot that i have and i became i think more humble the self reflection help i started so so whenever i my email has a quote that ki if you are in the if you are the smartest person in the room you are in the wrong room that is the mm-hmm. kind of a quote that i have and i keep that quote keeps me reminding that i want to be in the room where there are smarter people smarter than me uh, i always uh, worked whenever in business i never hired people who are dumber than me i said you know i need to hire smarter people uh, at certain point of time 
the people whom i had hired uh, had uh, took more salary than i took home so at sort of in our business i we paid them more salary and then we had uh, me and my partner we had debates how can we give them more salary than us and i said oh, we have equity we are creating value but that person does not have equity and if that person does not have equity and if he is smarter then we need to give him more salary so we had uh, followed those principles so all these things came after a kind of self reflection after kind of uh, thinking about stuff uh, that we were doing and i realized that uh, thinking is as much important as doing just doing doesn't uh, work uh, thinking thinking in frames is what matters so i think that's something which i learned over a period of time through my professional journey i love the quote about if you're the smartest person in the room you're in the wrong room but that leads me to a game theory problem mm-hmm. that if everybody believes that then whenever there's a room full of people mm-hmm. the smartest person will leave because he's in the wrong room and then the next smartest person will leave because she's in the wrong room and so on down the line and obviously i'm kidding the guard against this is that everybody has you the smartest people have humility so they will never True. acknowledge themselves True. as the smartest True. people True. so that kind of helps True. but otherwise you get into a game theoretic situation where there's nobody <laughs> in a room because everybody had to leave True. one by one uh, anyway i'm just kidding and you know i want to sort of underscore that profit point also because too many people sort of like I, there is of course a famous quote from nehru to jrd tata where he said never speak to me of profit it is a dirty word and equally there is a quote i forget the exact words but by lee kuan yew you know in the early days of singapore right without profit singapore can never grow True. right and i think that value and profit are intrinsically linked because what is a metric for you to know whether you're creating value or not True. it is profit if you bring you know it's a double thank you moment if uh, you're bringing value to someone they will pay you for it and so one uh, the metric for whether you're creating value or not is profit and two the incentive to keep creating value is profit it is a best True. incentive so these are linked in such beautiful ways that i somehow sometimes bemoan that attitude where people think of profit as oh exploitation chal raha hai it's dirty they are thinking of money they are materialistic and i'm like no 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 this is you know this is what keeps us moving forward this is what help, helps us you know move ahead but you know quite apart from my little and very characteristic rant i will move to the characteristic line of inquiry and ask you about your childhood because i'm very curious you know where were you born where did you grow up tell me about your parents ah so i'm born uh, in bombay uh, bombay at all the time so i love calling it bombay i have never could resonate with mumbai per se it happened but I never could resonate i am born 1969 uh, in bombay in a place called uh, kanwar nagar in vikroli it's a small uh, typical you would say chawl system uh, that was uh, the mahada the early erstwhile uh, the housing board they used to call housing board then now it is called mahada so those are buildings and those were buildings of 100 square feet 80 square feet house uh, and uh, there are 40 buildings uh, 40 rooms in a building so five story building no elevator we used to stay on a ground floor a corner house and uh, it was basically typically a common gallery then you enter uh, a small uh, drawing room then a kitchen and a bathroom and a toilet uh, five of us used to stay me my elder brother my younger brother came little late of four years after me and uh, dad mom we used to had our uncles so my uh, younger uncles they came from gao so so my father hailed from a place called uh, anzarle which is in konkan and uh, he came to bombay i think in early 60s uh, mid 60s uh, he came we had a very small kind of land and there is mango trees and there are coconut trees that's typical konkan uh, livelihood and uh, he had three other brothers and one sister and uh, the, the typical migration of konkan people they come to bombay and pick up a job so uh, that's how he came he when he came he did not have he is a 10th matriculate pass so he did not have any proper job so i think he uh, dropped the milk line is one you drop milk in the morning you drop paper in the morning that kind of a stuff he did to start with he stayed with the one of his uh, uh, maternal sister uh, again uh, they had a house in somewhere in chinspokli uh, which is a typical uh, the cotton mill hub and they also had a very small house so these guys would sleep in the common gallery or maybe sometimes on the footpath early time that that must be around 67 68 then 
so our, our uh, ancestral place they uh, typically he had one uh, kind of a mentor his name and name was uh, vaman nitsure and uh, he uh, stayed in dadar in bombay and he was kind of a mentoring him and he uh, Uh, kind of told him that ki so my father's name is kesho so he'll say kesho you come to me when you come to bombay come to me we'll figure out something my and father's name is also kesho kesho oh mm-hmm. i didn't know that oh my god oh, oh. so uh, he he came to bombay and he did uh, this odd jobs to start with first and uh, then uh, he got this job so this his name was vabha nitsure i still remember that name and uh, he used to stay in a building called siddha road building in bhavani shankar road on dadar and he was a manager in digvijay textile mills so he said you come and uh, maybe we will give you a job and that's how my father got a job which was a stable job then uh, in digvijay textile mills which is in chinspokli lalbag area a typical and i think uh, kannamwar uh, was basically a tenement where people were given uh, so low cost housing it was and uh, uh, you got it through allotment so i think the four flats which were there those four flats were given for the freedom fighters so all our neighbors were freedom fighters and this flat was given to a freedom fighter but that guy i think did not have that 7000 rupees to pay and he didn't want it and then uh, somebody told my father that ki this flat is kind this house is kind of it's not a flat it's a house this house is kind of available and if you f- fill up this form and do this then you will get it and i think in 1968 we got it uh, and my father moved in there it's a reclaimed land completely reclaimed land and i think this entire property or entire land is owned by godresh family i think acres and acres of land and this is a marshy land so they put uh, reclamation and then they built this entire colony called kannavar nagar all uh, typical uh, it's not uh, cosmopolitan it is all maharashtrians all who have come from konkan and everybody is uh, doing small uh, jobs so somebody is in mill but most of them were in mill uh, the cotton mills of bombay and everybody would leave in the morning uh, at 7 7:38 depending upon their shifts and come back in the evening the railway station was around 10 12 minutes so you walk down to the railway station and come back from there that is typically how it started i was in a, a local school called vidya mandir so i finished uh, i did my first to sixth standard uh, from this school called vidya mandir uh, very small school but everybody from there i was a studious kid so i used to study well and uh, there is used to be something called ideal student in every class i used to be ideal student because you study well my handwriting was good so handwriting was one of the good thing then you yeah, agar handwriting acha hai to you are like a good student and that was there and i spent 6 years uh, in that uh, uh, school studied well got first second rank all the time but it was a small pond and i was the king in the small pond so I, i didn't realize that then but now when i look at it i i realize it and my parents used to take pride in their son coming first or second and studious because i think uh, that was the currency uh, my parent my father could not study my mother also was 10 pass so really studying a good and getting a good job was the ultimate objective and uh, everybody around uh, us uh, all the friends around there were uh, average students uh, uh, everybody would go to school uh, play in the afternoon play in the evening uh, study in the late evening and go back we played a lot of cricket so there is a ground uh, in kannavar nagar little smaller than the shivaji park of dadar which is supposed to be a big ground and we used to play in that ground uh, we had small small grounds around and it was typical that rubber ball cricket and uh, uh, during the summer vacations uh, start at around 8 o'clock in the morning cricket playing cricket come back at 1 eat have lunch again go out at 2 o'clock play up to 6 o'clock that kind of a life we had in terms of extracurricular activity playing cricket was something which was there and i think i remember uh, this time is the big time uh, used to be big time uh, ganpati so ganpati will come and then those uh, seven days 11 days ganpati so there is a common ganpati of kannavar nagar there are multiple common ganpatis which are there and i remember uh, going from house to house uh, with aarti there is to be aarti so you uh, play aarti at one place eat prasad go to a so at least you do three four houses in the building uh, i remember all that used to be fun then 
in terms of so so uh, until 6th standard this was the scene uh, every summer holiday we used to go to gao so go to our uh, in, dad's ancestral place that i think we did until 6th or 7th or 8th standard go every summer spend a month ga- at our gao and uh, kind of have mangoes go around to the, the, the seashore so go to the beach there every evening and kind of chill relax uh, kind of a life then uh, typically not uh, much of a money so it was a lower middle class kind of childhood uh, so fairly good amount of scarcity so live on stuff that you have that's the kind of a mentality in marathi uh, they say that ki ahe tachat bhagwa so basically you kind of manage in what you have don't aspire too much so it was more about savings was a focus than earning income was a focus because earning income the limitation of what you can earn was already kind of self imposed and that kind of went on as a thought process which i think i bunked over a period of time but uh, and that is something that was inculcated into us uh, uh, very clearly and everybody around us used to think in the same way that if one has to uh, so so no nobody in our family uh, ever did business uh, everybody was a, a employee of some company or some mill or something like that my uncle tried a business later on but otherwise everybody took kind of a job and uh, worked on the job in terms of reading i think uh, we used to read a lot of newspaper so we used to get a newspaper a marathi newspaper i i have my entire reading until 10th standard has been marathi only i never read anything english i don't know classics uh, i've never read that uh, i never had access to that and uh, so so i didn't know how it is done so we used to read uh, newspapers uh, there was a typical lok satta is a marathi newspaper there was maharashtra times so it is called mata then there was a sakal and then there was something called nav shakti these were the four newspapers and again if you look at the brahmanical hierarchy so mata used to be kind of read by all people who are little better off then lok satta then sakal and then nav shakti that hierarchy also was there i i distinctly remember that we used to get lok satta and uh, some people who Uh, used to do a labor job kind of uh, in a mill so my father was in a clerical job so he was little better off and somebody who is doing labor job would read nav shakti because it had very hard hitting articles against the government and against the poverty and the whole lot we used to read uh, i think there used to be a chandoba karke ek marathi mein aata hai so we used to read that when i became uh, in the 7th and 8th standard uh, when when i went i think i started reading thrillers in marathi so there is a uh, on there used to be an author called uh, babur arnalkar uh, i think he has written more than 1500 books and he had these uh, typical characters called kada kala pahad junzar or dhananjay used to read that then there is uh, to be a, another uh, known author very well known author called suha shirwalkar and he had these characters called barrister amar vishwas and dara buland and feroz irani all those interesting characters so i have read all those then uh, there I, i think that memory is uh, very hazy now but i still remember that i used to read them during the normal time but more so during the diwali holidays and summer holidays diwali interesting thing happens in marathi is uh, diwali ank i don't know uh, this is a very uh, interesting tradition in marathi uh, maharashtrian houses that ki you you enjoy diwali but you also enjoy the diwali literature which is to come so there is to be a magazine called awaz there is to be a magazine called jatra Uh, menka was a little romance and kind of they would have this female with a kind of cleavage shown and all and parents would like you know don't read that those kind of stuff used to happen there was uh, lok prabha there was lok satta there was mouse there was mahir this whole lot of so so you would get at least 3 4 diwali ank uh, during that diwali period and then you would read them uh, and a very interesting kind of a tradition that was there you read that was the kind of overall reading so that's that's the kind of life that i led everybody around us was lower middle class so the aspirations there were that ki you kind of get any education that will make you employable then you get a job then uh, best best is that you buy a two wheeler get married and buy one more house with whatever uh, that 
you would uh, do in terms of and and i think the migration was wo vikroli ka public uh, thane jayega ya dombili jayega ya kalyan jayega wahan pe agar tumhara abhi you have one room kitchen then you buy one bhk i think that was the one bed bhk is one bedroom kitchen house and i think that's the kind of and then you are done your your life is ho gaya life set ho gaya that was the kind of aspiration i had friends who became who, who drove kind of auto rickshaw later on i still have friends who did that kind of a job i i got a job but they were doing auto rickshaw drivers uh, i have this interesting uh, anecdote i i re- still remember we used to have a neighbor uh, staying in the opposite building and uh, they were south indian they were from karwar and they had this uh, daughter beautiful daughter very beautiful daughter and uh, she was elder than us and she was getting married and we heard that uh, her father gave 5 lakh dowry and 50 tola or 5 tola or 50 tola i don't remember gold and that was the tradition there and uh, we had uh, one guy who was again senior around i think 6 7 years senior uh, guy called pravin and he was he used to uh, kind of drive auto as a yeah, livelihood he was elder than us and he said what is this uske ye ladki ke liye itna paisa dena pada they had to give 5 lakh and ye mujhe agar 1 lakh rupaya diya hota to i would have bought two autos one auto i would have put on rent another auto i would have kind of run myself and uh, taken a rental house here and i would have made her live like a queen why would they <laughs> give so much money and i still remember that that how people were thinking in terms of what is the best life the best life is having two autos one on rent so you get rent from that the second is something that you drive and that's your livelihood and you take a rental house somewhere in kanwar nagar only and uh, you keep uh, your, your wife uh, like a queen you you have give her a treatment of a queen and i think that's how the overall aspirations of life were life uh, were kind of made or that was that was the influence that i had and uh, it was very difficult for me over a period of time to break through those shackles because that influence was so strong that that you, your dreams were so small and uh, that was the kind of uh, I, i today i look at my life uh, and i i find it so i'm so fortunate that i could come out of that kind of a uh, poverty that kind of a uh, middle class life it's not just about money it's also about uh, breaking those barriers uh, breaking those uh, mental barriers that were there because because everybody was like that and i i i carried the same thing and i have still have friends so who who thought in a similar way but then uh, many of them they got out of that place so that was the life so my father always wanted us to kind of uh, break free from that uh, and uh, he wanted and uh, the, pa- the passport for that was education so uh, my elder brother was made to go for an engineering diploma so after 10th uh, he did 12th and then could not get enough marks so then he went to do a diploma diploma in electronics uh, uh, in domuli my father i think that was a pivotal moment uh, in the 6th standard uh, i was there and uh, Uh, his mentor that vaman nitsure who used to stay on siddhar in siddharud building on bhavani shankar road in dadar uh, he told my father that ki uh, if you want your son to get admission to good college then you need to move him from vikroli school to different school and in the 6th standard my he told that ki on my wherever i stay he, st- he stays on bhavani shankar road couple of buildings away is shardashram school shardashram is famous sachin tendulkar school so he said that ki shardashram is there so you get admitted him get his admission in shardashram and it should help him because there is a technical wing there so after eighth standard there used to be something called technical subjects and if you are from a technical stream then getting a admission in diploma is kind of a easier thing to do so uh, you you get i think special there is a technical quota used to be there and uh, my father said so my father was absolute obedient so when mr nitsure is saying something then he will do it so he went to the school he filled up the form and i think in the 6th standard this must be i think 1981 i uh, i got admission to shadashram school and i moved and uh, the first year i traveled by train so from vikroli to dadar i used to go by train in 7th standard and uh, then uh, 8 9 10th i think i went by 
बस तो दिस वॉज काइंड ऑफ एन इंटरेस्टिंग चेंज इन लाइफ बिकॉज that helped me go to a different stream that helped me uh, get admission to vgti later on that actually uh, i did my engineering diploma there and that changed the life in a way so that was a kind of a pivotal moment what i remember is that i always felt so so there was a clear cut separation uh, of territories i would say so i would al- i always thought that somebody who is living in the other is richer than us i didn't know that nothing like that was there but i always had that imagination or i always had that thought so south bombay was never i never understood what is south bombay then uh, south bombay as a concept i got to know only after i my engineering until that south bombay and so we never mingled in that area we 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 lived in vikroli we went max to ghatkopar which was the next uh, kind of a suburb dadar was always something which was kind of a shopping district for us so my mom wants to buy some sarees or we want to buy some stuff we would go to dadar and dadar we i always thought uh, until i went to uh, one of my friends house after in visit in sadashram uh, there is a guy used to be uh, one, one of my friend uh, he used to stay in dadar only uh, and uh, when i went to his house and i saw the spartan house no furniture and anything at that time i realized that kias people in dadar also are poor not that <laughs> yeah so, so until then i always thought that ki somebody who lives in dadar is rich person or richer person richer than us i had that kind of a thought process so i went to sadashram that uh, and then sadashram was again marathi school sadashram is where the kind of uh, educational competition started coming in but there are smarter kids and i went and i typically so because it's a new school so you don't get uh, kind of accepted among the people and so i was i i was with the students who used to sit back benchers uh, again sadashram had a healthy mix of Uh, people who are coming from bdd chol so uh, i don't know whether you know uh, there is an area called bdd chol in worli and in nagao these are typical again similar tenements like what kanwar nagar is uh, one room kitchen kind of houses and all uh, cha these is people from mills they they work there or a small printing presses in and around lower parel those people would stay there and uh, that is a typical again lower middle class housing and those kids used to be in sadasham school also so i was in this uh, standard uh, c 7c would uh, become 8c and 8c is what uh, you would be uh, technical education uh, yes to a kind of a stream i went there i there was a already a hierarchy of numbers so uh, what is your rank used to kind of decide your friends and even the cricket team would be of those kids who are basically who would uh, kind of rank better and then rank lower there would be a different cricket team and first semester happened and uh, first semester i studied well so i used to kind of i was a very sincere student i studied well and i got good marks but i didn't know what was my rank and uh, there was never used to be a rank there used to be num- kind of marks and you get percentages and then people the kids would talk to each other how much is your percent how much is my percent and then they decide who is ranked first and second so there used to be a guy the, the student called uh, vinay kok he used to stood f- stand first and then there was jitendra shirke yeah he was second and ravi samant who is my close friend he is third and then i think uh, prakash bhagat these these names are coming back to me now this is used to be fourth and suddenly they found that their their they are their numbers are uh, so so the teacher told that you are not first to oak and then oak started asking uh, shirke that ki oh are you first and he said no then he went to ravi and said are you first no and then they found that there is this new kid in the school or in the class who is got first and i got first and then then they started accepting me so i got admitted to the cricket team which these kids have and i started playing cricket with them and uh, i got accepted and uh, ravi used to stay just across uh, the school so he used to stay in shardasham society which is just a road across uh, we used to call so when the school used to start at 7:15 he would leave from home at 7:14 and come in 1 minute to school <laughs> that kind of a thing used to happen so sadasham we i never got into school cricket team because we had fantastic cricketers sachin was already there when i was in 10 sachin was in 8 and uh, there is a v section the, the, uh, our school is a kind of a c uh, shaped and uh, and the v 
on the front and uh, first and second floor you would see the glasses are broken those were straight drives that were hit by cricketers wow. who would break the glasses and those all glasses they yeah, never bothered yeah. of fixing those glasses because they would get broken every now and then so sachin was there minut kamli was there i think we know the taram pandit who used to stay in chembur was chandrakant pandit's younger brother who used to come the good fantastic amul cricketers mujumda, yeah, amul mujumda. these guys were these guys amul mujumda i think came much later because i think uh, we we were out of the school until then but i distinctly remember uh, chandrakant pandit dattaram pandit sachin tendulkar and uh, vinod kamli they were there uh, english medium school again this was no co education so uh, uh, boy school in the morning girl school in the afternoon that kind of a uh, stuff used to happen so that's the story until visit i visit i it standard i did my uh, technical education and uh, completed it in 10 after 10 the focus was basically by that time it was around 85 and uh, the th- focus was uh, get on to a good uh, education so uh, do engineering diploma and um, i had seen my elder brother uh, struggling the 12th standard and i said that okay, okay fine let's do a diploma though i was good i didn't want to do 12th so i did my engineering diploma and i got admission in good college visit ai uh, is a very good college uh, that was there i got admission in visit ai and bagubai which is at parla but i took uh, visit ai and i took a, a engineering stream of mechanical so i i came to uh, visit ai engineering and uh, that was the first time uh, the scare started because until 10th standard uh, the everything every education was in marathi and suddenly it became all turned into english and uh, i could never understand a uh, stuff that was uh, taught in the school uh, in the college uh, i i had already friends so what happened is that uh, my school friend ravi his cousin had done 12th standard and could not get good marks so he came to engineering diploma his name was uh, nandu patkar he used to stay in dadar so he was in my same class and he became my friend he had his friends from his school so they became my friends and that's how my group of 6 to 8 friends uh, got formed so that was a good thing i had kind of somebody whom i could look up to and these kids uh, these all of these guys had already finished uh, 12th standard so a, a, some education in english had already happened so they were they were good at taking notes and they understood what was happening in the college lectures and all i uh, used to sit next to these kids who were after who had come to engineering diploma after 12th and uh, there was a system that in uh, you, you would go to engineering second year you can kind of again give the exam and go to uh, engineering after first year i think there was something called you do one in your year of uh, engineering or no no you do uh, engineering diploma and then you get uh, second year direct admission to second year of engineering degree something like that was there and these uh, kids uh, used to follow that uh, stuff that if you don't get good marks uh, to go to a engineering college uh, after 12th for a uh, degree then you come do diploma and then get a admission so instead of uh, doing the degree in 12 plus 4 they would do it in i think 6 years but you get to do the degree something of that sort was there so this all uh, students were there and because they understood what was happening in the lecture in english i used to sit next to somebody like that so there used to be i, I remember there was a guy called karan jekar very good handwriting i used to sit next to him and copy what he had written in this and then kind of understand that so visit i somewhere i learned that there are smarter people in the world so i i had uh, come out from that small pond of sadashram where i used to stand first or second in the class but uh, visit i i could never get that rank there were absolute way 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 smart kids and, and then i i was in i used to get around 70 80% marks and i used to kind of pass through the stuff but never close to passing marks but never at the top of the school and i did uh, the entire engineering sincerely we had a interesting concept uh, during diploma there it is the fifth semester and eighth semester is where you would go and work in industry so during my fifth semester you had to go for an implant that used to be called implant training and you you would go to kind of uh, uh, co- so companies used to send a, a kind of invitation for implant training and you kind of go give small interview and they would take you as a trainee 
and they will pay you stipend also i still remember uh, my engineering uh, semester fee was something like 600 rupees for the entire semester and the stipend used to be around 3 350 400 rupees a month so uh, rather i would i would kind of uh, make more money uh, in those 6 months uh, than my entire uh, kind of uh, college fees so it was interesting and i went for there is a company called blue star so they had come and they had sent a kind of request for uh, students and visit i was supposed to be a very good college in bombay then and uh, i went to uh, so me and there was another uh, friend of mine sanjay maikar both of us we used to uh, both of us we went to early bandbox house and uh, gave the interview there so sanjay maikar went first and he was asked uh, ki what all kind of system so in an air conditioning so it's a, it's a air conditioning contract company big company it was number 1 number 2 then and uh, we really had not studied well so we didn't know what would they ask in the ya so uh, he was asked at what are the uh, components in an air conditioning cycle and uh, he said he went and he could say compressor and he could not say the evaporator condenser and uh, there is a expansion wall which i know now but i didn't know then and uh, so he said compressor and he came out and as usual like are kya pucha kya pucha so i asked him kya pucha to then air conditioning cycle pucha maine mere ko malum nahi tha pura lekin maine compressor bata diya and i said yeah i know uh, condenser so i said yeah we, so i went in and he asked me the same question and i said uh, condenser and compressor so i could tell two he could only tell one and i think i got selected <laughs> and that's where uh, my professional uh, kind of journey started i was deputed at uh, a site uh, near worli uh, that was the state bank of india uh, site air conditioning was happening they had some computer center large and uh, we had we were giving a kind of uh, package air conditioners and i was so uh, typically as an training engineer you would be a site supervisor you basically supervise this site so i went i started kind of uh, i had kumar parekh was my first boss there uh, he was he was a guju um, a vegetarian typical guju and a very nice gentleman very nice blue star was a very good company very good training ground for me my entire uh, kind of uh, learning into professional career happened there and uh, um, so so i went uh, and uh, started typical supervising means you arrange for workers you arrange for material for entire stuff and you supervise the quality you get so there used to be ducting there used to be stuff to be done on a typical project site one month into the training and i was told that ki you will have to go to nasik for uh, so because you are appointed on another job site because that job site engineer has got out and that's a bigger site and you need, we need people there and uh, kumar told me that ki you have to go there and meet this uh, gentleman called prashant jadav uh, and uh, he is at this this place and this was told to me at around say 10 10 30 in the morning when i had reached uh, site and i i was i, I said fine uh, so how do i go uh, now the whole point is that ki until then i had never traveled by train to long journey Uh, we, we my uh, uh, place my my place was in konkan and konkan there was no train then we used to go by the uh, straight transport st bus and come back by st bus so i had never traveled by train until then and they they told me no you take a train and you go so uh, what train they said 11:30 there is uh, i think mahanagari express which goes to up that you can go by and uh, i i i i think uh, i had I, yeah we i had a bag uh, to carry my clothes but uh, I, i did not have any other i i had no inkling how to do this and then i asked kumar then and what about money and all he said no 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 go to office uh, I, there used to be our boss called garde so i will he will give you some advance not a problem and then i said that ki i have to go today he said yeah you need to go today i said but then there is no not enough time theek hai theek hai kal ja tu chal no problem kal ja and i said fine and then i went to office i i think i took some advance they gave some 500 rupees advance to me and then i went home then i told my parents that i have to go to nasik and everybody was kind of uh, surprised and shocked they always thought i'll be remain in bombay but uh, i was i i kind of uh, moved out um 
next day morning i packed my bag i go to this uh, the other uh, railway station uh, this train used to come from vt out at 11:30 this train was there and uh, i said uh, i i could not uh, there was no reservation so i was not sure about my seat it used to, it used to take around 4 hours to reach to nasik and so there there are typical those uh, coolies uh, those uh, so they they were there on the station with that red tag and a red uh, kind of dress and one of the guy asked me seat chahiye kya and i said kiske liye dadar na mahanagari express uh, mahanagari express that was not not from dadar that was from vt so i said kitna rupya he said 10 rupya and i said theek hai and i said fine and uh, the train entered uh, the platform and i saw that people are sitting on the so there are three tier berth and uh, so first second and third so middle and third and people are sitting everywhere that train was full and i was like surprised seeing so many people in a train and uh, that guy held my hand and started running and he said run and i was running with him and at the front so we were somewhere in the middle and at the front the first uh, bogey was the unreserved bogey and these people had this habit of putting a towel and claiming seats and those seats then they would sell for 10 rupees for people like us and he held my hand and took me in uh, started running and when i saw that there are people everywhere in the coach i just kind of uh, removed i just no no, no i am not going in this train and i just stopped i said i can't go this is such a crowd and then i was told that i had i knew that there is another train which leaves from uh, dadar that goes to nagpur dadar nagpur which was at 12:30 in the afternoon and that leaves from platform number 6 or 7 in dadar so i just kind of left his hand and uh, he started cursing me because i lost his 10 rupee earning but i just took the flyover the bridge and i just moved to the Yeah, uh, seventh uh, platform number six or seven, and the other Nagpur was uh, there. Uh, it it was already there, I think. Uh, yeah, and it was empty, and because it is only used to go. So then I realized that ki all these UP uh, or Bihar those bound trains be full during that period because that was the farming harvesting period, and all these people would go from Bombay to wherever all those places in UP. and uh, that 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 learning happened and i i went to so from there i left to nasik uh, sat there i think tc came and uh, i think uh, there was an reserved bogey and typically those tcs would take 10 rupees from you and give you the seat and then kind of write ki your name is there because typically there was some quota from nasik so nasik quota would fill up get filled up at nasik so that seat would be empty until nasik and that was a overnight train so you can go sitting until nasik and there no issue so i got my seat i reached nasik then got into a auto and went to this place called hotel raj uh, which is just around 5 minutes away from railway station and uh, i met my boss my uh, mentor my my only boss who uh, i think who who taught me a lot i i am kind of incredibly incredibly kind of uh, indebted to him he i think transformed my life so prashant jadhav Uh, he was my first and last boss only boss i had and uh, he was there sitting uh, at around i reached at around 4:40 12:30 i think 4 4:45 i reached in the evening i still distinct i still remember that room number 13 on the second floor of hotel raj uh, at bitco point and he was sitting there and he was writing something and then he was having his one peg he was having his drink and he he told me come and he said let me finish this what he is doing and i sat there i kept my bag and uh, then after i think 10 minutes he looked up and he said no no i was writing a letter to client so i was just kind of a draft now writing a letter he was writing in a writing pad because i think that time there was no computers I, this is 1987 i am talking about uh, yeah 1987 yeah 85 87 yeah so you were like 18 years old uh, 17 and a half 18 wow. yeah mm. and uh, he he told me i was writing a letter to client the government client and we have to keep our correspondence perfect otherwise we can uh, be uh, we will be impose penalty for delay in the job so you have to keep recording every delay get to the project project of i think 18 months 24 months and project management may you have to keep your ground clear so 
that's uh, Prashant Jado writing his letter and I had already seen the dustbin uh, with uh, I think uh, 10 12 papers thrown in the dustbin so he had already written some seven eight drafts of the letter and thrown them very meticulous guy so he just gave me that and then uh, he told me okay fine so you are going to be the site engineer on this project called currency note press uh, we have a, a contract of 1.37 crores then i remember this huge 1.37 crores uh, in 87 is like today some 15 20 crore 25 crore project and you are going to be the site engineer i am going to be the project engineer and he just he had this vip ka briefcase so that is a interesting uh, thing about briefcases briefcase was a symbol of sophistication so if you have a briefcase that means you have arrived something like that yeah, yeah. yeah i remember and that those typical vip ecolac briefcase he had he opened that briefcase he had that number lock and he took out a uh, packet and he gave it to me that packet was uh, 5000 rupees cash and he gave it to me and he said sudhir this is the money for spending site and all our expenses here uh, so this is the money you start spending that was the first time I had a bundle of 5,000 rupees in my hand ever. In uh, today's money, that would be like 2-3 lakhs. I don't know how much it would be. I never really kind of mentally calculated that. But it's but priceless for you. Uh, priceless. I never had that kind of money in my hand ever. And that kind of... Um, I, I look at that moment and I feel ki what kind of a... Co what confidence one can get with money in the hand. Because I was always... Uh, never, money was never there. So... So that money, that packet was kind of, so you can spend this money and uh, you can uh, kind of have this in your hand itself was a huge uh, confidence booster. I was a lanky kid. I had, uh, so, so I was not, uh, not a very impressive personality. I was not very tall. I have five feet, seven and a half inches then. And confidence was lacking because money was lacking and that was there. And this kind of uh, something Prashant gave me was a huge confidence booster. Uh, I never realized that then. Uh, now when I look back all those years and I see that key, that moment was a very pivotal moment uh, in life where you could spend the money. And Prashant later on, he, he took me around. So he, he did a lot of things for me. Uh, he actually treated me like a younger brother or a kind of a, maybe he, his kid was, he had just had a daughter who was one and a half year old, one year old. Zai. So uh, we became very close, pretty close later on. Prashant and me, Prashant, we are in touch. Prashant is in Pune now, but Prashant is in touch. We are in touch. So that's my kind of a professional career started. This was, the project was about modernization of currency note press. So where all our notes get printed in Nasik, uh, that entire press was getting modernized. They were kind of air conditioning the entire place and they had imported machines from Germany, and Belgium and Holland and those were kind of uh, super fast uh, money or the, the currency printing machines and these machines would uh, kind of it's a very uh, fantastic technology so the entire hall would be kind of air conditioned and uh, had to have very precise temperature and more than temperature humidity also uh, humidity is because uh, if uh, you have a higher humidity and then the paper would stick to each other so you had a miss uh, print happening and if uh, the humidity is uh, kind of low then the ink on the ink uh, the head would dry so wow. you had to have perfect 55% RH, 55% relative humidity, plus or minus 5% then. So you could go down to 50 and max to 60. Beyond 60, paper would stick. Below 50, ink would dry. So that was a very precision uh, kind of uh, uh, air conditioning then. That's where I learned air conditioning in Blue Star. So I was doing my college. So this was a six month stint. So I used to go to every Monday, I used to go to Nasik and every Friday I used to come back, uh, spend uh, time. And then sometimes I used to stay in Bombay for on Monday also to arrange material and get stuff done in a yeah. Blue Star uh, headquarter was in Worli, uh, the bandbox house. I think uh, next door was Dunlop where Sunil Gavaskar used to work. Uh, Nirlon, no, Nirlon used to be next door and Sunil Gavaskar used to work. So we used to kind of say, okay, Sunil Gavaskar is here. Cricket was the kind of fascination then still. And that's how it was. Blue Star kind of gave me a lot of uh, learning or air conditioning. My professional uh, kind of grounding happened there. Project management, I learned there. 
uh, prashant was a, was a very good teacher he's a, basically a teacher so he taught me all the ropes how do you manage a project how do you kind of uh, get stuff done the coordination the logistics of material um, there is to be a lot of stuff used to happen in terms of logistics alone uh, octrai was very peak then so there were four octrai nakas on nasik one is from bombay one is from gujarat one is from up bihar uh, so yeah one is from pune so material used to come from all places so they the material used to get stuck because uh, you have to go and pay octrai so we used to carry cash and pay octrai and uh, I, I that was my job so take a whenever i used to go and there was no mobiles then so landline so they would call on my hotel landline and they would uh, tell us that the truck has come then you go and get release the truck pay the octrai or uh, uh, sometime uh, so we had because it was a government uh, institution the octrai was uh, exempted so we used to get octrai exemption certificate so show the octrai exemption certificate and sometimes uh, we used to get material for other sites also so that coordination work was my job uh, going to uh, site and supervising the work supervising the quality supervising the timelines that was my job and uh, that's how i spent 6 uh, months uh, at nasik we used to stay in that hotel raj and that was uh, room number 13 14 and 15 uh, the corner rooms uh, we had so i had asked why prashant why we ask for only these uh, three rooms and he said kid ki only these three rooms have toilets with uh, blue tiles and they look nice otherwise every toilet each every other toilet has white tiles and the joints have kind of yellowed and that's he didn't like so he says we used to say that ki these are the only three rooms that we would stay so 13 14 and 15 number room and for the entire next uh, so after uh, 87 i again came back to blue star in 89 for my second stint of implant training and then i got job also in blue star so all these years i stayed in that room number either 13 14 or 15 on the second floor of that hotel raj have you been there recently uh, yeah that hotel is closed down recently i went to pune from nasik and i saw i just halted for a minute there I uh, stopped my car there and that hotel is closed down i remember we used to pay uh, 40 rupees a day as a rent there and they used to give us a room on monday to friday but they used to not have any other guest in those three rooms so they would fill those rooms when all other rooms are filled we had rapport with the owners i think the jaju family in nasik they used to own that hotel hotel raj and hotel raj annex and then there was a biryani fantastic biryani place down there called cafe park and then there was a raymond uh, showroom there which that family had a franchise for raymond uh, very interesting times uh, and we used to travel by auto the auto rickshaw uh, and that was uh, one rupee per seat so there there is a small route and uh, everybody would go by uh, share auto and they would have three or four passengers in the back side and two passengers in the front and you pay a rupee and you travel like that so that was my uh, first thing uh, learned a lot we used to the the so the client was the india security currency note press but it was uh, being done by the central government contracting wing called cpwd central public works department so the blue star contract was with cpwd cpwd's client was uh, india's uh, currency note press so that was a three way a so the user was currency note press the agency was uh, cpwd and cpwd had uh, their regional office in bombay and we used to kind of interact for any major work we used to interact there that's how my 6 months passed came back to college again for the 6th semester and 7th semester engineering was interesting a friendship was there so everybody had gone to their implant trainings in the 5th semester 6th semester we all came back uh, we had a group of friends and we were more uh, in the canteen and we, we were in so uh, so if you know uh, visitaya visitaya is in matunga and that entire area is full of colleges so visitaya opposite next to visitaya was a khalsa college opposite visitaya was ud city which is now i think uh, university of chemical technology used to call then then don bosco school then sndt uh, which was the women's college down there so all these five six colleges and there was a one bus stop there and we used to sit on that bus stop and we used to play cards uh, or either we were on that katta or we used to be on that uh, or in the canteen 
we were kind of we are, i had friends so five six friends of us uh, so nandu patkar uh, who was my friend of my, my cousin of my friend close friend ravi and then uh, there was mahesh uh, mahesh kadam then there was girish nare then there was bhumesh patil there was sanjay maikar and me and then there were a couple of kids from dombivli who were also but they were on off in our group but these six people we we, we were together and we used to play cricket uh, we used to play cards on that katta and, and watch snt girls passing oh, through oh yes 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 watch snt girls passing through uh, nandu had a crush on one girl and he wanted to ask uh, her some day out and I, i think he he even went and uh, yeah i i i remember she that girl used to stay in the building next and she used to go to some college and used to come back by that bus there and mvc 69 i think that was the car number uh, we, we used to call that uh, girl mvc 69 <laughs> uh, and nandu used to kind of uh, wanted to ask her out and i think uh, i think he made a fiasco of that mere ko tere se aisa kuch pyar hai aisa kuch to he started he, he, he i think kind of uh, stumbled on I, i i don't remember that exactly but something like that happened yeah but that was it i the so sitting on that katta was one but i think i remember one distinct memory we have i don't know which year is that but zavid miandad was playing and that was i think who was that baller who uh, zavid miandad chetan sharma six, uh, chetan sharma ah uh, chetan sharma sit he six was, on the last ball i think it was 1986 in charge ah uh, so i think that that memory i have very clear we had a damn a mad headache after that because we were listening to that match uh, very intently and then last ball and that six chetan sharma six miandad and we were like ha- major headache itna gali diya tha itna gali diya tha chetan sharma ko us time so i remember that that was a very distinct memory on that katta we were sitting on that katta and we were listening to match all six of us yeah so that was interesting time uh, we came back to college uh, spent 6th and 7th standard so that was it nothing great in the college uh, typical studies passed through the exams we always did well nandu was a very sharp kid a very intellectual very very intelligent boy uh, girish nare another intelligent boy very very studious very good at maths i was never good at maths uh, like naren is good at maths but i am not good naren can understand calculus naren can understand integration mere ko nahi jamta hai so i should tell the listeners you are referring to a mutual friend naren chinoy yeah yeah so i i i always had phobia of maths i don't know why but i had when naren keeps saying that ki it was our math was bad because the teachers were not good uh, i i agree to some extent but i never was uh, inclined towards maths in a way but these kids were very good and we used to have these exams so what was hap- what what used to happen is there would, there would be all the six subjects that we had for semester there would be exams uh, so math was there for first year and second year and maths you would 50 marks uh, paper and every monday exams would happen two exams would happen every monday and best of three exams they would kind of take for the final so final exam would have a weightage of 50 50 so your unit test weightage of 50% and final exam weightage of 50% uh, nandu and girish uh, they used to get 50 out of 15 in maths uh, brilliant kids and nandu to was like damn arrogant so there used to be three or i think yeah three questions or two two questions of 25 marks each or i think three questions of 15 plus one small question of five marks that used to be there and they would give said ki there are total eight questions attempt any three so nandu would solve all eight and he would write a note that ki uh, check any three <laughs> that kind of a confidence he used to have because the uh, marks of first two exams would be out and then people would not take the third uh, exam uh, so to keep the attendance they would not give the marks of the second exam until the third exam is done but nandu and girish were such kids that they would never used to sit third exam because they were so confident that ke second exam mein they would get good marks they will never sit for third exam very good very studious kids how much would you get on 50 out of 50 i would get something like 27 28 nothing more than that i think that was what i was uh, never 21 22 or 20 was a passing mark then but 27 28 max i used to get but other subjects i used to do 
pretty good but maths was i was i am still scared i am even today math i am scared my my numbers are good i understand numbers well my percentages are well i can quickly do that mental math but if you ask me calculus if you ask me integration i could never understand that with one of my friend uh, uh, he when he told me the industrial application of what he learned in terms of uh, integration i was kind of zapped so that i will i will come back to you that point interesting point later on little maybe okay so uh, came back to college uh, doing this stuff uh, passing through going through the motions and kind of wanting to get out i think by that time uh, the big strike of bombay cotton mills had already tata samant was the union leader and tata samant had uh, basically done pretty well of getting good salaries or good wages for the premium automobile then at which was at kurla vidya vihar and uh, he had now entered into the 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 mills and the unions were kind of becoming so there used to be a congress led union and then tata samant had entered and tata samant was i think kind of uh, Uh, i i am little i am little hazy there but my father so the mill uh, un- the mill strikes had already started then and uh, but my father used to go he used to kind of because he was not part of that union so he used to go there and the whole thought process was that ki this is going to kind of that entire thing is going to crumble so the money is not going to be there so quickly finish your education pass well get a good job was the thought process in kannamwar typically we had uh, one guy i i still remember we used to stay in in building number 51 uh, that is building number 47 there was uh, one guy called uh, modak uh, he was the ideal boy uh, i don't know if you know there is typical maharashtrian guy with a very thick mustache and a very fair guy and he had done his uh, diploma uh, of mechanical engineering from i think sabu siddiq and then he had got a job with mahindra and mahindra and we used to call him like this a successful guy because he basically did engineering well got a job and settled he was already i think booking a house somewhere and he was going around with one girl known and he was about to get married so dilip modak yeah his first name is dilip dilip modak so dilip modak was a ideal boy and girls would fall for him in our kanwar nagar for him and he was kind of uh, the most eligible bachelor kind of thing so we had influence of dilip modak ki and he had already uh, had a chetak scooter bajaj ka scooter chetak aur cub i just remember that and uh, so he was a model hero for us ki everybody would aspire to be dilip modak that ki engineering karo ghar lo scooter lo and get married that kind of a thought process we had so i was basically wanting to pass through the engineering college as fast as possible again uh, eight semester uh, in plant training came in so i went to blue star again blue star had because that site was still going on that was a long project three year project so that site was going on and when i checked up with blue star they said yeah you we know you you have spent time you know us and that site is still on and the and uh, that site always used to have students from uh, visit ai uh, who would kind of go for the fifth sem- semester in plant training so uh, mine was a fifth semester in plant training and eighth semester so uh, when that fifth semester earlier guy left i joined in in sometime in december or january i went and i did my 8th semester that was in uh, 1988 yeah no 1989 january to june uh, i did my uh, second in plant training in blue star after the in plant training you have a, you have to now look for a job i think i passed out uh, decent uh, i think i got some 70% marks which is supposed to be good uh, but i was never in the class i had had left that hope of getting a rank because i had seen these smart kids around me and um, that's uh, yeah so I came to job gave interview so we used to have uh, campus interviews and we used to get letters from companies so i said no i want to kind of look out for options so blue star uh, I, i was pretty sure they would give me a job so i was like comfortable uh, though i never had a formal discussion but prashant was there and prashant uh, kind of was for me ki you come here and he was my mentor because he was my boss for fifth semester and eighth semester so it was well, kind of easy but i said i want to look for options then there was this company called excelo machine tools which was in thane and excelo machine tools is what i went for an interview and i think i did well 
and I got a letter from them. Then I went to Taj. I think few of my friends were they were saying that in Taj me interview hai. Mahesh Kadam had gone and couple of others had gone. So they said come. And I also went with them. We went to Apollo Bandha, the, uh, the Kulaba Wala Taj, Main Taj. And I first time we entered Taj then. And it was like opulence and kind of the polished thing. And then they took us for interview. And again, uh, you see the uh, front office there and those girls and beautiful saris and that entire uh, f- opulence and entire uh, fantastic. That feeling was very interesting. And uh, then I went for my interview and because I, I had done my projects in air conditioning and air conditioning is a big part of projects in uh, uh, hotel industry because every new project would have major air conditioning uh, for the entire hotel. They kind of uh, selected me. But initially the job was of a maintenance engineer and uh, that was basically maintain the uh, kind of air conditioning infrastructure in a typical hotel, any hotel. And I said fine and I got that job so excel machine tools was out i was not looking at i formally went to blue star and uh, blue star offered me a job so i had blue star appointment later and uh, i had uh, taj appointment later and i was wanting to decide and because of the overall glamour of that hotel industry i said yaar taj mein jaate hai yaar kuch alag hai because blue star to maine kiya hai but then I said, no, Prashant is somebody whom I can uh, trust or who, who would kind of, uh, I can I should go to. So I talked to Prashant and uh, he made me sit and he said, no, no, you have to come to Blue Star. So I said, why Prashant? So Prashant said, boss, you have a maintenance engineer ka job. Mila hai. Maintenance engineer means you will be in the basement of the hotel. You will never be in the ground floor and first floor and third floor of the lobby. You will never be there. You will always be in the basement. And in basement, there is no glamour in the basement. The glamour you are going to see, there is no glamour. That is first. Second is that you will, even if you get a chance to go upper floor, that is when the guest is not there and you have to repair an AC which is not working. So you have to do it fast because if AC is not working in a five-star hotel, it is something which is failure. So do that. And third is that keep projects may if you do it successfully, you will get some kind of kudos, some kind of appreciation. Both of thankless sir, maintenance is a thankless job. Okay? What you what you are doing is your job. You are not doing anything great. So remember all these things. And I think uh, the penny dropped then. And I said, Yeah, yeah, what he's saying is sense. Ki basement may rena badega, oi dekna badega. Then I decided against it and I think that was another uh, pivotal point. I, okay, fine, I'll join Blue Star. And that's how I think uh, I joined Blue Star in 1989, sometime in June, July. And uh, that became kind of my professional career. And uh, Prashant was uh, my boss and the same project was there. In Nasik, we got one more um, big project. So India Security Press, which is a sister concern or close by. So India Security Press is where the bond papers are printed, the passports are printed. So all anything which is a securities kind of paper is printed in India Security Press. So they were also modernizing then in around 89 and that project came in. So these two projects were huge projects and that's how uh, I started um, kind of uh, working in formal uh, professional career in Blue Star. When I say Prashant uh, is a huge influence is because during my entire period, Prashant kind of boosted my confidence a lot. Uh, Prashant used to stay at the other, so uh, just behind Siddhivinayak temple, uh, there is a society called Kamana Society. Now he has shifted, uh, he sold that house now, but he used to stay in Kamana Society on I think some 11th or 12th floor, a very nice house. And Prashant uh, taught me a lot in terms of Bombay. That's that's where I learned that ki you understand the city uh, by walking on foot or by going around yeah, going around the city. Now our office was in Worli. Uh, we used to kind of meet at Dadar many times and we used to go to town. There is a refrigeration accessories market uh, in CP Tank. Uh, there is something behind the Vidam house. Uh, used to be there. I don't know whether what is the stage. So if you have to buy small, small items, uh, thermostats or ferrules or uh, copper pipes and all, something we need specific, we used to go there and buy stuff. Prashant would always take me from different, different routes. 
सो सेट कंपनी पैसा दे रही है तेरा ट्रैवल का सो गो फ्रॉम वन रूट अदर एंड अंडरस्टैंड द सिटी वेल सो समाइम वी वुड गो फ्रॉम द अली आवर जंग रोड विच इज़ दी वन रोड विच गोज फ्रॉम पोर्ट्रस्ट साइड ऑफ एरिया समटाइम्स वी वुड गो फ्रॉम डॉक्टर अम्बेडकर रोड विच इज़ द दादर टी टी रोड समटाइम्स वी वुड गो फ्रॉम द पेडर रोड एंड द चौपाटी रोड एंड दैट्स हाउ ही शोड मी बॉम्बे नाउ दैट्स वेयर आई गॉट टू अंडरस्टैंड बॉम्बे इन अ रियल सेंस एंड प्रशांत यूज टू से दैट की if you have money then why why do you have uh, low self esteem and confidence i used to hesitate going to fester hotel or good restaurants uh, and i said that ki he said that ki the person who is sitting there and you there is no difference uh, he has money to pay for that if you have money to pay for that bill then what is the difference why then there is no uh, difference between you and him and uh, that used to be the case so he used to always uh, take me around to good restaurants uh, there was a place called neelam in mahim we used to go and eat there he made me kind of eat at good places a uh, couple of times he took me to taj restaurants and we ate there so that was uh, good so he actually built lot of confidence in me in a way and he had always been uh, that good mentor i think everybody needs to have that kind of a mentor early in life if your professional career has to uh, kind of flourish uh, that's a confidence booster kind of somebody who believes into your abilities who teaches you to do things right so prashant i i learned uh, business writing from prashant today my mails are pretty concise uh, emails are concise i i know how to set a context in an email uh, i know what i need to tell what i know i what i don't want to tell i would keep it i don't want to discuss or i don't want to write it at this stage all that is uh, training from prashant and prashant used to kind of make four five six seven drafts of letters that we used to write to our client and uh, he was very very uh, uh, kind of systematic very very perfectionist in a, in a way perfectionist about it and why he used to do that because at uh, that time there was no computer so we used to write letters so we used to type get them type so he would write a, a draft final draft then that final draft used to go to a typing center and then the typing center guy would type it and i think just then uh, those godrej uh, electronic typewriters had come so if it is a routine letter then we would do it cheaper so on a manual typewriter but if it is a letter which is going to a senior superintending engineer or a chief engineer with a copy to executive engineer and all that and if it is something which is very important crucial point we are talking about then we would do it on an electronic typewriter and person used to say that ki are yaar ek bar typewriter pe jane ke baad i don't want to have white ink on that so it has to be perfect my draft has to be perfect so that i can give it in a right manner and we did not have so then spellings how do you spell things right and all that so he used to have a dictionary and if we are stuck with spelling he would kind of have uh, get that spelling right all these things kind of uh, inculcated got inculcated into me from prashant jadhav and i think i'm indebted to him I, I absolutely fantastic human being who uh, taught me the ropes of professionalism then and he to he kind of uh, made me blossom uh, into my career so that's basically what blue star uh, all about spent with blue star almost 5 uh, 6 years uh, until 96 so 89 to 96 i was i became a resident engineer of nasik uh, so i used to stay in nasik i used to manage these both the projects i then got some other projects also so there was uh, zinetac drug which glaxo was coming out so they had a facility which uh, glaxo was a client then uh, there were uh, other clients in terms of uh, there was a, the nasik is the entire belt is uh, uh, full of grapes so grape storage uh, uh, used to be a very interesting part the f- the funny part about grape is that the grapes are kind of taken out early in the morning uh, when the dew is very high uh, grape is almost 90% in water uh, in it in it so you have to store them at a almost around 98 99% of relative humidity very high humidity it's like a mist inside the ye yeah. and uh, if that uh, relative humidity drops then the net content of uh, the grape would drop that means if you have packed uh, say 100 kg of grape and if the relative humidity is down by 10% that means it will never remain 100 kg it will become 90 kg so it was a straight loss of produce so you have to keep that relative humidity very high so those uh, grape storages were coming up then in 1990 91 92 so blue star started doing those kind of projects that was the time again uh, there were 
a telephone exchange which were coming new telephone exchange e10b was there it was basically a rack with 1000 lines and you can extend those racks and that's how the electronic uh, telephone started coming in, in if you remember that time those pcos were there public call offices were there and the electro the telephone revolution was started happening then so there is a company called natalco which was manufacturing these uh, e10b racks and i think components for them so we did air conditioning for that company that company was in nasik satpur industrial estate so those uh, companies we were doing work blue star is fantastic uh, training institution uh, when we joined in when i joined in in 89 as a formal uh, employee Uh, they had a 20 day training course uh, for all the new joiners in company and that was done in pune bhandarkar road there is a hotel called hotel ranjit and i still remember getting stationed in that hotel for 21 days and they kind of took us through all the, there are some 20 22 guys uh, all engineering either degree or diploma holder who has joined and uh, everybody was trained thoroughly into first is theory of uh, refrigeration and air conditioning but that was around couple of days then sales and marketing project management client management negotiations entire thing we used to got get people uh, experts from different different uh, field and uh, they used to train us and then there used to be kind of uh, mock sessions so if you are doing a sales speech then we had people from i think that time hindustan lever was there and some coaches used to come from there and they would coach you for how do you do a sales speech and uh, then there were negotiations and our senior managers used to sit there as a, a client and we used to pitch them the projects and how do you kind of uh, negotiate i remember uh, there used to be uh, a guy called uh, uj kashid uttam j kashid he was a boss he was subsequently my super boss in pune and he was sitting uh, in front of us and in projects they would uh, teach us that ki how do you negotiate the clauses like penalty so there was always like this that ki if you this is a six months project and every uh, day of uh, the delay Uh, there will be a penalty of ten uh, thousand rupees. So we were all taught that ki agar usne penalty ka clause dala hai, to tum uh, you say if we do early, then we should get incentive also. So we would talk about that. I said so that that was a trend, and we were trained or we were kind of uh, taught in that session. And uh, so we said okay, fine. अपने अपने को तो समझ में आया कि negotiation कैसा करने का. So we sat and uh, then they put a clause that ki we are putting a clause uh, that mock session. They put a clause that ki uh, for penalty. it would be 10000 rupees a day if you delay so we uh, we were taught a few days back that ki how do you negotiate so we said okay fine we want uh, so we want uh, incentive also for finishing the project on time so kashid had a very flat face he said no 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 i don't want project to be done before i want to be done on exactly on that same date so i don't <laughs> want to give you any incentive i am happy if you do it on the day i want it i don't want to give that and that entire uh, we were so feeling so smart that oh we are going to counter negotiate and all that oh, nothing worked there so these are practical examples they taught us how to do that i, I have never seen any company giving 20 22 days to a new trainee and kind of getting all those people together getting them out of uh, the system putting them together and training them so well the blue star was a fantastic training institution and i think that kind of built our professional careers well blue star had a very good culture of doing things right and that culture was up to the level of uh, mechanics the the people down the line on on the those who used to do work with hand would never do a wrong thing they would say that ki boss we will do something uh, which is a jugad uh, now jugad word came much later but uh, that was then Uh, you do something wrong now and client will have to go for a hell lot of problem later on so do everything right first time was a good uh, kind of learning and that culture was there right up to see a blue star had a strong union and uh, those fights were there between the union staff and the management but we had seen that culture of doing good work no union staff or no union employee would do a bad job at site they would do perfect job and uh, in air conditioning I mean, the actual installation and commissioning beautiful uh, work they used to do so i think blue star deserved to be that number one number two status that uh, they had in india then and uh, that got kind of that culture got inculcated in me 
uh, over a period of time uh, oh, in my future career when I kind of had that motto of doing things right I think all that came from Blue Star so that's where the Blue Star life uh, this was something like around 96 couple of uh, personal setbacks then and uh, I decided to quit uh, Blue Star people always used to say that Ki, Sudhir yaar tu engineer kam hai aur PR wala admi jada hai yeah, because in Blue Star also, I, I used to kind of, I used to love the supervisor job, the technical job, uh, the, the designing and all that didn't never, uh, re- really never excited me. Management excited me. Uh, and I used to do that only. And people used to, my public relations, uh, which is basically called networking. So my networking uh, skills were very good. I used to manage the government officials very well and uh, kind of get stuff done. There used to be something called escalation clause in every contract and if the delay in the project is due to the client delay and then we would get some price escalation in the project so i remember studying that clause well and uh, we used to establish the delays from the client end so ready ready and we used to show that uh, this particular delay has caused because of which the project which was originally around 18 months went on to become almost around 34 months so during this period the prices of the uh, material which we had to buy had gone up so there was a formula escalation formula and with that escalation formula I could actually establish that we deserve some extra money to be apart from the standard billing we deserve to be getting some money so Prashant helped me in that but uh, I, I did that entire calculation and all and I think uh, during that time we earned something like 27-28 lakhs on a project of around 1.5 crores we got some 27-28 lakh as an escalation from government by establishing the rule uh, the formula establishing that the delays have happened because of them and I got that I, I got appreciation later then I felt nice then and that is what people saw that as my uh, kind of strength that ki you are good at doing this kind of stuff not the engineering stuff really so wo to tha. and uh, in 96 uh, i quit blue star i had uh, some money in the bank and i just took a jump and one of my f- uh, friends so my close friend Ravi he has elder brother called Yogen and uh, Yogen had a group of friends and uh, they were into a real estate project in uh, near Bombay and they were looking for somebody to work with them and do marketing and because of my this PR skills and all they said okay I'm a kind of a good uh, person to do that and that's how uh, I, I started working with them so that's where I kind of quit this was uh, more of a semi job, semi business kind of thing because I was working with known people. And yes, I used to, I was uh, getting certain salary, but uh, I had full freedom on what to do, what not to do. So this was a project uh, on the Gujarat Highway, uh, interesting farmhouse uh, concept that they had built. So the farm agricultural land, I think uh, 10,000 square feet land. And by the agricultural law, you have to be an agriculturist to um, uh, own that land. And with that land, you can build around 1,500, 1,600 square feet farmhouse on that land. So this con- this people concept was that you give her 10,000 square feet land with a lot of trees. So all entire uh, kind of uh, the vegetation, the uh, trees lined up and all over, everything done. And then build a house also. That's an optional yeah, at extra cost. And that was, I think, some 5, 6 lakh rupees or 4 lakh rupees they were selling for that plot then and my job was to basically sell those plots so i uh, started doing that and uh, i said that so these guys were typically typically uh, guys from the other area and uh, they were all there was this was a family land that one of the partners had the second partner was my friend's friend and they were kind of doing the entire cultivation and infrastructure development so I said that ki, if I have to sell this, who is the uh, typical audience? Uh, spending 4 lakh, 5 lakh rupees uh, is something that was not small stuff then. They already had some, there were some around 60, 70 plots. They had sold around 20 plots by then. So anchor customers were there. They had to sell remaining 40 plots. And uh, that was almost around two, uh, around 1.82 crore revenue. So... I said, you, if it is on the Gujarat highway, then you need to look at Gujaratis and they have money. So they would look at something on the way to their native place or something like that. 
uh, that highway was notorious for traffic jams now it has become smooth but it was uh, just single road then and you really had to uh, no it was double road then yeah and uh, it was difficult to travel there it was just beyond manor so i said that ki we have to focus on gujaratis we have to focus on which people so let's do advertisement they had never done an ad so i said let's do advertisement and i said okay and i had uh, got a uh, ad done and we put it on a front page of economic times on in a, this was sometime in 97 early 97 front page of economic times some 70000 rupees for a saturday morning ad on, and uh, that was home away from home very nice uh, k i think interesting kind of uh, response we got and i started uh, so selling that so basically uh, get a response from people follow up with them uh, take them for a site visit uh, all that uh, done i still remember uh, the uh, we used to take people by jeep called sumo tata sumo was there and we used to hire tata sumos and take people from bombay wherever they are so we pick up pick them up and take them to uh, that place near manor show them and bring them back that was the kind of end cost is incurred by us so that's a marketing expense i think i did that for almost one one and a half year and uh, kind of interesting journey these people were already in some debt and uh, though they they could sell that for almost around 4 lakh rupees uh, and uh, plot i have because with this ad and kind of showing uh, we're doing kind of focusing on to better clientele we could get that rate to 5.56 lakh rupees so good uh, appreciation but they were already they had spent a lot on cultivation of the land and they were already in the debt and somehow that project though we could sell most of the plots that project did not kind of become viable and they kind of that entire group went bankrupt though so the entire development could not happen completely they could not pay uh, money i think uh, I, i had a case on me that time because money was not paid by them but because i was fronting the uh, printer and the printer thought i am one of the owners i was not i was one of the directors or partners i was not but then he felt that and then there was a 138 ni that just come then ki and then that case was on me i went through all that court and all all that stuff happened but i got out of that in couple of years because they were kind of folding up and closing down the entire venture and that was a time i had uh, so during 96 once i had met one of my college uh, friend he was not from my group uh, his name is uh, purandar and we had met uh, he had come to nasik he was also working with an air conditioning company distributor uh, called the so carrier uh, distributor in bombay and he was into sales and marketing i was more on the project side and we sat in the evening and i i was already a bit into philosophy then i used to read uh, j krishnamurthy i used to read rajneesh and all so uh, we, i think i must have given some fundas and he thought i am deep thinker wagara aisa usko laga hoga us time he says that ki oh this guy is we turned out very differently so we were thinking about a uh, kind of kuch to karte hai and uh, during this end period of this uh, real estate venture purandar also had quit and he had kind of joined this company and then in 3 4 months we had folded up so purandar and we we were together we were doing the sales and marketing for this real estate company so when this company went into that bankruptcy proceedings we were kind of out because we were basically uh, employee only so we said kuch to karte hai so let's do something and purandar was more of ki are yaar air conditioning background se aaye hai to air conditioning mein kuch to karte hai and i was kind of bored i said wo nahi karna hai kuch to alag karte hai and this was around 98 and uh, we were thinking kya karna chahiye and we said we have to get into sunrise industries so what are the industries which are forward looking so one is healthcare and second is software so i said software mein to apne ko kuch samajhta nahi hai because we were not at all trained into software anyway so healthcare mein kuch to karte hai and then again one of the friend in the group uh, he i think used to work with peregrine investment in singapore and he was doing some work with lilavati hospital in bombay and uh, he had kind of told us kya kuch to we can do something interesting in healthcare and so he said lilavati hospital is where we are looking giving them some kind of a funding or something but they are looking for uh, marketing the hospital will you do marketing of hospital 
करते बिकॉज रियल स्टेट का मार्केटिंग किया है ये भी करते हैं क्या होता है एंड मी एंड पुरंदर वी सेड ओके फाइन एंड पैरलली वी वर लुकिंग फॉर सम प्रोजेक्ट्स टू बी प्रोजेक्ट टू बी डन तो दैट वाज अर्ली दैट वाज दोज वर द टाइम्स ऑफ अर्ली वीसी फंडिंग एंड आइडिया दैट इज 98 आइडियाज अराउंड न्यू वेंचर्स एंड आई थिंक यूएस वाज रियली हॉट देन एंड दोस कांसेप्ट्स वर कमिंग इन इन इंडिया सो वी हैड दिस आइडिया ऑफ दिस वी हैड मींस दिस फ्रेंड ऑफ आवर्स ही हैड दिस आइडिया ऑफ कि वी कैन डू सम इंटीग्रेटेड हेल्थ केयर इंस्टीट्यूशन व्हिच इज कंबाइंड and we were looking for let's look at feasibility and if we can create a good idea and good business plan then we could look for funding so idea was to create a maternity hospital virtual maternity hospital of 2000 beds so you basically bring uh, so typical nursing homes or typical maternity homes in bombay are around 15 to 20 beds and these are typically run by obstetricians gynecologists female or male and 15 20 bed bombay had something like 200 such uh, not 200 600 700 such institutions in bombay and we said we will pick up something like 100 good nursing homes or the uh, maternity homes and connect them through internet and uh, kind of uh, build a central system and make a virtual 2000 bed hospital so 100 hosp- such hospitals into 20 bed 2000 bed hospital and what can you do so uh, you can do a patient uh, uh, management system together uh, you can basically what happens in typically in india is that if it is your uh, f- uh, you the girl the married woman would basically do first trimester she would do uh, when she is at her uh, husband's place and then they would move uh, for the maternity to her parents place so they would generally look for gynecologist or obstetrician who is close to their parents place so they would travel from wherever they are uh, to the parents place and uh, take that first trimester ka consultations but the delivery would happen at that particular institution now can we kind of port the data with a current uh, physician to the next physician can we do economy of scale by buying so buy the uh, kind of consumables buy operate uh, operation theater equipment all centrally so that you can basically reduce the cost and improve the margins uh, you can you improve patient experience a fantastic idea that was but too early it was then too early and so we said okay there are a lot of ideas to do and because we were doing only maternity so there was uniqueness in terms of consumption pattern the consumables were kind of similar if you are doing multiple uh, verticals of healthcare then there are needs are very different but when you are doing a single vertical maternity then you had very few items and then your numbers would be very high so economies of scale would be great so that was the whole idea so we met somebody who would virtually connect the so us time uh, we said was the uh, connecting method and uh, that consultant said that ki one we said would cost you one we said connectivity would cost you something like 5 lakh so we said 5 crore uh, 5 crores only for connectivity and i think that kind of money we would not get and that entire so we had i i think i still somewhere have some 40 or 50 maternity home owners i had met and we had a questionnaire where i had written done the user survey to understand whether it will work or not and we did survey but then we kind of shelved it because it was not viable then because of the internet connectivity cost then so this is in 1999 so while we were doing this we got this project of lilavati hospital uh, marketing uh, marketing that so what is hospital marketing currently we also didn't know but what they were wanting to do is that key retail we will get they wanted to connect with corporate so corporate uh, what ha- happens is that uh, all the big organizations in uh, bombay or in nearby bombay would basically have a uh, healthcare officer or a doctor on payroll and these people would offer medical treatment free for the employees this was not all uh, banks had this uh, multinationals had this uh, facility and uh, what used to happen is that ki uh, already established hospitals like bombay hospital jaslok hinduja bridge candy uh, what they would do is that ki they would have a deposit uh, given by the co- company and company's doctor or hr head would give a letter 
saying that this particular person needs a treatment at your hospital so give the treatment and send the bill to the company company will settle it in 15 days time so what happens is that ki but hospitals would say what is the guarantee uh, that you will pay uh, so they used to give some interest free deposit so 1 lakh 2 lakh rupees deposit used to be there and some hospitals used to say that ki we will keep you special two beds always for you so that even if the hospital is full you are a guaranteed you have a guaranteed bed for your employee so that used to be their pitch ki we have tie up with induja we have tie up with bombay hospital and we have guaranteed bed there i remember uh, state bank of india used to spend almost 50 crore rupees in those time per year on medical treatments in the hospitals so that was one product that hospitals could offer to the industry second was the health checkups so health checkup was a big uh, rage then so all senior executives would get health checkups uh, beyond 40 beyond 50 so selling health checkup was another product so our idea so the idea was that ki if lilavati hospital is new hospital then position them in the market as one of the good hospitals in suburbs because everything was until uh, mahim the hinduja was farthest at mahim nothing great was there beyond mahim the lilavati was uh, in bandra bridge candy south bombay bombay hospital south bombay just look south bombay everything was in south bombay and the bkc was developing they coming up then bkc had lot of new Uh, uh, companies coming up so it was basically accessible for them so that was the whole idea so me and purandar we got that project uh, through help of this friend and uh, we started working on that our model was basically consult them on marketing strategy the sales and marketing strategy uh, hire staff on their payroll and train that staff and uh, build business so tie up with multiple corporates uh, in the industry of the bombay industry and then sell them inpatient services sell them yeah so inpatient was very clear that ki we have these these good consultants so come and yeah we will give you special uh, treatment and your employees will be taken care of nicely all that kind of value proposition was built health checkup was basically we will do better reporting in 48 hours reporting in 24 hours something like that and uh, we will give you better rates again it was more about rates and about comprehensiveness of the packages so these two products is what we started selling and i think we had a decent success because lilavati is a good hospital very well done then i think shah family they used to own uh, it was a charitable hospital uh, but they used to own uh, diamond business uh, they are from palampur and hospital was well done a lot of uh, companies uh, we could tie up we could tie up almost around uh, 90 odd companies uh, in one one and a half two years time we got them something like 1.3 crore of uh, deposits So this is the interest free working capital for hospitals so they use this as a capital straight away and there is no interest to be paid on that and any hospital generally works at around 90 95% occupancy only so giving telling that ki these two beds are for you is like not a big deal you can always show some two beds random and say that these are meant for you but that was not a challenge and uh, we did a pretty good business on the health checkup side also so that was how that is how the business uh, yeah so that's uh, basically was a partnership company called medimanage that i started with purandar that was in way back in 97 and we did lilavati so lilavati administrator uh, basically talked about us to somebody and then we got uh, bhakti vedanta hospital which is in mira road uh, same model again we consult we hire people on their payroll train them do so now mira road uh, hospital had the industry around there they wanted to also so what happens is that though you have a company or the offices uh, somewhere in south bombay or let's say bkc the employees are staying all over bombay and people need employees uh, around uh, so so wherever so people used to stay in borivali daisar kandivli the suburbs of western suburbs they would access uh, bhakti vedanta hospital also uh, lilavati and hinduja and all these hospitals are tertiary care hospitals which are for higher treatment so for regular treatment you would need a secondary care hospital so bhakti bhakti vedanta was typically a secondary care hospital so we got bhakti vedanta hospital as a client then we went on uh, growing this business and then we got krishna heart institute in amdavad same model somebody moved from lilavati to krishna so they kind of invited us there then we went to mahavir heart hospital in i think that's in surat yeah we did that we did unity hospitals in mangalore 
we did uh, kamal nayan bajaj hospital uh, in aurangabad we did uh, some work for asian heart institute in bkc so there uh, because of my engineering background and project management background we got a project uh, of uh, doing some project management for alila for asian heart institute through a company called hosmac uh, there was this company in goregaon they are a hospital uh, architecture and project management expert they only do hospitals and nothing else uh, one gentleman called dr vivek desai used to run that and uh, he gave us the project and that's how we got involved into uh, i got rather uh, i managed while prudar purandas was managing lilavati hospital i managed the asian heart uh, project which was uh, doing some work on to the project using my blue star project management skills that was there so these were multiple projects that we were doing and interesting uh, work more so what was happening is that we were basically giving more of our time and that's uh, basically was the model it was a consulting clum delivery so we had a fixed revenue and we had a variable revenue during that period uh, one of my friend in nasik he runs a pharma company so that one short stint i went back to nasik and stayed for one one and a half year so he has a pharma company and it was a typical no innovation uh, regular products and they basically small company make Uh, regular products and sell them in the uh, north uh, maharashtra area so Nas- beyond nasik nasik so dulia jalgaon malegaon and uh, the busawal area so that was an interesting experience so i i took that project up for one one and a half year and i kind of stayed in nasik and did that L- a lot of learning that happened during that period that's so so it was basically sales and marketing of uh, pharma products so this typical this company had uh, three four products one was uh, the iron vitamin uh, and calcium uh, syrup which is typically uh, sold uh, to physicians or orthopedics as a yeah a staple requirement uh, basically dietary requirement then they had a painkiller for kids so that was typically paracetamol uh, yeah and then they had something as alprazolam which is uh, the uh, anti anxiety uh, medicine called atis so these three four products they had and my job was to basically train the uh, reps the medical reps in multiple places and uh, that's how i got kind of exposed to doctors so i used to observe the medical reps and train them in terms of how do you pitch well and how do you get more prescriptions from doctors and that was a amazing learning that entire uh, belt uh, right from nasik until jalgaon dulia i got introduced to the medical uh, doctor system how it works and uh, the kind of incentives there you will not believe doctors uh, used to be given kind of you give me this prescriptions and you will get to one tola two tola of gold uh, after doing this much of quota and that kind of a targets doctor used to get and nobody used to feel anything wrong well, people would be like pharma companies are giving this and people used to kind of do this yes there were uh, the the big companies would always be on the you know, you know will not do all this stuff but the low end companies would do uh, gimmicks like this uh, this friends company uh, they were not into all this uh, gold and all they were they wanted to do ethical uh, kind of business but uh, you are not doing any innovation so how do you kind of differentiate and that's where i think we me and one of my friend we were doing this together so we basically looked at it uh, very differently we said that ki, if my product is me to product then i think personal relationship is how you can sell it and you need to build that personal rapport with that doctor for getting the prescriptions and that's where you need to really really think differently because at one side you are uh, fighting with all the big giants so the i think sun pharmaceuticals and indico i remember big companies uh, used to sell the same product and you are you are not differentiating anything and your uh, doctor does not have any bothration about price because the buyer is different so you and you have to prescribe that and what is the basis on which you are prescribing because all products are same so what is uh, so different if, if there are so many products it was always my rapport with the medical rep 
the doctor's rapport with the medical rep is what would decide whom would he give the prescription to. But does uh, does a rapport beat the tola of gold? Sometimes some doctors, yes, uh, I I have seen that. So there were uh, distinctly two. Uh, typical uh, types of doctors that i have seen one who would uh, tola of gold or you were taken out to let's say thailand for conference and all that 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 is one type and second type is i will do right and i will not kind of do things which are like this i saw the doctors who were study who have studied from pune and bombay would not get into this uh, jugglery they were into these areas uh, but they would not get into this kind of practices doctors from other areas so this is my yeah i'm i'm not doing any value judgment this is my observation that i had kind of had but i realized that ki this rapo can help build prescriptions and getting prescription was very important and doctors attention span is very low so doctor the medical rep has to so all reps would for target on with the doctors who have potential to give prescription that means jiska practice acha hai uske paas jab jayenge so everybody would go to those doctors because everybody is targeting them so that was a, another challenge so i have these two three stories which i where i kind of uh, learned the power of personal relationships and how do you build those kind of personalized uh, stuff a personalized relationship with uh, clients there is this doctor in uh, dulia Uh, psychiatrist and he would not give any expression to anybody no expression nothing he would listen to you and he say okay fine and you just kind of uh, so there is to be a visual aid and you show about products characteristics and you kind of flipboard it is to be a flipboard so you say my product name is this 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 and a typical rote uh, the way they would to talk about a rote uh, talking rote learning rote talking and you would Uh, end your uh, name or your, your your end your pitch with so you would get some thirty seconds or maybe twenty seconds with the doctor, and you kind of talk about your product name again again and ask for prescription, and then leave samples on the table which the doctor would use for needy patients. The samples would go to needy patients. This doctor never used to give any expression whether he has liked the product. He would never ask any questions, nothing, and he was psychiatrist, so I think he knew the art of negotiation or whatever, and kind of flat face. and i said that ki but he had a very good prescription because he had lot of patients in dulia and uh, i would wonder that ki isko crack kaise karne ka and one day i saw a cassette of rajnish behind him and uh, then i said that ki yaar ye rajnish ka follower lagta hai then i had seen his certificate so he was from uh, pune i think sasun or some college medical college pune bj medical or sasun he had uh, passed out from there He, I think, he has done post-graduation also from Pune. So I said that he must have had some influence of Rajneesh because Rajneesh Ash Osho Ashram was there in Pune, Koregaon Park, and he must have kind of. And doctors are known to be kind of little wacky in terms of these influences and the philosophical leanings and all. So. I said fine. So next time, what I did was that I went to Nasik, and I used to come to Bombay weekend. I went to this the other uh, cassette. There used to be a the other the big cassette uh, player, a uh, cassette center, and I picked up uh, that uh, one big set of Sambhog se Samadhi tak Rajnish ka. The beautiful, yeah. So though the name is very sounds very. Uh, cheeky, but uh, it was very good uh, philosophical discourse of Rajnish. So I picked up that entire set, and I gave that set to that doctor. And that was the first time that doctor started talking to me. And then he asked me that, "Ki uh, how do you know this?" And I said, "No, because of my friends, I have been listening to philosophy. So I have listened to Rajnish cassettes, and I like it. And it's a very interesting." and then he started talking about rajneesh and osho and then he opened up and told that ki how he was in pune and how uh, osho uh, influence was there and how he leaned and how he likes that philosophy and all that and then he started giving prescriptions to us so <laughs> that was uh, the uh, so that that so so our product was there there are a lot of other alprazolam products which were there and but then he started giving us prescription but this doesn't scale right because it is only one sudhir and you can't you can only meet so many people and that's true but then this company was also small and uh, the point is that ki you use this 
see the point is that ki there are influencing model is there so if the leading doctor uh, starts prescribing your product you take that to others and say that ki yaar this doctor is prescribing what stops you from prescribing so and in medical field there is a lot of kind of followership that is there so if my seniors are doing something i would do that is a i think if you really see why betadine is used in the operation theaters it is you ask them that you give them a new product nobody would take it even if it is the same consistency same product or even if it is better they would say no my seniors would always use betadine and they said that ki betadine is the only good disinfectant and i will use betadine so that followership is there in medical field this is one the second interesting thing is there is a doctor another doctor in dulia huge practice orthopedic surgeon and used to see almost around 200 250 patients a day and he had his typical consulting room where he would have four examination beds and four uh, deputies so all deputies would sit with a prescription pad and they, they they would stand and this doctor also would stand and a very good orthopedician and people from all the nearby villages almost up to 100 kilometers would come to him and he used to be called bapu and he basically was a very nice human being very good guy and he used to he, he was again from pune would never take that tola wala thing and all that uh, rather he was such a nice guy that ki after the examination uh, that if there is a, a kind of farmer who has come from so he would ask where are you from and all and that guy would say that ki i am from some such such village that village is around 50 60 kilometers away then he would ask him that ki baba do you have money to pay me so he would say yeah yeah i have bought it so this 50 rupees you would take or 20 or 50 rupees whatever is you would show but he said okay fine mera to ho gaya but what about going back ticket ke liye paisa hai kya and that guy would just smile and then this guy would not take the consulting fee he would give him back and then he would tell the people that ki apna uh, samples mein se whatever medicines are there give it to this guy and he would tell him that ki this 20 rupees for you to go back is that kind of a beautiful uh, human being and he used to do that practice so morning he used to see around 100 patients afternoon uh, evening he would see around 100 patients and afternoon time he would do surgeries that was his practice and because of that uh, numbers those huge numbers everybody would again go to prescription he had four medical shops next nearby next to his hospital he was he had a hospital i think from 40 bed hospital orthopedic surgeon and he had some four medical shops and all those four medical shops used to survive only on his practice uh, one single doctor practice and i used to go to him met him multiple times and never could a uh, kind of so once i asked him that ki where are you from and kind of so he said i am from jalga dulia only where did you study i knew that ki he had studied from pune but i, I had two kind of conversation started i asked him and then i asked him that ki what do you miss of pune that in uh, dulia and he said ki the discussion that we used to have on uh, books the discussion that we used to have on marathi literature marathi drama that was very rich and i miss that i have nobody here my practice is so much that i don't get to socialize much and i i like doing this and i can't discuss about books and then i started discussing books about him because i had read marathi pretty well so i used to discuss books so then every time uh, almost around after 3 4 months i could crack him so every month i used to go so after 3 4 months i could really build that rapport with him and then we started discussing marathi books marathi drama so we used to go at around 9 9:30 in the morning first thing in the morning and uh, then it became kind of he started giving me time so he would say that ki once i i was there so he would stop everybody and he would say that ki sudhir alay so marathi mein and i want to i want 5 minutes so no patients were taken and we used to sit for 5 minutes only 5 minutes not more than that and we used to discuss latest marathi book latest marathi drama what is happening in pune what is happening in bombay in the marathi literature scene that's all and i think that was his connect to bombay his connect to pune and being connected to that world rich world of literature that was this yeah because all the medical reps are basically they are wrote so nobody would kind of i was i was not really a medical rep i was a different person altogether i could create that rapport with him 
and with that repo i started kind of he started then remembering me and then the company and then the product and then prescription started coming in uh, i remember uh, we had started new product in that particular month that was iron vitamin and calcium and this guy had this practice of this four uh, examination bench and what used to happen is that because you are orthopedic so like you need to kind of remove your clothes and kind of be there so four curtains four patients and uh, so one patient he sees so somebody is taking a history the history is told to him he examines the patient only for 3 to 4 minutes then moves to next so that person he wants to now get dressed and get out and by that time i have the doctor has to wait nothing like that so those those four beds would kind of it it was like a assembly line where you move from one patient to other and finish as many as possible fast so he would stop all those and he would talk to me so we had, when we had this uh, new launch new product that was we were talking about uh, which was an iron vitamin calcium uh, uh, supplement i told him that ki we we were basically bringing it next week and he said fine no problem whenever you are coming just let me know uh, i'll give you prescription and whenever you are launching a new product you need good prescriptions so that there is a momentum that you create in the market so i went to the local for those medical counter the, the medicine medicine shops uh, the dispensation shops and they would not listen they said no 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 let the prescription come then we will kind of stock your material uh, the your your medicine uh, so we said that ki but uh, prescription aane ke baad agar nahi hai to then doctor will get disappointed ki yaar i gave you prescription and it is not available so availability is the first thing now how do you break this chicken and egg i was very confident that if i now i had built a rapport with this doctor so i will get prescription i was confident of but the medical guy was not at all ready to uh, a store or the kind of keep the stock on the shelf so we went to the distributor the distributor said no problem do one thing i will give you one, two two cases each for this guy uh, all these four medical shops i will make a invoice you just take them keep, keep it in an auto so take a auto with all eight cases uh, each case of 10 bottles so 20 bottles each and you take this 80 bottles uh, i will make a invoice you carry it with a auto and stand there and we just keep that ready and the moment prescription comes you hand over the case to him and say that he dispense now that's how we had done so i had my uh, medical rep with me and he was ready we we took uh, eight eighty eight cases so 80 bottles and then i went to this doctor and i told him that ki today we are doing a launch and we are launching uh, this product in dulia with you and i want good prescription so help me so he turns to all his four uh, juniors and he said that ki uh, iron vitamin calcium that means it can go for every patient of ours so today whatever prescription i give end it with this prescription this wow. medicine and uh, he told and uh, he asked me but sudhir available hai na because he knew that ki ye problem hai chote company ka you will never get availability so i said yes yes available hai and then i went out and then uh, first prescription first prescription came and i was standing uh, at that yeah, so i was following the patient ki ye patient kaun se medical shop mein jata hai he went in that medicine i just uh, kind of indicated my guy ki bas be ready with that uh, ye so prescription went on to the counter and then the guy said i we see for today and oh i don't know and i said yeah mera mera product hai because all medical reps used to stand so then i said i have a case laya hai and in doing that one day i think we got some 50 60 prescription one after other and there was like every prescription that would come out from doctor would have this product at the end because it was a supplement for bones and blood and that was a very interesting kind of a story that i still remember the third interesting story is in jalgaon again a lady doctor uh, a kind of pediatric uh, specialist from uh, pune again and she was again very literary uh, wanting to read wanting marathi literature warm english literature very well read and we used to kind of discuss stuff on that so i never used to talk medical or the product ever with doctor because i said okay what is there my product is um, also ran product so what is there to talk about product let's talk something else that was my pitch all the time and uh, we used to then talk about yeah so one day so she used to give me prescription just when i'm around and not much because our discussion was not really great um, one day i asked her that ki what that you miss in jalgaon that you would otherwise do in pune and she 
just took i think 2 minutes to think and this, then she said that this is particular this one particular author uh, who english author i forgot where a thriller he used to write uh, he, he or she I, that also i don't know what what that author was i used to love that book that entire series of that books uh, i don't get those books here anymore jalgaon mein to kuch milta hi nahi hai i miss reading those books is what she said and i said fine and just kept remember that next time when i came to bombay so bombay if you remember in 90s there used to be these roadside vendors who would have books so i went and i remembered that author name then and i went and picked up one book of that author and then i told i knew around so i used to buy books on the road because that was the access the cheap book 40 rupees you used to get one book and then when you give it back i think they would give you 25 rupees back as a yeah or you buy another book and give you only 10 rupees or something like that i don't remember that exactly but they used to take back those books so so you are used books kind of a thing so i went to that guy those three four guys whom i knew very regularly because i used to buy books from them and i said that this author whatever book that you get where from wherever you get your books from i want all the books and i just came back and next week or 10 days after when i went all these guys had taken out some 3 4 3 4 books of that author ki sir ab aapne bola hai na to ye maine humne nikal ke rakha hai and i built a, i think some 20 25 books ka library i i kind of a stock i built and every month when i used to go to jalgaon i would give one book to that lady doctor one that every time and she started remembering me as that book guy not as that medicine guy and that rapo kind of gave me prescription i remember these three stories very distinctly because how a human connect can actually help so people do commerce but i think there is always a human connect in that commerce when all other things are kept aside yeah product uh, superiority the value proposition all that is there but ultimately there are two individuals interacting with each other and in the whole process when all things are same if you want to get business if you want to tilt that business to your side i think this human connection works a lot it 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 is it matters and i think in today's world also i think it still matters uh, yeah i am not kind of undermining the product i am not undermining the cap the, the value proposition i am just talking about all things equal it's human connection that matters and i think as much as a human connection that matters it is also food that matters because humans have to eat and that's why we keep going so let's take a quick commercial break and on the other side of the break we'll continue your fascinating journey hey the music started and this sounds like a commercial but it isn't it's a plea from me to check out my latest labor of love a youtube show i am co-hosting with my good friend the brilliant ajay shah we've called it everything is everything every week we'll speak for about an hour on things we care about from the profound to the profane from the exalted to the everyday we range widely across subjects and we bring multiple frames with which we try to understand the world please join us on our journey and please support us by subscribing to our YouTube YouTube channel at youtubecom amitvarma a m i t v a r m a the show is called everything is everything please do check it out welcome back to the scene and the unseen i'm chatting with my good friend sudhir sarnavat we are going through the story of his life which in different ways is also uh, the story of a nation at a particular point in time etc etc but forget these big things but let's sort of continue from there like where the narrative ended off was this sort of temporary adventure i think you said it was one and a half two years where you were yeah. doing this project and yeah. all of that so what happened next take me back to how your journey proceeds yeah so our uh, journey was more about doing the hospital marketing and consultancy and these were the side projects that we got but we realized very clearly then that everybody was paying us for our time so it was more of a consultancy project and if uh, we were uh, everybody wanted us to be present there so that was basically we were saying that ki oh somebody is paying us today 20000 rupees an hour tomorrow they will pay let's say 50000 rupees an hour and nothing beyond and we wanted to scale and that was a kind of thought that we had so we said this can't work for long we need to do something which will basically help us grow bigger than these projects 
and that's where we then went back to kind of drawing board and thought about what is that we have as in place in last uh, couple of years uh, to two and a half years what we have you earned and we found that we have earned a good amount of relationship with corporates through these various hospitals because for typically uh, bombay hospitals jo, that we marketed uh, we had same kind of companies we went to first time we tip pitched a tertiary care hospital then we pitched a secondary care hospital and stuff like that so we said okay we have great relationships with hospitals what so we said okay fine if these are there how can we leverage them for our next business and that's where we kind of asked a question what can be scaled and uh, where we don't have to be present all the time and what can help us leverage our current relationships so we said okay fine all these companies they spend on healthcare and uh, they are spending on health checkups but healthcare is basically being funded through health insurance and at that point of time uh, around 2000 the new insurance regulations came in so insurance opened up there was uh, this change of uh, third party administrator licenses that were coming up broking licenses were being given and uh, companies were spending on health insurance premium so health insurance is very clear that uh, you basically pay a premium and get health insurance for your employees and their reimbursement claims are done so we said why not get into the kind of management of health insurance and that's how we got into the health insurance marketing we started with selling health insurance for individuals very tiny at that point of time a few so i knew few doctors through my asian heart relationship there and dr vivek desai's relationship so few doctors they were basically interested in getting into the business of this health insurance and they they had seen people doing large policies with that there was a concept uh, of buying health insurance in bulk from insurance company at a really cheap price and they sell it with a premium with very lot of customization to individuals so they were looking at that as an opportunity and they said okay fine we don't mind investing in it into your company and why don't we go i think that uh said around 40 40 50 lakhs is what they would invest they didn't invest all that uh, they gave us only i think for 14 15 lakhs to start with so we started uh, on health insurance uh, selling we i think our first break came when we had uh, development credit bank one of uh, while we were say, ret- retailing a product to their one of the trustees he said why don't you come and uh, kind of pitch to our corporate and that's where we got a corporate account i think that time the we got some commission of some 3 4 lakh rupees and that was a big sum for us we had never seen that kind of a money coming in in single deal and that kind of set a path for us into health insurance broking so we basically were that broking license we didn't have broking license had just come couple of years ago and we basically were uh, trying to do a kind of health insurance agency so you uh, i will work with one insurance company my partner will work with another insurance company and then we work with some other agent for third insurance company and that's how we kind of collect the quotes and give it to the insurance uh, to the clients so you have to give multiple quotes to clients so that they choose one of that uh, uh, which is a basically cost effective and benefit uh, rich so when we started doing this uh, as an agent we found that what we are trying to do is typically kind of uh, pulling resources from here and there and doing something the right way to do is through uh, go through a broking license and that we uh, did not have then and we did not have money also for that so we focused on getting clients so we got quick early clients uh, good clients through this agency model one of purandar's connect was in emphasis and uh, emphasis was almost around 8 9000 people bpo then in bangalore and i still remember uh, we uh, got through purandar's connect we got an appointment with their cfo and that cfo was non committal so he said come to bangalore and we'll meet and i think uh, that's the first time i travel or second time i travel to bangalore uh, for work and he said uh, we asked him what time he said i don't know what time but be there around noon and we said noon is 12 o'clock so at around 12 30 we were at fasis headquarter in i think koramangala where he used to sit 
and he did not call us until i think we got a call at around quarter to 9 in the night oh wow you uh, sat there for 9 hours so we were there we were out we were not even inside the building so we were out there purandar had borrowed his cousin's car in uh, there bangalore and we were sitting in the car and killing time uh, time passed chai ja ke piya and all that and uh, i think 8:30 quarter to 9 we got a call that ki uh, alok is free you can come and uh, we went up there at i think some sixth floor office and uh, there was uh, the cfo uh, alok misra's office and uh, alok and there was a small table round table i still remember that round kaanch ka table three of us sitting alok with his um, both the hands on the table and uh, he is kind of uh, his uh, chin on the hands and he is like intently looking at us and present and we were we started presenting our value proposition to him and at one point his eyes were closed and i said oh he is sleeping so i stopped and then a typical alok alok is a very deep voice alok said carry on carry on i am listening and then kind of again i started pitching and uh, we pitched uh, to emphasis uh, that year and uh, uh they liked our pitch and they changed from their current uh, insurance provider to us that was a huge contract for us uh, almost around 78 lakhs of premium uh, that was in 2004 and that's a huge premium and they trusted us uh, that time alok trusted us that time and he said do it guys uh, do well and uh, then we went and we did very good work uh, we in terms of uh, their entire management of portfolio for 700000 people it's it's a crazy work when you are working with bpo their uh, attrition rate is very very high they they maybe they will churn the entire company in a year that means they will have uh, 9000 people living in a year it is possible and you have to so whenever people leave you have to kind of move them out of insurance product and add new people it's a crazy work they have to maintain the premium calculations so quite a lot of work and we did that well and uh, with that and few other clients we kind of uh, built a portfolio of around uh, 20 crore of premium in couple of years time and then we said okay fine what we are doing is we are basically working on this license or that that license agency license is not the right way an agent is a representative of a insurance company so he is actually selling agent of the insurance company while when you become a broker a broker is a representative of a client so on behalf of client you basically kind of identify solutions in the market and present them to your client and then client basically picks it, picks it up as a choice so a broker has more kind of he is aligned with incentives his intensive incentives are aligned well with clients expectations so we wanted to become a broker Uh, but then uh, to become a broker uh, we had to pay uh, i think the capital was some 50 lakh rupees and uh, we did not have 50 lakh rupees then and uh, we asked our partners the doctors uh, who were there and they were not really sure so much of money to be put in or not we actually uh, some insurance company uh, officers they were so fond of us that they talked to these doctors and told them no 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 this is a good business you guys should invest but these guys somehow did not and then as usual we find of uh, found a found a solution so we got a temporary money 40 lakh from one of the friend and invest uh, that work created a fd against that fd took a loan individual loan put that loan uh, individual loan as a capital into this new broking company then made a fd of that and returned back the original loan <laughs> this is a round uh, way of creating capital we had 10 lakh rupees so they wanted 10 lakh rupees to be there in fd fixed fd other thing can be into uh, your assets so that's how we created that entire capital of 50 lakhs a uh, very interesting way of doing it and we got uh, we basically applied for that license i think we applied sometime in 2000 6 early january in around 8 9 months we got our license and in 2006 we got our uh, license for the insurance broking and that's where we kind of i think the real growth of our organization started because it was a business which we could scale we didn't have to me and my partner didn't have to kind of be present yeah. all the time and which it was a very interesting business what was happening at that point of time is that insurance uh, was just opening up uh, there were a lot of companies who were offering insurance so the software companies offering health insurance was a key thing 
in the software industry and all the software industries were kind of uh, giving coverages of 3 lakh and 5 lakh which is a big number they were also offering this coverage to their dependents which is spouse children and parents now parents uh, offering a insurance to parents is a very risky proposition because you have a lot of claims and lot of insurance companies have bled a lot of uh, corporates have bled the premium because of this and then the uh, a trend came that uh, yes uh, the companies will offer insurance coverage to their parents but uh, that premium will be paid by the employee and companies will kind of uh, g- uh, create a cover get the cover structured from the insurance company but premium will be paid by the employee on his own now companies said okay fine uh, if the premium uh, is high then we will kind of give you some installment kind of a structure so 6 months emi company will basically uh, pay it through them so doing this actually increased the complexity of the entire administration and that's where we kind of worked very well because we took that entire administration on our table so first is that if you have to kind of give insurance cover to parents many people have to buy it that means the price has to be just right that people feel ki yes this is something which i don't mind investing and uh, if there is a risk if something goes wrong with my parents then i have a cover available but if that uh, premium becomes too high then the numbers come down and then only those people come who have some claim which is going to come so my father uh, needs to go for a cataract okay fine let me buy insurance and then get cataract done oh my father is going to have a knee replacement let me have a insurance so then the insurance doesn't remain viable that means you need a enough pool of people so that the insurance claims are not much but at the same time the premium has to be such that people are kind of uh, afford it so which means Uh, and companies were saying that ki, oh we are not going to take this insurance if insurance company is ready to uh, push it to my people and if people are willing to pay the premium we are we don't mind offering this cover which means we had to really really appeal uh, make that cover so nice so good at right price so that the insurance companies don't bleed at the same time people kind of go for it which means it involved a lot of selling so we basically then started creating campaigns to sell this insurance to uh, employees where we would kind of create different different campaigns to make them believe that yes they need to go for the cover for their parents so how do you take care of uh, this is the way you show your gratitude to your parents and all that we created all those campaigns also uh, when you are doing this you need to kind of do the enrollment so there is a complexity of getting enrolled people enrolled now we started doing enrollment through email but then people today would say that yo oh, i want to enroll my parents but tomorrow they would send another mail saying no 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 i don't want because the premium is too high then day after tomorrow they said no, no no i think i should go for it there were a lot of complexities managing this or email and this is 2007 2008 the the softwares were not so great then at that point of time i still remember a company like citibank used to kind of have a open excel where people would fill details of their dependents in an excel file with date of birth put in very clearly so you know somebody else's wife's name and date of birth and all that that's kind of a thing was happening in 2008 because there was no other option we changed that we basically built a software and we made everybody uh, we made kind of kind of enrollment software where people can just go uh, put in their employee id put in their date of birth as a first password and then they can the first option is to change the password and uh, do the enrollment on your own and we built it in such a manner that you just put whom you want to insure and the software will figure out what plan you can fit in and what is the premium that you have to pay and what is the emi that will come to you so we built everything very beautifully and that really uh, took us to places we could by the time in another 4 5 6 years time we had clients like citibank uh, kpit infosystem uh, midday accenture dow kellogg's mastech nielsen parley walmart india abbott dcb in svc camlin these are all very good murky clients uh, very uh, large premium city bank we started with city bank for i think some 80 lakh premium in 2009 2016 17 they were already at the premium of around some 25 30 crores 
emphasis same around 74 lakhs they reached at around 21 22 crores uh, so we grew with all these companies uh, a lot of people helped us uh, tr- trusting us we were two young people trying to do something interesting because if you see insurance is actually a business of trust and the more the gray hair more the trust is uh, that's the way it operates in india and seniors get kind of uh, advantage but we two young people were trying to do something different and that lot of people trusted us let's see let it be emphasis alok misra who was the cfo then s ramkrishnan who was the ceo later on cfo after alok their hr head ilango was a very good uh, guy and all these guys they were handling such big portfolios they never expected a single favor from us it was all just purely by uh, you do good work and we will kind of support you so uh, at only once i think i went out with elango uh, for a coffee he never came out for me so we say that okay let's meet for dinner and all never ever these guys came out for dinner or anything only once i think i re- remember meeting elango for a coffee and that coffee bill also he paid Uh, same is with uh, city bank city bank team is amazing i think we we be started with people in their uh, hr and then slowly it moved to procurement and procurement guys there is one gentleman called madhur jain i think he uh, handles more than 1000 crore of purchases every year he used to be the negotiations person purchase person from city bank for many years uh, we worked very closely with him never ever they would come out very upright people we used to send them birthday bouquets uh, and maybe uh, something yeah i think we, we only used to send birthday bouquets and every year i would get call on sometime end of uh, december madhur will call me and tell me sudhir you sent a bouquet on my birthday what was the price of that and i asked him like why why is somebody asking he said no 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 we have to declare in our annual uh, corporate compliances where i am not taken anything from any supplier so i need to put a value so there will be a gift i know the bouquet is fine and we okay then i would tell him that ki aur wo 800 rupaye ka bouquet tha and then he will write it in that report but very upright people used to manage big projects but never ever expected a penny and that was really amazing experience when you are working in corporate when you are working in b2b we hear so many stories of corruption so many st- stories of i scratch your back you scratch my back yeah we came across some clients but we always were very clear we don't want to do that kind of a business we will do business with people whom we resonate whom our values match so we always work that we kind of built uh, services around what we can give as a value more and more value that we can build so health insurance is something so we were a bucket uh, a very kind of a boutique uh, health insurance broking company we focused only on health insurance 98% of our revenue was through health insurance around uh, 1% uh, through life insurance and 1% through accident insurance that is the kind of company that we built by around 2016 we were almost around 120 odd people office in vidya vihar and then office in bangalore office in delhi a small office in chennai and we used to work with these people uh, almost around 500000 people uh, by then insured under various plans this is the time when i think the idea other brokers uh, were there was a little bit of consolidation going on and multinational brokers were kind of into kind of acquisition spree, uh, spree and then a few of them started talking to us in terms of would you be interested in having a stake sale and we were uh, looking at that as an option and we worked uh, i was not uh, very kind of uh, inclined to sell because i was enjoying what i was doing uh, it was uh, more of a, a kind of exercising your uh, ideas uh, bringing your ideas into kind of reality and living through your values so i was more focused but uh, i think my partner wanted to kind of uh, look at option to sell out and uh, move forward and people were looking at uh, selling 100% company uh, fully uh, they didn't want 50% and 50% going in we started getting these kind of indications right from 2011 12 onwards but 2014 15 is somewhere uh, a company uh, indian uh, broking company uh, which uh, kind of came to us and they started talking to us about kind of uh, acquisition stock swap and you get equity into their larger entity and then you kind of continue doing that and my partner who kind of get out getting his uh, money for his equity 
and we worked with that kind of a deal we were very our our business was very sticky so uh, emphasis was with us for almost from 2004 onwards until 2016 so 12 years uh, so insurance typically is a one year contract so every year you can change a broker you can change a insurance company so you have to fight your business every year which means you need to give good service you need to get right good rates for your client and only then you get a continuation so every year used to be a fight and we built very good relationships on the insurance side also we we worked with them we kind of showed them that how our portfolio can be profitable for them and they can make health insurance is a bleeding portfolio in india almost around claims ratio was around 130% then that means for every 100 rupee of premium you would give claims on 130 rupees claims that's a bleeding portfolio but then wow. but yes the insurance companies were making money through other insurance products so they used this product basically to keep their size bigger that's all so we 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 but we we still tried to make it a profitable portfolio by doing innovative work on structuring the product on ensuring that uh, the claims uh, there are there are kind of sharing of cost by the insurance the, the employees of the company we worked on all those things so with this the insurance uh, the, the we we looked at kind of this excel in 2016 early 2016 a larger broker from india kind of acquired us and uh, we kind of uh, got exit so there was a two year uh, period of cooling uh, we had to transfer all our clients to the company which acquired us uh, because this is all kind of annual revenue so you have to show that your revenues are really sticky that's where the valuation comes from so we had to transfer all the revenues and i was basically then kind of little ek i don't want to do anything in india can we do something interesting somewhere else and this company they told us that ki we have a, a broking small broking company in sri lanka would you be interested in looking at sri lankan business and that's how in 2017 i got an opportunity to go to sri lanka and uh, basically work there into the broking company so they had a small insurance broking company there and when i went there we started working towards how do we grow that business slowly i think i worked for 3 4 months and once we got a news that the number 3 broker in the market uh, there is a company called finlay which is a very big company in sri lanka finlay is a part of a swire group from hong kong which is which also owns cathay pacific so they they had this tea company so they had multiple businesses they had almost around 13 14 businesses so swire group there was some restructuring was happening and they said we'll got out to get out of all non core businesses so there was this insurance business and there was some other uh, businesses they were selling off all the businesses and keeping they were going to remain only in the business of uh, i think tea so there are lot lot big plantations tea plantations that they have in sri lanka uh, near kandy and other places so we got an opportunity the our md there is a cricketer uh, from past uh, graham lubroy oh. yeah so graham is the md there and i started working closely with graham and that time we got this opportunity that this finlay insurance broker which was number 3 broker in the market is up for sale and that's where i got so i was told that okay, okay fine will you lead the uh, kind of acquisition there and i said okay fine i don't mind doing that and uh, i started uh, we we i think there was one of the big four firms they were advising them for stexel and i i learned we, we asked them that what is the price that they have now they said that it's a 400 million lankan which is not a big big sum in rupees but that was the price quoted at the start and that's where i learned some part of good accounting some part of how do you see balance sheets and all so this indian company broking company which was uh, which had acquired medimanage the the, the owner uh, promoter owner is a chartered accountant so he kind of showed me how do you see balance sheets for acquisition and all i learned that and we found that they're all money that whatever valuation that they are asking for is on the revenue and that revenue so they were asking for a revenue multiple of 2 and that revenue was basically into the balance sheet but not into the real cash flow so we are that ki if you are showing that your revenue is so much uh, where is the revenue so they showed that ki um, how, almost around 60 70% of the revenue was in receivables that means we are yet to receive this money from insurance company as a, as a fee 
He said, okay, fine. Uh, if the valuation is multiple of your revenue, then your revenue has to show that it's really a real revenue. Because if you're showing on the books that you have so much of kind of surplus available, then that surplus has to be real. And we asked them to simply go to the insurance company and get a letter of confirmation for balances. And they could not get those confirmations because there were always disputes about those numbers. So what they had done te technically is that ki they had just booked the revenue and showed it into the books and uh, kind of year over year showing that ki this is receivable, this is receivable. And the receivable figure was huge. It was ballooned. And that really, that those receivables were not real there. They were not there. Because when we asked for those receivables to be given, confirmed by insurance company, none of them confirmed. So this company, which we started for a negotiation at 400 million, we finally could buy for just 43 million. Wow. Just 43 million. So we got, we bought this company. I just led that, I could lead that uh, entire effort. I there. love hanging out with people who say things like just 43 million, but carry on. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a Lankan rupee. So it's not really big sum in terms of dollar or INR. But uh, it, it is interesting. There's a lot of learning there that for me, uh, I learned a lot uh, during that entire exercise, how to see balance sheet, how to see business in the financial terms and stuff like that. And, and that's, that's, that's where the, the joy was. Uh, this company, I think, recently become the number one uh, broking company in Sri Lanka now. Uh, Graham still leads it. So those, that's basically what I uh, did as insurance broking and then some part. I used to go to Sri Lanka almost every week. Uh, sometimes I have been to Sri Lanka a couple of times in a week also. And it was a very interesting experience of life. While uh, I was uh, doing this, uh, the, the MediManage uh, stack sale happened and then I got involved into the broking in Sri Lanka with Finlay Insurance Broking. I was parallelly in 2013, I became a, a part of a group uh, which is a not-for-profit by Harsh Mariwala, which is uh, called Ascent Foundation. And this Ascent Foundation is basically uh, initiative where Harsh Mariwala felt that ki when he was, everybody knows he's uh, the Marico Group uh, chairman. And when he uh, started business, he felt that ki I could not really bounce my thought processes or anything with other than family members. And I really wanted to speak about this with my friends who would know business, not friends who are just casual friends or social friends, but people who understand business, people with business. And I could never have such circle. So if I can create a circle like this uh, for entrepreneurs and if they help each other through their own learnings, then that would be great. And that's how he had started this initiative called Ascent Foundation uh, way back in 2012. Now, I joined sometime in the month of January, yeah, 26 January 2013. That's almost 10 years now. And the Ascent Foundation, what it does is that it does, it brings around 10 to 11 different, different entrepreneurs together. Uh, they have a threshold, so they will bring uh, entrepreneur of similar business stage together. So if you are a manufacturing company, then your revenue could be 50 crores. If you are a services company, then it is 10 crores. So they have a multiple of five for service versus manufacturing. And every businessman or every entrepreneur who is in that group will not have competition with other. That means if you are from advertising background, no other advertising person would be there in that group. So different, different businesses, they will also look at a healthy mix of manufacturing versus services, that kind of a thing. So I became a member of Ascent Foundation, which is a not-for-profit. Not for and the idea is basically to learn from each other, uh, from each other's experiences. So nobody gives gyan to each other how things should be done. In case, so if, if somebody has a problem, they can put it forward. It is kind of a sounding board for entrepreneurs. And if you have a problem, you share it with others and others would tell what they would do or what they have done in similar situations like that. So it was a very, it's a very good uh, platform. It's a very good group. I have made friends. I have somebody who, uh, Asim Dalal is a friend, uh, he is a part of my group. He is basically used to own a uh, own Bombay store, uh, All India. Uh, so he is the one. Uh, Rajesh Doshi is a friend, another friend who basically runs a jewelry manufacturing unit in Sibs, uh, does almost 125 crore of turnover, sports to big uh, chains, departmental stores in US. Uh, Amish is another uh, guy who is into pharma, basically background. Uh, he uh, recently sold off his company. He was into pharma analytics and pharma information, uh, AIOCD AVAX. 
Bavin is into plastics. Hemen is another big guy, does 300 crore of turnover. He is into cardamom exports. He is branded cardamom. Uh, Vandana is an advertising uh, person. Kinjal is into uh, logistics and space management services. Kaushil is into again packaging industry. Sid. Yeah, so these are the these are the uh, guys whom I have been with for last ten years. A uh, very interesting thing is that we meet every month. Uh, there is a meeting date, and we meet for three hours. We kind of give each other update on what did I do last week, uh, last month, what what went right, what went wrong, what could be improved. That kind of a update we have to give. We call it check in, and we give that to everybody every month. Uh, these meetings are set six months in advance. And there is a protocol for these meetings. You meet on a monthly basis. You cannot be absent for more than two meetings in a year. Uh, if you are more than two meetings out, then you will be thrown out of the group. That kind of a year. You reach for a meeting on time. If you reach a minute late, you pay 1,000 rupees fine. You reach 15 minutes late, 3,000 rupees fine. So we collect a uh, fine for that. And missing a meeting is not allowed. So everybody is committed. I think uh, in last uh, 10 years, uh, so around 120 meetings that we have, 100, 100 meetings at least we must have had. I have not missed a uh, uh, I, I, couple of meetings. I have said I could not I could not go. So almost 98 times I have been there and maybe only once or twice delayed. Otherwise, be on time and be there without failing that date. So you, if there is a somebody can't make it, people help each other and kind of change the date. But ensure that everybody is available and everybody is there for the meeting. Very committed group of friends. Uh, so everybody has become a friend. They were entrepreneurs. All of them are entrepreneurs. We uh, knew each, each other uh, through Ascent. But everybody is now a good friend there. So that's another uh, offshoot or part where I think my personal growth happened in terms of uh, learning about profession, learning about business and how do you see things differently because everybody has a very different business. Somebody is into advertising, somebody is into motivation. So Think and Grow Rich is a book that you know, Napoleon Hill book. Uh, it's India franchises with Sid Shah. And Sid basically manages that completely. He was earlier into copper smelting and copper pipe business. He quit that because that was uh, basically had a lot of challenges on that business. He quit that business and got into Think and Grow Rich and he's running that for the last four or five years. And phenomenal transformation as an individual being I have seen. What a change he has done in his life. Same is uh, with Amish. Brilliant ideas on uh, pharmaceutical uh, information and uh, the products information products that he has created and uh, kind of uh, fought with the multinationals who are into this data business and built a solid company and kind of could get a nice exit. Heyman, again, uh, somebody who can just take a some simple thing like cardamom and brand it and export it to Middle East and all across the world and build a business of 300 crore. It's like unthinkable. I, I and he does it so coolly, like just very small team he has and he does that business very nicely. So all these people, I think, uh, gave me a different perspective toward business life, the way you see it, the way you operate it, the way you manage it. Uh, it's, it's very phenomenal. So that's basically the kind of my professional journey until now. In 2017-18, when I exited Medimanage, a uh, few of my friends who basically from my Shardashram friend, they kind of invited me to join their board and they uh, wanted uh, to grow the company from their current stage and they felt that okay, I could be a good help. So I, I kind of have joined there as a board director and I basically manage that. So that's my day job kind of thing. And that's where I think I that's where I met Mr. Bagwe who basically is my current co-founder in uh, HowFrameworks.com. That's my professional journey. Magnificent. I have uh, so many questions that uh, I hope you're aware that we're going to be here for a few more hours. My first question is about this, that elsewhere, I think in some other, uh, you know, you read an interview for CTQ with Harish. I don't know if you said it there or you wrote it in an article, but you wrote somewhere about how at one point when you were very young, uh, you realized you weren't very smart in your words. Uh, I would not say that, but you realized you were not very smart and therefore you realized that your key to getting ahead was discipline. Now, through this story, what I see is really a couple of things. 
One is that there is a lot of hard work happening, perhaps because of your circumstances and the scarcity out of which you come. Like when you, for example, uh, go to Shardashram, you know, where you're uh, mingling with people outside of your neighborhood of Vikroli. There are rich people from the other, as true, it were, true, true. who are there. <laughs> and you're working so hard that uh, without anyone realizing, all of a sudden you're first in class and you're all of that. And that hard work is really compensating. You speak about how for some of your other friends, math was so incredibly easy. And you had to find a space where you made sure you were not failing by a healthy margin, so which is like a kind of insurance. Instead of 21, you're getting 27 out of 50. But at the same time, you know, you're having to work because it doesn't come so easily to you that you can just try every paper, uh, every uh, question in a paper and say, check any three, right? Yeah, so. Which requires some chutzpah. And I have realized that I have in my life, sometimes when things have come easy to me, I've fallen into a trap of being feeling entitled to things coming easily to me and getting carried away by that and not working as hard as I should. And I think that can be a tremendous curse. And in your sense, I would say, in your case, I would say that it's probably a kind of tremendous blessing that you're actually putting in the hard work. Like I remember my very first job as a copywriter when I was 20 years old. In 1994, I was in HTA Delhi, then India's number one agency. Now it's J. Walter Thompson. Uh, it's called J. Walter Thompson. And I remember as a young copywriter, one assignment was given to the group. And uh, there were three of us, two other guys and me. And we were just bouncing off ideas for that, uh, three young copywriters. And I was 20, 20 or 21. And they were, I was 20. Uh, they were probably 25, 26, not much more, more older than me. And one of those guys just had terrible grammar, terrible lang uh, uh, language, terrible ideas. I was like, ye kya hai? Ye kaise kaam kar hai? Matlab, what is this person? You know. Well, I thought I was coming up with really smart ass lines. My English was great and all that. But three days later, when all of us submitted whatever we had to submit, that guy's work was by far the best. Mm -hmm. And that was because he didn't stop thinking about it. Mm -hmm. He just worked and he worked and he cracked it and he just got a certain clarity and everything kind of fell into place. And that's an early lesson that more and more in life I see that, uh, you know, that ethic is important. And my question to you is that that is not just sort of a theme that is there in that early part of your life, which you told me about. But I can see it in pretty much your entire life because from hard work, I think one comes to intentionality. That you decide ki boss mujhe kuch karna hai. Main karunga, right? And in most people's, for most people, our life falls into a groove and we are just flowing naturally into that groove. So one, we stop working harder than we need to. And two, we lose that intentionality where we take everything for granted, right? And everything is normalized and everything is background in a sense. In a sense, everything is unseen. But with you, I've noticed that there is a lot of intentionality when it comes to things like friendships, remembering everybody's birthday, sending flowers and sending gifts, which you make it a point to do. There is intentionality when it comes to learning. And I'm going to ask you about that. And you're going to spend a quite a bit of time telling me about <laughs> your philosophy there, because I'm kind of fascinated by, you know, the approach you have towards learning and even teaching, which you've done. And we'll talk about that as well. So was it was this always a constant part of your character that you are always working that you're intentional or are there aspects of this which come late in life like is there a point in life where you realize that fuck i have to work on this aspect of my game whether it is friendships or whether it is learning or whether it is intellectual curiosity or whatever you know or were you always kind of like this and what is your journey towards thinking about this stuff because you haven't i don't think you've arrived even if you have those character traits i don't think you were just you've just automatically flowed into this you've put in thinking about yourself and the life you want to live and arrived at this so so i know it's a very broad question but yeah so i think about relationships friendships i think i have always been intentional that's something which i do because i believe in that and uh, I feel that key anything that you have to make it work, then you have to put efforts in that. So friendships don't happen just like that. If you feel that they they wither away, there are what you spent as a childhood, those friendships may remain. But I think you need to work on friendships. You need to kind of invest onto friendships. So I would do that, and I like it. I generally like it. I like so. 
uh, I, I would not all my good friends I will never wish them on WhatsApp I will never wish them on messages I'll pick up a phone and call so all my uh, friends very close friends all my Ascent Foundation friends I pick up a phone and call them and talk to them for 5-7 minutes 10 minutes at least on their birthday so I will never send a message I will never serve. so these are small things that I do because I believe in them I said that you know this is birthday this is my friend 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 and I kind of so I have saved the numbers I have I have a system where I have saved the numbers that is that goes in my calendar so it goes in my contact that is that goes in my calendar when it goes in my calendar I have two reminders so one reminder two days before one reminder on the day in the morning I have done that it's for very few people but I have done it so I think I am very intentional there when it comes to the knowledge the learning part I think it came a little late in life the moment i the, the when i came into the big ocean of uh, business i started seeing more and more smarter people and then i realized that ki boss mai itna intelligent to nahi hu really i am not i i am i have i have that realization ki because i saw nandu who was my is no more we lost him in 2013 uh, kidney failure uh, so that nandu who would write uh, all the questions answer to all the questions and uh, yeah, he was tremendously uh, intelligent uh, and uh, i knew that ki mai nandu nahi ban sakta or another friend grish uh, good maths and i said that ki mai grish nahi ban sakta but i said that ki what can i do that will take me ahead and i said that ki okay let me structure so i think habits is something that i built pretty late but intentionality came so let's say around 10 10 12 years back i started thinking about it very clearly in terms of i am not smart i am not intelligent i need to do and kind of build something so i started reading more intentionally i started kind of thinking about what i read i started about introspecting about myself but uh, real growth I think happened in last five to seven years. Five years, I would say definitely around 2017-18. I think I also, so I got space. Once I sold the company off, I had some money in the bank and I didn't really have to kind of be after that business and kind of, because I think insurance broking business was very taxing in terms of uh, some or other renewal is coming. You have to retain that revenue. That means you have to write, really work hard in terms of managing that. Yes, uh, we had a fantastic stickiness, but still uh, the competitor would always try and come in and we were fighting with all the multinational brokers and multinational brokers used to kind of talk at top. So they will not talk to the HR head, they will talk to the CEO and come from top to bottom and then uh, the HR head would not have choice because, but to kind of listen to them and give in. We created val- so much of a value that uh, they could fight with CEO that, you know, no, no, we will continue with this broker. So that pressure was always there. With that pressure, I think I was lost a lot into kind of doing stuff. But once I sold the company and had some space, I started about these thinking about these things very kind of intentionally. I understood that kind of going through life just through motions is not the right way. I need to kind of build my knowledge. I need to kind of build my dots as you very often say that we need to collect more and more dots and the picture will become kind of much clearer the uh, high definition vision i think that's something that i started doing around four or five years back so i do read what i do i stopped uh, buying books uh, physically i have a lot of books but uh, i now buy books on kindle and uh, i whatever i like uh, and in terms of interesting paragraphs and all that i highlight them uh, I have linked my Kindle to Kindle and uh, also I so apart from Kindle what I do is that the last I think three three and a half years I am a member of CityQ so uh, Ramanand and Harish uh, both of them they run CityQ they send an article every day I read so every article I read every day before next day morning 10 o'clock 10 o'clock is the deadline I read each article I don't pile them up I, I kind of finish it every day I think maybe once or twice it must have happened that I have missed it Other why I do that very intentionally very clearly that's a habit that I have built so whatever I like from those articles as a paragraph I highlight them 
uh, and I have an app called Readwise. So that I copy them and go, that goes into the Readwise. And then Readwise kind of gives me space repetition you can do. So whatever passages that you have saved in Readwise, I read every day 15 passages of that every day. So it throws randomly passages uh, to you, back to you. Uh, when you have read a book recently, those passages come very often. But otherwise, they keep coming to you. And I read so that's happening. I think today I must be at 630th day. I have a streak. I have not missed a single day wow. reading that those. Yeah. So that, that it, it's a streak. So you can basically see your progress there very clearly. And I had started some time back and I turned some 185. I missed it or I, I got busy and I never realized that I have done that. Then I last 26th of December 2021, I have started. And I have not missed a day doing that. So I do this knowledge uh, learning very intentionally because I have a clear cut understanding that I smart not smart, I ye karna hai. And I think this is helping me. So I have a system in place which helps me build my knowledge. And like I say, I mean, I'm uh, smart, nahi hu. I mean, uh, you're, you're so self-effacing, you will insist on that most forcefully. One, I don't think that's true. And two, I think that is true of everyone. And these are, of course, contradictory thoughts. But I think... Every the, the smartest person in the world is really smart in one or two things. True. You know, most things are a complete ignorant fool. True. And therefore, you need systems to organize the knowledge in your mind. But before you kind of get those systems, like you've just described your sort of reading stack, as it were, you mm. know, Kindle, CTQ, Readwise. But before one gets to those systems, there has to be the will and the intention to actually uh, get there. So that's kind of admirable. And like some people have an uh, SIP, uh, you also have an IIP, mm -hmm. uh, which you have a fund set aside for. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about this IIP. Oh, okay. So that's, uh, I basically have kept a certain money uh, aside. And what I do is that I spend that on various subscriptions. I spend that on buying books. I spend that on certain podcast EA subscriptions. So what I do is that uh, this money is kept for that and this is my knowledge investment and IIP is mm -hmm. yeah yeah so intellectual investment uh, mm -hmm. plan, plan IIP so what I do is that so that is again intentional so if I earn certain money then I will keep this money because something will go towards future investments and all that but something has to go towards knowledge management so I take certain subscriptions I buy certain books and I believe that a lot of people have this thought process of I believe that no one has to buy uh, books, good books always, even if you don't read them, uh, if they are lying there in your cupboard or if they are lying in your Kindle, it's okay. I think everything is not a sugar cane that you have to get juice out of it. You know, I think that's not the approach that one should have towards knowledge uh, or towards books. I think if good books are bought, then only good books will come out. That's the basic supply demand funda. So, agar demand hi hai, to supply nahi hoga. So, if we keep demand alive, we will always get good literature, good books out. And that's why I think I have 2,200 odd books in my Kindle, and most of them are not read. I read whenever I get time. I read that. I try and do intentionally reading. Narendra Mirko bataya ki was ek karne ka din ka 25 pages to padna hi hai. I am trying to kind of follow his advice. So. But still, I have books, If I even if I read one book every week, I will need 30-40 years to read all these books available. But that does not, does mean, does that mean that I should not buy books? No, no, I'll still keep buying books. So, there is uh, this word, Japanese word called sundoku, that's, that's where you just hog, keep books, uh, buying books and keep them, holding them. But I think I don't mind doing that. Because I feel that key, I don't have to kind of look at it from a very utilitarian point of view. Ki book liya to padna hi hai hai. I think if it is a good book and if it comes from good recommendations, you should buy it. More the book copies are sold, more books will come in, more good books will come in. The future generation would have access to good books that way. So I don't I don't see it from that perspective. That's the way that's why I have this IIP as a concept, intellectual investment plan where I set aside certain money and buy books, uh, buy subscriptions. Again on subscriptions, I might not so New Yorker subscription is there and I might not read each and every article that is there, but something which is interesting I will read. But should that mean that I, I should not I should kind of stop that subscription? I I don't think so. I'm seeing currently Wikipedia is uh, running a campaign of subscription. I pay Wikipedia 
Wikipedia money also. I pay them money because I feel Wikipedia should uh, be there. It's it's a interesting project and is so much of learning that has happened through Wikipedia for me. And I think one should pay once in a while whenever they are asking for money. We should pay that. I think it's our collective responsibility to keep knowledge available and keep knowledge growing. And I think we should be very intentional about it. If you are moneyed and if you can afford to do that, one should definitely do it. That's that's what I think. You have given me a quote of the episode, and this can be a T-shirt line. Everything is not sugar cane. What a <laughs> fantastic uh, line! And 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 no, I completely agree with you that uh, I also haven't read the majority of the books that I bought, which is like you said, physically impossible, no matter yeah. how much time you uh, devote to it. And I sort of think of it. as like one phrase that i have come to think about recently is the surface area of serendipity that mm-hmm. like what you want to do is you grow through exposure to things that you were not aware of earlier True. and you can expand your surface area of serendipity either by reading a lot or buying a lot of books where you know even if if at any given point in time i'm bored and i want to read something i have so many unread books around me to choose from i don't even need to leave my house or go to amazon or whatever True. they're already there but another way of expanding the surface area of serendipity i guess is by meeting more and more people now for someone like me introverted doesn't like to go out much it's kind of naturally restricted you on the other hand like you mentioned that in the 90s when you were at uh, you blue know star. Uh, at blue star also you were known for good networking and meeting people and all that and and to me from whatever i've seen of you this this feels very natural it is not as if you have to force yourself out of your comfort zone or whatever you enjoy meeting new people and chatting with them and all of that and so you know what is your thinking about this how much of this is uh, an effort how much of this just comes easily uh, how did you grow into this kind of habit because i'm imagining like you mentioned the first time you entered a five star right the first time i entered a five star also i felt out of place i said any moment darwan aake bolega ki sir what do you want what is your work here you True. know and i think we all go through anxieties like that of how you will be perceived by other people which for someone like me makes you know reaching out uh, much harder but in 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 your case the it's is it something that you've had to work on what is what is your sort of thinking around this whole thing of expanding the surface area of serendipity i think the more i got comfortable with myself the more i got comfortable with everybody else so once i realized that I, I I basically was becoming comfortable in my own skin, and I started reading. I started understanding that not everybody is as smart as they think. I see a lot of people with a lot of ignorance, and I felt that key. Yes, there is. People will be different, and people will have their own challenges. And once you start having, once you are clear about that empathy, once you start accepting people for what they are, and kind of interacting with them. then then it becomes very easy for me meeting people is actually learning experiences learning thinking the way people think so a trader thinks in a different way a businessman thinks in a different way a service provider will thinks in a different way a product provider thinks in a different way so i see these are all learnings uh, in different way and yeah i am naturally i like meeting people over a period of time i i have started restricting that circle i don't know somehow i feel that there is a very little time uh, left with us yeah uh, though you have been saying that we will all live 100 120 years but somewhere i feel that ki i need to meet right people i need to kind of filter that and i want to kind of make it enriching so i this uh, uh, particular ascent foundation it has almost around 800 and 50 odd people i am part of the governing council this year so i get to talk to people i get to basically select people who would come inside that selection panel i am part of that so i i see people and i see different ways of thinking i see different my way is not the right way all the time i think there are so many different ways to do things and there there is a learning in that so i i like that uh, i like doing that and i like meeting uh, people for that learning and again i think my i genuinely believe in relationships i i am not transactional uh, i don't like a mere transaction i need to see value in it so way back uh, i think in 1997 98 uh, i was invited for joining amway 
and i said that i can't join amway because amway would force me to see at my friend at my relative as a consumer and try and peddle a product to them and push them knowing fully well that that product is way high priced and that entire pricing is all about the mark for the distribution which everybody will that pyramid chain where everybody would get something out of that i was shown big picture about you will you can earn 1 lakh 2 lakh 3 lakh per month and all that but i never could join amway as part because i don't believe into relationships that way i i i don't see them in transactional manner a uh, same way i am not i am part of ascent which basically talks about value but i could never become part of bni so business nation network international I, are you aware about no. so bni is basically a group where everybody does networking and that networking is majorly about giving somebody a lead and through, through lead they make uh, transactions and it's pure transaction basis is what i feel now there must be bigger philosophy there but i could never really kind of identify myself with that i always feel that there has to be a value in that relationship and that that should that value creation should be there even if you are meeting for business there should be a value and that that uh, networking cannot be just only for transaction i think transactions pure transaction give me kind of discomfort i am i see relationship needs to be i i am a people person i like people and i would like to do things for people and i would like to genuinely cherish that relationship build that relationship and if transaction happens it's fine i think that that's a outcome or that's a side thing that can happen but i genuinely am interested in people and kind of connect with people that's a personality that i have i have not kind of cultivated it over a period of time but i i have always been a relationship person always always this reminds me of you know kant's categorical imperative of treating every person as an end in themselves and not as a means to an end so just exactly the same thing that don't treat relationships as transactional and i'm also thinking about like you and i are part of that generation which made that transition from being constrained on the one hand to communities of circumstance to being able to form communities of choice largely because of the internet like all my good friends are really people i've met uh, through the internet more or less you know you, you narena and none of us would have known True. each other if not uh, for the internet mm-hmm. or our fourth member subrat we have this whatsapp group called food True. lovers of mumbai we will not share any of those secrets on our show because they belong to us alone and uh, and and so, so initially you know you're constrained by the people you know in your neighborhood and then in your school and then in your uh, you know whichever company you work at and etc etc and 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 i want to sort of dig in a little more into what it you know what that period of being part of ascent would have done for you because what i'm imagining is that when you're a successful entrepreneur you know you might reach a stage where you're insulated from honest looks at yourself where it is very tempting to think that wow you know maine ye kar diya hai and i have achieved this and i'm so smart and i'm so whatever and all of that and i think the beautiful advantage of being part of the group kind of group that you describe at ascent with these other 9 10 uh, people is that they are also as successful as you if not more and they are they have, all of them know things that you don't and you of course know things they don't but you'll underplay that but they all know things that you don't and through them you get to see yourself in a sense i'm guessing through a different lens you know how do you look from the outside to them so tell me a little bit about that process because i feel that that must also be so priceless that you don't become a victim of your own success or become an ossified self but you're always an evolving self you know so tell me a little bit about the communities of choice that you formed and so on and i will come back to communities of circumstance after this but so ascent i think was very interesting in way that you could bounce off the ideas and uh, you could also get criticized uh, for something and at many times what i thought as a brilliant idea was a kind of broken down into how this can be a suicidal attempt and not for me for everybody this has happened so what happens is that when you have that kind of a trust developed between each other we have we have a solid group so we basically they have done something called lifeline as a uh, exercise where everybody talks about their life the way i am speaking now uh, everybody tells about their life their sorrows their wins their enjoyments their achievements we talk so we we had gone to goa in 2015 16 we talked about it we recently were in nasik uh, off site and we talked about it again so we keep challenging each other we keep kind of uh, questioning each other we kind keep kind of uh, 
uh, kind of questioning the beliefs that we have and that's an interesting uh, one is that you are not judged so it's a trust group you are not judged you can say what you want to say not that you say something which is i would say stupid but uh, something which is sensible something which uh, you uh, but but you are conflicted about and people will give a different perspective and that that is a space i i want to be and that's an interesting space i think everybody should have uh, that kind of a space uh, more so uh, people in business because you can do uh, so many mistakes and can actually go off track uh, so easily and somebody who is objectively looking at things but typically that happens in family businesses i have i think a couple of uh, people in our group have family businesses and they struggle through the pressures of their parents their family members involved in the business and they struggled between what decisions to take whether emotions should be preserved or professionalism should be brought in and stuff like that and when they talk about it they can uh, we were all friends so they can candidly talk about what went wrong and how could this be solved and other people they are so um, so the, so we know that ki yes he, we know this person is uh, uh, emotional and this person needs to solve a problem we know that ki we can't uh, kind of give him advice where he can go and fight with his family but at the same time figure out something which will help the business and help him kind of maintain relationships better and we keep working on that so i think when such groups or such uh, groups are built or such communities of choice are built a trust is very important factor i think i should be able to trust others and i should be able to know that what i'm getting as an advice is coming in an absolute clear clean intention there is nothing kind of underlying meaning underlying agenda and once that happens one such community is our uh, clear writing community amazing community that we have there and anybody who puts anything there i think everybody is so comfortable with each other that they don't mind putting up stuff easily and nobody takes it out and i think such community should exist more and more how do we build that how do we uh, create that is a challenge but uh, with the kind of distraction with the kind of shallow interactions that we see around uh, the uh, the attention span going down i feel it, it's something which worth uh, thinking about worth uh, kind of exploring about but yes such bonds can help us uh, think very comfortably within that sphere and uh, i think can help i want to turn to sort of communities or circumstances now like i promised i would and i want to you know take you back to wickrolly mm-hmm. to that housing society where you're growing up mm-hmm. and are you still in how many of those people are you still in touch with by the way ah uh, i think uh, four or five people at least definitely so one of my friend who to stay in the same building past 10th i think uh, it past 12th also i think he did uh, his graduation yeah and he was uh, after that he had a auto rickshaw he used to kind of ply that and he was doing that in 2003 4 when i was in uh, when i was into consulting one of my very close friend vishwesh joshi he is no more he passed away in 2016 cancer colon cancer a uh, very close friend from my uh, asian art institute days so he was doing this hospital project management at thane the jupiter hospital and he so i met this sanju guy who used to ply auto so i told him that ki why you want to do this in life uh, why don't you look at something else and he was after me ki give me some break i need to have some good break and i introduced him to this uh, friend of mine vishwesh and vishwesh took him in his company and he was on to the project jupiter hospital right from i think 2002 3 and that boy boy na is is it my age only sorry and uh, he is now the patient relationship manager at jupiter hospital uh, earns five figure salary six figure salary maybe yeah six figure salary now uh, so from auto rickshaw plier in his uh, uh, late 20s to relationship manager in an hospital Uh, he also manages the laundry so he's good at certain stuff so they have given him additional responsibility of managing the laundry phenomenal growth again kind of hard work again you know no no i don't want to apply auto all my life and i want to do something different with my life that thought process so i think there are uh, four or five people from that a so that entire colony kind of uh, the buildings because of their age almost 50 55 years those are getting kind of like uh, going to redevelopment so our building is already gone nobody is there so that's kind of 
broken down so and then now a new 17 or 18 story can tower is coming there so people are kind of dispersed but but i'm t- i'm still in touch with few people there and i think they are everybody is looking at changing the life so this one example is very a uh, striking example sanju who changed his life so i have one main question but before i come to that a sideways question struck me because you mentioned redevelopment and uh, you know and i've been thinking recently and i will write about it at length about how the different forms in which we sort of the different forms that are all around us inhabit a, a, you know change our culture in such profound ways change societies in certain ways and one of those forms is the way that we live together like very often redevelopments fail because you might have say a, a tenement or a slum where you have a bunch of people living together their houses almost bleed into one another you have all the women gathering together you have kids running from one house to the other with True. easy access and that builds a certain kind of community feeling True. the elders feel that they are not alone they can just sit out in the a common gallery and people are all around them and when you redevelop them and you put them all in these atomized apartments th- that fabric shifts completely True. so you know for an elite upper middle class person like me it seems completely natural to be in an apartment like i am right now i would you know i i you know feel very disturbed if i was in that kind of a communal situation where anybody can look into my window at any point in time and you know even at home i don't like to have the curtains open at certain times but you know i all these different forms you know there are trade offs and i would imagine that the kind of the kind of bonds you form and the kind of life you live is completely different from one form to the other and therefore the kind of person that you become also so and, and this is really an abstract question because you know you haven't done an ab experiment of yourself living parallel sure. lives but what what is your sort of sense of this i think uh, the scarcity of the space uh, so it had uh, that 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 life had its own fun we were so good bunch of friends uh, play all the time have fun i think i living in that 180 square foot house with three kids with uh, three of us three brothers sleeping on one side my mom sleeping on the other side my dad sleeping on the bed up there space was very tiny it also created a kind of a sense of i need more space today i i i, I enjoy larger space i need open space i think it came from that scarcity uh, that you know no i need to do something on the mindset side i changed uh, quite a bit in terms of my everybody told told me that you need to live in the uh, kind of uh, very restricted available space or available money that you have and i always uh, over a period of time i said why i i i became a kind of a child who asked this why and i i said no i want to have more i want to kind of do better why i used to limit myself and today also my focus is not on really saving money my focus is more on earning more i would i would basically try and say build more value and focus more i also on the business side i feel that ki the businesses which focus more on cutting the cost are basically doing it because they cannot generate enough value that's why they focus more on cost 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 but if you generate enough value you will be able to price your products higher so i don't know whether i am answering your question right or not but i am saying that ki that being together is uh, is is it was a certain phase of life and i enjoyed that and i was not aware about the world outside but as your exposure grows and you start kind of seeing the world in a different light and you start kind of getting comfortable with certain things i think i have kind of got to that level where i have become comfortable with little more space i have become comfortable with kind of little more extra being there and i'm i'm okay with that kind of a thing my approach towards maybe books which is kind of uh, don't look at it from extraction point of view all all come from there that i have lived through scarcity so a little abundance is no problem i think <laughs> let's let let it be there is what i i see it like yeah yeah no one should mind abundance so people who have abundance often don't want it for others <laughs> but uh, leaving that aside which is practically anyone in india who talks about economics and 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 the main question i was getting at here is about escape velocity 
like i think of how circumstance plays a role in your life that your father's mentor tells him that no no don't send him in a vikrali school send him to sharda ashram and you go there and different circumstances happen at different points in time perhaps you know it's again like you said a pivotal circumstance that you happen to get that particular internship you know in that particular place with that particular mentor mr jadhav and and uh, that True. changes so much and i think that in a sense you know you're probably the one who made good the one who got away from that little neighborhood and part of it is circumstances and luck part of it is also your force of will and your attitude and you know in that sense you're the outlier i would say from what you say about your friend sanju even sanju is an outlier because true, he true. wanted to get beyond that life true and i think about escape velocity and i think about mobility and i think about how can people leave their circumstances behind and i think here it is a sort of a larger kind of social problem because if you look at it at the atomized level of a family like you've mentioned that your dad would be so busy that sometimes he wouldn't come home to celebrate his birthday also and your mother would instead be making some sweet dish uh, to celebrate it without oh. him being there and you cannot expect individual parents to have the time or the awareness or whatever to necessarily you know help their kids out of these or help them think differently and all of that and i think that there's a great tragedy there and it's a tragedy even for families who are not so poor and who have more space to live in like something that my friend ajay shah said which i uh, think about from time to time is he pointed me to this study uh, by some nobel prize winner i forgot mm-hmm. exactly what i must discuss it some day in detail with ajay on everything is everything but the study essentially showed that kids who grow up in houses uh go grow up in homes listening to 10 letter words around them they end up having an extra layer of awareness that other kids don't and 10 letter words here is just a proxy for a higher discourse oh. but the idea being that privilege is not just about wealth privilege is also about having those conversations having the value of leisure time made out to you so you could be you know in in new india you might have benefited from the liberalization of 91 moved out of poverty moved into the middle class you can afford to buy your kids books or whatever but your mentality is still sort of scarcity mindset and therefore everything you do is goal directed ki agar bacche padhai karte what do the kids do you know either it's complete time pass ki gali mein cricket khel rahe hai ya film dekhne ja rahe hai or it is goal directed ki i have to crack the iit exam i have to go to iim i have to be vice president in city bank i have to have a uh, whatever big house and a two foreign holidays a year by 45 whatever the case might be and you get all of that but there is still something missing and whereas certain people have like i certainly had the privilege that when i was growing up nothing was goal directed right i didn't have to worry about my future my family wasn't wealthy my dad was a rare honest uh, government uh, servant but at the same time i could you know i wouldn't have to worry i i could chill you know and therefore i could uh, bask in my leisure time now it's a tragedy that i wasted that privilege and didn't make as much of my leisure time as i could have but it seems to me that you know a lot of people are just sort of denied this and the point is even if it is denied in a context of a particular home i still feel that this is a social problem that surely is solvable like today of course you have access to the greatest knowledge in the world through youtube and whatever but it is still i feel a problem that is solvable and i'm wondering what you think about it because you i'm guessing did obviously did not have the privilege of listening to tell letter words around you but through a force of will you brought yourself into that world and created that world for yourself and eventually you know gained that escape velocity and climbed out of that but in general what do you think about this like when you think back on your childhood and your youth and all the people who didn't make it and all the people who were very smart but you know chose differently and didn't have the drive and so on and so forth so what 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 are your thoughts on this journey because in a sense you are the guy who escaped you are the guy who made it you know but so many of your friends simply didn't and and so many of your friends never even wanted to and so many of your friends didn't even think there was something to escape to so what i i mean it's a very general and nebulous question i know but i know i think something that uh, kind of helped me uh, think differently is my reading i was reading though i was reading marathi early life i i read quite a lot and i think that reading opened so that time uh, exposure was not there today exposure is much higher so you can actually see a uh, stuff uh, what's happening in us what's happening across the world just with the click of a button but that time it was difficult but that time the escape was through books and those books i think opened the 
kind of mind my mind uh, though it is marathi but i think marathi literature is that, that way very rich uh, in culture rich in kind of ideas that one can bring in very progressive in a way and that somewhere that reading opened my uh, mind and basically took me ma- made me think little differently and fundamentally I, i don't know but then i was a little rebel uh, in a way and i w- always questioned about why this is like this and why it can't be something different uh, so i think with that uh, thought process i i was uh, i think initially i just had to get out of that poverty i think that the whole focus was ki boss apne ko ye karna hai because paisa nahi hai to paisa kamana hai once that little money started coming in that mentorship that happened with prashant and the kind of exposure that i got in blue star the training that i got there slowly slowly i think i started building that kind of thought process that no i need to kind of do more and do more i somewhere when i was doing this job i always knew that ki job is not going to give me something great somewhere i i was that rebel part of me didn't want me to kind of uh, follow the instructions which are given in in corporate environment so wanted to do something on my own was always the thought process and i think i could uh, with that certain setbacks on personal life i could take that freedom and i could just jump into that and do it and i think a lot of circumstances a lot of will a lot of people helping i i think uh, huge gratitude towards all those people who at every stage of life came in my life uh, and helped me uh, go little further ahead i think that all uh, happened so well i i never have really spent time and thought ki this did what it could what what it would have been if some people would not have been there in life or something would not have happened had i not gone to sadasham what would have happened had i not gone to visit ai what would have happened had i not had i taken that taj job i would have been in some basement all my life i would not have taken a jump to doing business all these keep questions keep coming back but i feel fundamentally i think there is that scarcity during that period bro all of us today uh, there is a lot of information availability there is a lot of resource availability and that i think somewhere has uh, made the 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 will to do is i feel it is bit weaker i don't know uh, this is my hypothesis but i think we wanted to succeed because we had seen so much of scarcity and then everything came just right at time you came out in the market and you could basically kind of uh, apply your hypothesis and get success and move forward somewhere that's i think i have i have not really thought much about this i need to think more that ki what really made this happen but i always feel that ki the scarcity the no choice situation pushed one forward ahead and that's that's what i think about it i don't know whether couple of couple of related questions if you were 15 years old today a do you think that you would have you know gotten out of those circumstances of scarcity faster than you did then because you would have so many resources available to you for free in terms of learning on youtube and new opportunities and etc cetera, etc cetera. or b do you think it would have slowed it down in some way or c do you think sanju would have gotten out quicker ha huh. interesting i think with with the resources available resources available now i think i would have done much faster i think sanju also would have done much faster i think because it was a struggle everything was a struggle then you you had to get books that was a struggle i i think i have stood in the queue for getting sugar stood in the queue for getting kerosene early life maybe when i was in 7 7 it's a 9 year old 10 year old i have done all that so much is available today now uh, that's available for my son also and uh, that's so much of abundance there i think we could have done with this kind of uh, drive to succeed i think we can do much 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 better in today's circumstances definitely while i'm saying this i also know the nature of distraction that is there the huge distraction that is there you you move from one thing to other so fast we had a lot of focus then we could do a stuff if i have to write a letter to a client then i could spend an hour writing that letter polishing it three four times 
today i don't know whether i'll be able to do that with this ping there and that uh, today chat gpt will do it for you in 2 minutes and you can spend 58 minutes doing something else <laughs> yeah on instagram or somewhere else i know i know yeah but i think i would have i, I would have much moved much faster is what i think i would i would have got out of that circumstances because i think there is so much available uh, so Uh, at fingertips and uh, that time the resources were the challenge today resources are not a challenge i think today your attention and your focus is uh, much more important uh, resources are not resources are available in abundance that's a fascinating shift i want to ask about your reading in marathi that mm-hmm. particular habit and it's a two part question the first half of each question is the same which is that did your reading a uh, did your marathi reading habit make you different from and the first part of the question is those of your peers who didn't read at all and the second part of the question is those of your peers who did their reading in english because i have often found that fellow english speaking elites who been on my show like me often tend to have a view of the world which is not as well rounded as uh, you know those of us who had that multilingual education who kind of would read in a vernacular whether it's hindi or marathi or gujarati to start with as has been the case with many of my guests and then go to english later and i find that they have a deeper subtler appreciation of the country and i don't want to generalize about everyone true, true. but at some level so do you feel that a it set you apart and made you see the world differently and perhaps contributed to your drive more than it would have with non readers and two do you think that you were able to see some things differently and with more empathy because you read in marathi and not just in english as in others like when you speak of your people skills of understanding people understanding what makes someone tick you know learning that you a person is missing something and you can get her a book every month and all of that uh, there's a certain kind of empathy there sometimes it can be natural but i think the more exposure you have the more likely you are to get that kind of empathy reading of course helps but reading in multiple languages would so, so what, what what are your thoughts on that i think definitely uh, if you read more uh, so readers versus non readers i think you definitely go st- score much 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 higher because i think reading in marathi marathi is a very rich uh, language uh, the literature scene is very good it that time 80s and 90s we had fantastic books coming out i have i have read almost all major authors uh, during that time so newspapers were one uh, the magazines were another as i have told you already uh, there used to be uh, this uh, uh, babura arnalkar or suhas shirvalkar these were very light readings that were there but there were pl deshpande is one who basically is amazing observant person i still carry his one of the book in my bag all the time this book called vyakti and valli it's about different different personalities that he has amazing observation that he has and that observation skill is what make you kind of learn about things around you observe more with that so the way he has observed and then you suddenly say oh how this guy could see this so clearly can you give me an example can you read out something so like? so i have this this vyakti and valli uh, is there there is one character who is basically named antu barwa and that antu barwa is a guy in konkan and is not um, does not have much money his kids have been sending some money and he's living on that and then whatever small little trees that he has there the betel nut tree and the mango tree and all that and he writes about he talk he, when they go and they are drinking tea there and that while drinking tea the, the there is not enough milk in the tree and he would not say that ki there is not enough uh, milk in the tree he would say that ratnangri cha samast mashi turthas gavan kare gampya when that guy is gampya now what he is telling is that ki are all the uh, buffaloes around are basically pregnant currently that they are not giving milk wow so that's the way you would talk a simple thing what you are wanting to tell is that ki there is not enough milk in the tea but you would talk in such a roundabout manner and that's the way those people are the, the basically it's it's konkan so konkan people will not talk straight they will always go roundabout and kind of have a little different way of speaking now these are the things which uh, pl deshpande has brought in he has put, written book like batade chital which is about uh, life about in a chawl in uh, girgaon uh, he has t- written about that asami asami is another book that he has he went to 
east east of world so japan and uh, indonesia and uh, vietnam and all so he wrote about apurvai then he went to the west so he wrote about that in purvaranga amazing uh, observation skills amazing kind of detailing of characters uh, in this vyakti anvalli he talks about uh, one uh, teacher of his called chitrale master and that entire chitrale master basically he goes collecting money for the school uh, kind of redevelopment in the in the in the native place and he is going to all the students and uh, this guy basically he chitrale master has told him that ki you collect me from this 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 student then i'll come and stay with you and he goes there to meet and there are a lot of chappals outside and uh, there is only one chappal which is kind of kind of really really ghost gone torn and he said that must be chitle masters <laughs> that is the way he explains the personality uh, the way it is written so beautiful it is there is one book called uh, garambi sa bapu ratha chakra these are all by author called srina pense again a very fantastic uh, author in marathi there is a author called uh, madhumangesh karnik which has who has written this book called mahim chi khadi another interesting book it's about one girl who comes it's it's in mahim so there is a t- kind of a slum there and then one girl's come girl who comes from outside bombay and kind of a very uh, muslim girl and a very shy and all and that girl eventually becomes a prostitute kind of a thing and that journey of her through a lot of other journeys very beautifully depicted so i have read these books i have read a book called swami i have book uh, which is by a very great author again ranjit desai there is book called shriman yogi by him there is book uh, called radheya so radheya is a book which is basically a point of view of karna so the mahabharat seen from karna's point of view that way it is there so all these books are so rich and so interesting and Uh, such a fantastic detailing on the kind of period that they are uh, set in the kind of uh, characters that they are set in these all things actually opened me to the skill of observation and skill of uh, kind of and and you when you observe when you see things and when you see you you see something different so when maybe somebody else is seeing looking at things in an x manner my my frame is very different my kind of the way i look at things is very different today also i i work very closely with certain workers in our factory and i i their their aspirations and their lives and their thought processes are so different i i come from bombay i, I have read now novels in english and good literature in english and and i'm i'm that's a different world and i can get, get to interact with the world there over there and we i i i really can connect with that world because i have come from this world and also i have read a lot Uh, which is basically so rich in observation so rich in detailing that i can identify with those lives very easily so i think it gives a lot of advantage in terms of because having read in marathi because today even today many of my lot of my thinking happens in marathi i may be i, I may express it in english but my thinking happens in marathi whenever i'm doing something my count happens in uh, marathi so i will still say ek do teen char paanch like that if there is a nice kind of this is monsoon time and then uh, what i will remember is the marathi poem not a english poem because i have never read english poem which poems. marathi poem do it for us uh, there is interesting marathi poem called श्रावणमासी हर्ष मानसी हिरवळ दाटे चोहीकडे क्षणात पसरे सरसर शिरवे क्षणात फिरून येऊन पडे दिस ऍक्च्युली अबाउट हाऊ दी मान्सून इज इन श्रावण श्रावण इज दिस पिरियड सो श्रावण इफ यू टिपिकली सी यू विल सी लॉट ऑफ सनलाईट अँड सडनली देर विल बी रेन अँड देन अगेन देर विल बी लाईट सो दिस इज काइंड ऑफ पिक्ट इट अप पिक्ट अप इन दिस पोएम so i i remember these i remember the my my mother would always listen to songs on radio vivid bharti used to be there and these were all marathi songs so i remember all these marathi songs still today means i don't have to really kind of take efforts those those come naturally to me and i i kind of enjoy them and uh, i that that world that kind of sensibilities are very different i think those are typical uh, marathi a uh, value based value oriented systems or uh, beliefs i think they are interesting and that keep me kind of 
I can I can identify with that world. I can when somebody says that a lot of time I was telling you something like uh, when when somebody is my sales executive and who is uh, sales uh, incentive is to be paid, he comes and tells me that ki sir I I have my my wife I promised my wife a new Mangal Sutra during this Diwali so mera wo incentive jara release karwa do na <laughs> and I can identify with that. I'm I will never get into that professionalism and say that ki how are you bringing this personal life about professional thing. I'll say okay no I understand people have these aspirations and people have these lives which are different and I can identify with them very easily. I can be comfortable with that and without being judgmental about them because I have kind of over a period of time changed or maybe escaped that velocity I I still can identify with that very easily. And I got a sense of this in this LinkedIn article you wrote, where you spoke about how you know uh, you, you're working at Anish, as you pointed out, and there you have a policy of declaring paid leave for any team member's birthday, their spouse's birthday, their marriage anniversary, the kid's birthday, up to three children. You specified because some have three children; it's common. And you speak about mothers' fiftieth, sixtieth, and seventy-fifth birthday paid leaves, fathers' fiftieth, sixtieth, and seventy-fifth, and ditto for mother-in-laws and father-in-laws because you realize that for your female employees. who are at home that also becomes an event that they have to put in a lot of work for and this is honestly not something that a westernized person and i mean westernized i think in a derogatory sense and i'm obviously also talking about myself would think about naturally but now that you say all this i can see where it comes from and i also want to ask a question about a sort of marathi arts and culture and literature in general because what i find happening to some of the vernacular languages is that you have different kinds of homogenizing pressures and also like when i was in college in pune verni was a pejorative term uh-huh. which you would use for someone yeah. who only spoke marathi english thi batata re he's a verni it was a pejorative mm-hmm. term True. you know i didn't use it but i think with the deep shame that i didn't object when other people around me used it and there is often this inferiority complex which these local languages carry on two accounts one is hindi itself which has become so, so mainstream and all of that and the other is english which has become an essential transactional language for everyone to know because you got to get by in the world and i'm wondering about how it's affected the arts because on the one hand you know globalization is beautiful both of us love it urbanization is great both of us love it but one of the results is that and it, it, being insular is bad both of us hate it but one of the good things before globalization is that cul- local cultures could have you know that sense that there was a local market which was always for them and they could always you know tap into the local and find joy in that but the danger of expanding too fast is that you that f- sense of insecurity and inferior r- inferiority comes in and for a new generation it might be tempting that if you are an artist and you are in mumbai you might say ki yaar marathi kyu karne ka you know bollywood is there otts are happening hindi is the language that's where you go or if you are uh, you know if you start getting a presence on instagram you see what's all around you you might even think you know kind of beyond that so how how is this changed or affected uh, you know uh, since since you know marathi i'll ask you about marathi but how has this affected marathi literature it, has it become more adventurous and vibrant because of its exposure to influences coming in from elsewhere or has it become you know more insipid because a lot of the better talents go on to do different things because for a creative person there are so many things to do so give me a sense of that because i know nothing about this area i think uh, marathi literature in those times were amazing i think the scene on the uh, the theater the scene on the movie side the scene on the scene on overall uh, uh, marathi was very good i think everybody is trying to now with the ott is coming in, in with the i, I see it's it's a my mistake also that i don't watch too much of marathi these days i i don't have a tv at home so i don't watch uh, tv much so i don't know what's happening really on to marathi as a scene but i definitely see that homogenization is basically kind of uh, killing the individual cultures and i think that's not uh, great for the kind of arts and culture of uh, marathi but i think certain places i'm seeing so there are some interesting uh, movies which are there so we must have seen we must have seen court is one good movie that is there harishchandra ji factory is another good movie that is there there is something that is happening i, I don't know whether you have watched there is a movie called dogi 
which is about two sisters one sister because of the poverty has to go and kind of become a prostitute and she doesn't become and once she starts sending money the family is happy with money that she is sending but they don't want her presence for the younger daughter's wedding so so interesting story so there were a lot of there's that's happening in marathi but it's i think uh, happening in very isolated manner but during 80s 70s and 80s and 90s i think 80s until then the scene was very good i have gone and watched a marathi drama what we call as natak every uh, 31st of uh, december uh, or other first morning early morning so it used to be at 12 o'clock in the night mohan wag used to come with a new uh, drama every year and i think all, almost 3 4 years i have done that year over year uh, going and watching a new drama uh, at uh, shivaji mandir in dadar 31st morning but there were uh, fantastic movies uh, which were there in marathi there is a movie called jaitre jait Uh, which is by jabbar patel jabbar patel was one of the great uh, directors uh, in marathi i think these uh, movies must be between 1978 and 1985 must be this 78 years period because i distinctly remember uh, watching them then uh, it's basically mohan agashe and smita patel in that there is a movie called umbarta which is amazing again uh, smita patel movie there is a movie called siyasan there is no other great political drama uh, like that that time i was there is one small insight or one small trivia about trivia about that movie is that that entire movie despite of the uh, the color television available then uh, this entire movie is uh, made in black and white and when jabbar patel was asked why he did uh, that movie in black and white he said that ki, this movie is about political uh, uh, basically politicians and the entire uh, corruption around politicians and that state and we see politicians only through newspapers because they get their names and their photos get printed in newspapers all newspapers are black and white wow. and if i have to connect the audience with the newspaper and the stories and the news there then i have to have movie in black and white so why he did movie in black and white that was the reason what a deep thought i had seen heard that it's time. an interesting and creative reason but i don't quite get it but it's an interesting <laughs> it's interesting reason. yeah I, i was at that point of time i was like wow what a thought and mm. i think he could connect that and it's a beautiful brilliant movie that is there so i think marathi literature during those period was i think was at peak today i i, I have not read so i i am i don't know whether i'm uh, kind of competent to uh, make a commentary on that but i see i see a nice movie called court which is done very well masterpiece i am masterpiece very nice movie these harish chandra ji factory again on dada saheb phalke very interesting movie these are nice movies that are they are coming uh, now coming back to your question about whether today this the the, the uh, globalization is it uh, killing i think every everything has become kind of fast paced everything has become kind of get it get stuff done so i would not see uh, the marathi uh, the, the vo- in volumes you would not see it in volumes but once in a while you will see some some quote from nice quote or some nice book there but i think it is more rare than more common which used to be very common then that's that's uh, that's i i'm and my marathi reading has gone down i once in a while i watch marathi i read marathi i read marathi which is all old yeah so uh, my my father passed away recently and my mom basically is alone and she kind of needs to fill time and she is a solid reader so i every a month and a half i pick up 10 marathi books and buy and give it to her and she reads them in her own leisure so i basically then pick up one of one or two books from that lot and kind of read so one of that book is in the bag i, I just skip one book and i maybe whenever i get time i read that i have intentionally started reading in marathi again a bit but that's not really i'm not happy about the quantum but i do it once in a while i do it it's a fantastic habit and i want to kind of uh, i keep talking about how i want to get back to my habit of hindi reading in the sense i never had a hardcore habit but i could read hindi mm-hmm. and uh, now i'm afraid i can't it would be too labored and i need to get that back my next question is about entrepreneurship uh, where you know you at first you're living that typical upwardly mobile moving into the middle class dream that you get an education and then you get a job and you're you're, you're an engineer in a big firm and everything's going great but then eventually you strike out alone and you continue down that path and you you have this great quote in one of your pieces by swami vivekananda 
where he says take risks in your life if you win you can lead if you lose you can guide you know and that's a typical entrepreneur's quote true, in true, a true, sense true. but uh, at the same time i can't imagine that that transition would have been easy because you would have to one you would have had to deal with uncertainty and risk and push aside that's you know craving for stability which is almost uh, sort of hardwired into all of us 70s 80s kids and two it would have brought a set of new challenges like man management managing people motivating them you know realizing that you uh, you have to be self directed that you no longer have a structure and a routine that is already there and but that you have to create one for yourself and live by that so tell me about that process of becoming an entrepreneur what did you find out about yourself while being an entrepreneur how did you have to change to manage that and what are sort of your some of your learnings about entrepreneurship so i think the entrepreneurship is uh, entrepreneurship is all about a uh, kind of uh, values that we so so all entrepreneurship start about uh, values that you kind of uh, believe into and you want to kind of taste them into real world risk taking is uh, becomes a kind of inherent part of that entire process now with your values as as maybe constraint or as basically Uh, look at the pillars of what you want to do you build some kind of a vision and with that vision you set out into the uh, market and build an uh, organization now you start small uh, and you kind of uh, face problems every now and then and you can't uh, you kind of creatively solve them and move forward one step and after at the same time if you have to grow one needs to be very clear that you need to kind of build a team and get that kind of a, a delegation uh, happening very clearly and how how does one do that is basically a kind of manage your day build kind of productivity around build network have get right people around leverage whatever resources that you have basically day to day task start moving it out to uh, people down the line and you focus more on strategy you focus more on uh, revenue you focus more on kind of growth uh, part of the business so i think one learns uh, quite a lot on, on the fly you you basically kind of first and foremost start trusting people so uh, hire people and start uh, trusting people and start giving them opportunities to kind of work and do what their bit uh, they may make mistakes and we are all uh, you should be fine let them make mistakes and you be there to kind of uh, take care of those things they would kind of give them more and more opportunities to kind of grow and uh, while they are growing the whole organization grows into the a, into bigger being at the same time don't compromise on basic stuff uh, you need to be very clear about value system because once you kind of start compromising on to that slowly slowly the entire organization decays and that is something that one needs to be very clear about also uh, when you are into entrepreneurship you are going to uh, make certain losses you are going to take certain bets and those bets are not going to come off the way you wanted them to be and that's okay i think that should not stop you from taking risk so we used to in our insurance broking firm we used to make mistakes on hiring people and uh, almost i think around crore crore half would go every year on unproductive hiring but then we while doing this we would get somebody good who would bring in 3 and 4 crore of revenue easily and that used to happen so you i think you should not stop experimenting when you are into an entrepreneurship you keep taking risk all the time at the same time you start building basically externally now you start building internally so you start building systems and processes because with with growth what comes is that you, your structure has to remain really really good and so investing into those systems and processes becomes very important over a period of time relationships uh, i think uh, business relationships is something that i always uh, invested in and i focused on them personally and uh, that is something that you need to kind of inculcate uh, down the line to the team that's that's a value system that i always have had otherwise i think uh, people strategy uh, your own uh, sense of uh, leadership your systems and processes your focus on finances uh, and your focus on the overall financial health of the organization never lose sight from the 
profit part of the business i think there are five six things that one needs to kind of uh, focus and take it forward from there i think that way entrepreneurship entrepreneurship is difficult in a way because of the risk taking aspect that people look at but it is also easy because these are five six things which i think if you really really focus on and be humble and uh, ready to learn from every uh, lesson that comes your way i think it is that way very easy also uh, i feel that it is not a big rocket science it's it's fairly intuitive uh it's it's fairly simple if you if you stick to basic principles of life and i, I think uh, people can become uh, yeah, entrepreneurship is i think it's a very made very glorious and glorified not glorious glorified but i think people if they are willing to take risk and if they are kind of live with these basic principles i think people can become entrepreneur and i think everybody should give it a shot at entrepreneurship i know that ki some people are not entrepreneur but i think there is a huge amount of uh, freedom there is a huge amount of kind of expression that one can have about one's uh, belief systems uh, we talk so much about our beliefs but then in the entrepreneurship is really a way by which you can uh, test those hypotheses and make them into reality and i think people should give it a shot entrepreneurship is the only way you can i think build uh, and create long term wealth uh, i feel that this taking can get you where you want to uh, build a, a salary would always grow at certain pace and uh, with uh, the, that pace your exp- your expenditure also goes what you can really genuinely create wealth is only through entrepreneurship where you can get those multiplier effects through risk taking that one can have means like risk to reward proportion can be really really big if you can leverage your resources well so i feel everybody should give it a shot and it's not something which is a big rocket science you need to be kind of always open to learning and you can do it well inspiring words and in a sense we are all the entrepreneurs of our own lives but we behave like we are salaried employees true, true, and true. <laughs> and one complaint i have for you is you are just saying that on the one hand you are saying it is easy on the other hand it is saying you have to have humility it is so difficult to have humility uh, <laughs> give me a break sudhir on that note let's actually take a quick break and need a cup of coffee and then we will come back and talk for eight more hours okay long before i was a podcaster i was a writer in fact chances are that many of you first heard of me because of my blog india uncut which was active between 2003 and 2009 and became somewhat popular at the time i love the freedom the form gave me and i feel i was shaped by it in many ways i exercise my writing muscle every day and was forced to think about many different things because i wrote about many different things well that phase in my life ended for various reasons and now it is time to revive it Only now I'm doing it through a newsletter. I have started the India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com where I will write regularly about whatever catches my fancy. I'll write about some of the themes I cover in this podcast and about much else. So please do head on over to indiauncut.substack.com and subscribe. It is free. Once you sign up, each new installment that I write will land up in your email inbox. You don't need to go anywhere. So subscribe now for free. The India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com. Thank you. Welcome back to the scene and the unseen. I'm chatting with Sudhir Sarnobar. Sudhir, let's let's talk on the subject which you've spent a lot of time thinking about, and I'm also deeply interested in frameworks. So. as i told you earlier this is all thanks to bagwe sir who basically is running this uh, teaching and learning community and he is a consultant to our company and whenever we used to go to him he used to kind of put our whatever pain or problem that we would share with him he would put it into a framework and then give us a solution uh, fundamentally and that solution is kind of uh, long lasting that solution is holistic in a manner so i have this uh, i read this uh, fantastic uh, quote from charlie munger well by way back in 1990s uh, he had said this in 1990s i i just uh, quote uh, well the first rule is that you can't really know anything if you just remember isolated facts and try and bang them back if the facts don't hang together on a lattice work of theory you don't have them in usable form you got to have models in your head and you got to array your experience both vicarious and direct on this lattice work of models you may not 
uh, you may have noticed students who just try to remember and pound back what is remembered well they fail in school and in life you have got to hang experience on lattice work of models in your head so i got to tell you i got to tell you sudhir that when i was in college i had models in my head all the time uh-huh. you know from cindy crawford <laughs> to meher jessia to yeah anyway like that i'm sorry continue you talk you about are... such a serious subject and i've you know spoiled it all you... no 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 oh, that's God, pj has so to bad. come yeah that pj had to come what is amit without that puneri jog or poor jog pj and in those days also pjs would come hmm. but yeah uh, uh, carry on so- so rightly said by charlie munger uh, is that if you have isolated facts those those really don't make sense and my learning over a period of time last 6 7 years about everything that is around us is always has been through different frameworks so i always thought about how world works and how the nations work and there is so much that you can actually identify a uh, kind of talk about in an uh, isolated manner the nation is like this the state is like this and all that but when i saw a framework of state society and markets and just saw the entire thing entire world in through this lens of a state society and market i think a lot of things fell in place there now how how does government operate and i saw that there is a legislative arm there is a executive arm and there is a judiciary and if you see the entire government functioning through this lens of this framework then suddenly everything makes sense so i have been kind of looking out for uh, these kind of frameworks for some time now and uh, then i thought that ki okay my understanding of the world uh, becomes a bit better uh, or rather a complicated subject uh, that is there or a complicated concept that is there i can understand it easily if it is kind of uh, bound with a framework as a reference and i thought that ki can we kind of build these kind of frameworks for entrepreneurs in india so as i told you earlier that india has a big challenge on uh, kind of increasing its gdp and i believe that ki this gdp growth can happen really can come from the middle uh, so smes the small and medium enterprises i remember uh, nitin pai's uh, uh, quote nitin of takshashila that uh, every 1% growth in the gdp can bring 2 to 3 million people out of poverty and uh, i think india has this challenge of getting people out of poverty uh, more and more people out of poverty uh, i have always seen uh, india struggling on uh, kind of revenues you want to talk about becoming a strong nation we talk about uh, the 56 inch uh, chest and all that but that chest cannot be really big if you do not have kind of enough money in your banks uh, in your kind of economy and that can happen only through growth of people the prosperity and prosperity can come if there are enough jobs and it's not government's job uh, to give jobs it is basically the industry government can only make certain policies which will make uh, businesses grow faster better but it is job it is basically businesses will create opportunities for employment and uh, i feel that ki that can be done well by small and medium enterprises i have been studying uh, about uh, small and medium enterprises uh, across world and uh, the striking example comes is basically the german mittelstand uh, german has germany has a, a definition of mittelstand companies which is basically a revenue of less than 50 million and less than 4 500 employees and uh, today if you see almost 99% of german firms are mittelstand firms and almost 70% of workforce is basically employed in middle strand and they 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 form almost around 50 to 53% of the gdp and there is very interesting uh, phenomena all these are uh, family owned uh, small uh, enterprises and they have over a period of time grown internationally uh, value system family ownership is there uh, they are basically there is a generational continuity so you, you will see them kind of uh, one uh, kind of uh, 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 family the one generation to next generation it is moving forward their entire focus is long term so they are not into short term uh, thinking they are looking at uh, next 30 years next 40 years next 50 years that kind of a uh, work they never go to stock market so they basically are uh, there there are uh, local banks which fund them and can kind of help them take the risk and leverages so those are called house banks in germany and uh, they so with that through house bank invest Uh, they kind of get huge kind of independence with the smaller size uh, they have fantastic uh, control and nimbleness so they can take quick decisions and kind of move uh, pretty fast 
because they are family firms they have uh, that relationship as i i i keep talking about relationship is very important uh, they they basically build relationship with their employees they build relationship with their key suppliers uh, they built a long term relationship with their customers also and there because they are looking at building a kind of a right good products and quality products they have a lot of investment in their workforce so basically a uh, training of the employees and kind of getting them up to the mark and keeping them at cutting edge technology understanding that's there also because these uh, middle stand companies are family owned companies they have kept clean hierarchy so once you become big uh, what happens is that your bureaucracy in the organization increases your decision making gets slowed down that all is not there and then owner entrepreneur who is basically heading the company kind actually take decisions faster with uh, they focus so all these uh, middle stand companies are uh, huge on innovativeness uh, they will basically invest uh, a lot uh, on r&d uh, which is if you see generally world over the average of r&d investment is around 3 3.5% these middle stand companies spend around 7 7.5% on r&d their focus is completely on uh, customer uh, b2b uh, focus there most of them are b2b they are not b2c they are not b2c companies most of them are b2b companies and these companies they are spread across uh, germany so you know, small small uh, places in germany you would see a small town and a company with around 400 500 employees and turnover of around 50 40 50 million euros and because these companies are locally rooted there is basically a social responsibility so they would kind of look at building a library look at building a road look at building kind of infrastructure so they are looking at developing that particular area because they believe into that local infrastructure and those regional ties uh, basically kind of help them uh, participate into local governance and sometime they will basically uh, receive aid because of government and sometime they will also do certain stuff into infrastructure development so this is a interesting model to look at for india and i feel that ki that's something that one should india should look into and the one of the biggest advantage that i have seen with middle stand uh, companies is that their investment into workforce and that workforce investment came from uh, the apprenticeship program of germany so in germany if you have to really uh, become uh, employable there are a lot of courses where there is a kind of a hybrid uh, education where you spend let's say one week in company one week in college or school wherever you go or one month in company one month in college or three months or six months so there different different methods they used but equal time spent in company doing practical work at the same time learning theory about it and this is all done through the association trade associations the unions and the government working together and kind of building now today if you see in india we have a challenge we do not have challenge of manpower we have challenge of employability so what manpower we have that is not good enough for the industry and that's the challenge so i feel that ki there is to be a government needs to be investing into employability of the uh, manpower or employability of the kind of workforce and not basically uh, look at kind of generating some they they kind of trying to say that ki we will create so many jobs and all i think they cannot create jobs what they should do is enable the workforce to learn better maybe invest into that learning infrastructure uh, and they have to do it in a kind of working with uh, companies so instead of uh, telling companies randomly uh, give 5% csr uh, beyond certain profit here and there if they can kind of work with industry and make them invest into employability of the workforce i think that is something great so so this middle stand model at one place and that's how the focus on sme and then sme today in india thinking uh, from the jugad perspective which i some, somehow don't like uh, i have been seeing that uh, years over years i have seen that ki we do not have that understanding of a good design a good product a quality product if you see i, I remember while going in the school i used to see this uh, bst buses they have uh, these windows where you raise the window and in the monsoon you would bring the window down and there is to be a clip and that clip you put it and you hang that window in the clip now many a times that clip would be broken and they would tie it with some kind of a wire steel wire and all that and i used to feel that ki why if this clip which is a simple press metal part if they can make thousands of it and just replace it then it would be so nice but then no that's not there you look at 
footpaths our footpaths are not basically friendly for pedestrians or maybe somebody wants to on a wheelchair they cannot go the footpath is always cut to for a car to go into a building technically the footpath should be at the same level and the car should go up and down over the footpath that's what i have seen ag- across everywhere in the world but here in india what we see is that ki every now there is a building you, the footpath is cut and the footpath will go up and down and up and down and the car will go straight so these are basically there nobody gives a thought into building a product and that's something ki- kind of gives me uh, discomfort or i have always seen that ki this is basically a challenge what we have in india is that we look at everything from a jugadu sense and we trying to make do some things if we can actually invest into thinking if we can actually invest into kind of looking at what is the right quality what is the right uh, thought process to build quality then there can we can really make good products i'm i'm not general i, I know i'm generalizing this there are a lot of uh, world class products that come out of india but most of the time we believe into this uh, jugadu thought process and that's something which i feel needs to change and that can really really make uh, india go well and what we are trying to uh, do me and mr bagwe it's a basically mr bagwe's learning over last uh, 15 20 years he started this uh, working for uh, since 2005 uh, he has worked with almost more than 1000 companies uh, small and medium enterprises and he has kind of built these uh, uh, frameworks uh, for business we are converting those into a uh, videos uh, basically animation video and a uh, commentary along with that and trying to we are building a library of these videos and on the front end there will be a questionnaire where will you get problem uh, solution to your problems so that's what we are bringing and we feel that key people will have some the entrepreneurs will have some kind of a thought process or towards their problem solving some kind of thought process towards how do you build a structure of long lasting company a company which will continue for generational company which will build good quality products company that can scale in a better manner that's basically what i am doing currently with howframeworks.com yeah and you know that's a that's such a beautiful anecdote about that's such a beautiful observation rather about how a road goes into a building and there is this beautiful thing which i will buy for you if you haven't already read it it's a masterpiece called the design of everyday things by don norman i have that book you have that book no it's, it's such a beautiful beautiful book yeah such such basic fundamental things before we come back to uh, frameworks and uh, precisely what you're doing and i want to dig into it in much more depth a quick sort of dilemma almost or a paradox almost about what you said about the about the indian economy and you alluded to a part of it which i can't wrap my head around that on the one hand it is true that we have a jobs crisis there aren't enough jobs on the other hand it is equally true that most of the young people who come out of the education system are unemployable they have no skills which are useful so on the one hand there aren't enough jobs and on the other hand you have unemployable people and what explains this paradox i mean besides the obvious thing it points to that there is a deep mismatch between the education system and industry true that the education you like typically i would imagine there is a certain amount of supply and demand happening there true. obviously all education doesn't have to be coldly instrumental and there is a space for the liberal arts and etc etc but by and large you know people want to be educated in a way that makes them useful to the world and useful to society at large and that is simply not happening so you know what are your sort of thoughts on this kind of bizarre paradox where on both sides of this puzzle we are uh, sort of suffering deeply so i think uh, industry needs certain kind of workforce and that's not happening at the education level and uh, how how does one break that uh, people uh, when they leave uh, the uh, education institute they are expecting for a job a lot of people are it is it has become kind of a important and fashionable um fashionable i am i'm generalizing it but uh, it's fashionable that you do an uh, engineering you do an mba and then you want to be a manager and uh, i'm think that ki if everybody is a manager who would do the work there has to be somebody who is is doing the stuff that needs to be done and i'm i'm more so talking about the manufacturing industry per se because i think you cannot ignore manufacturing industry yes services are there but services always will be one layer above manufacturing and manufacturing industry cannot be ignored and for manufacturing industry to grow 
or manufacturing industry to survive you need to have those skill sets in place and those are the skill sets which cannot be taught in college alone means yes you will teach something in the workshop that is there in the in the college but there has to be a more interface a much more kind of integrated uh, work that happens between the industry and the colleges the industry and the government today Uh, that's what i said government uh, is trying to tell that ki so much of csr should be done i think government should not get involved into telling csr but government should definitely get involved into how do we make our workforce employable and that is possible only when the expert people in the industry the people who are doing work with hand is uh, they are they are actually imparting that knowledge and teaching the young and teaching the intermediate people to do better now in germany what i have seen is that the government the trade unions the chamber of commerce all of them they work together and they have built programs where the person will spend time in industry in within the industry and person will spend time in the college and there are certain people so unless so you get a journeyman license there are exams of journeyman and a journeyman is taught only by a master that means a journeyman's entire kind of growth happens through learning 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 and becoming a master and only when that person becomes master that person can kind of train people down the line now this is absolutely important if you need to kind of build products that are quality uh, really great quality in nature and i think that cannot happen within a college campus there has to be a much more stronger interface between industry and educational institute and government needs to set in policy for that i know i i don't like government to get involved into everything but then once government is there government should not get involved into doing stuff but government should in get involved into putting a policy in place which can enable the stuff to be done so i think that policy because otherwise industry has uh, yes industry has inherent incentive to get employed employable people but industry will try and solve it in some way or other but if government can actually kind of involve itself into it and look at kind of building that infrastructure or building those policies to make people employable than focusing on how can i create industry and how can i be involved into making things i think government should get out of doing stuff the government should only get involved into policy that will make stuff better or easier or like that so i feel there has to be a much more better interface i feel industry can tech students like this basically spend the way for me if you see really i learned my entire engineering during my 6 months or 6 months of that that two stints in blue star and that's where i learned project management that's where i learned how the entire uh, air conditioning installation and commissioning happens and i think that's not happening much today and i think that we need to kind of uh, go back to that kind of uh, structure of education in india if we want our people to be employable i think that that's the way but yeah, i think there are a lot of experts and i must people must have read their brains for this but this is what i see as a simple kind of a solution it's a yeah, no. solution no you've nailed it i completely agree with you and also there are you know i mean india is messed up in so many ways like ideally your manufacturing labor should be coming from agriculture we have 60% of the country involved in agriculture where in other country, western countries it's like 4% or 5% True. or single True. figures and the typical way this moves is that people gradually agriculture gets more productive productivity goes up people move to manufacturing a country like india should have been a manufacturing superpower in the 70s and blah 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 we can uh, you know go on forever and possibly we'll have to order a few drinks which you will have to have all of them because i don't drink anymore so give me a sense of the landscape of indian industry like you're talking about a particular size of for maybe the indian version of the middleton companies mm -hmm. which are sort of medium sized and mm -hmm. etc cetera, etc cetera. give me a sense of what is that landscape like how have they evolved over time what are the typical problems that you see in such companies you know so on and so forth so give me a sense of what that looks like so almost uh, there are around 60 634 lakh small uh, the micro enterprises in india that's the msme statistics uh, recent uh, number uh, where the annual turnover is less than 5 crores 
Now these are basically I had read these are small small uh, uh, right from Kirana shop to Chai Tapri is called as a micro enterprise in India, and I feel that ki as uh, I, I had read a book called Digital Nation by N Chandrasekhar of Tata, and he had written that uh, these all micro enterprises are really survival ventures. They are basically there just to survive because you have to do something to do it, and we call them businesses, but they are really not businesses. If somebody gives them a job in the bank and say that ki you will get twenty five thirty thousand rupees a month as a salary, a lot of people will. jump drop their businesses and get into that so these are all survival ventures so i'm really kind of those are 99% in the uh, india in india uh, around 5000 companies which are medium enterprises that is we call and there the turnover is between around 50 crores to around 200, 250 crores but a big chunk a fairly big chunk is between the 5 crores or 10 crores to 50 crores and these are almost around 3 lakh 30000 companies wow. and these are interesting companies because if you see the uh, there was a study done in us uh, warner nish book scaling up has uh, this study which talks that there was a study of 28 million firms in usa and they found that ki only 4% businesses grew beyond 1 million that is 8, 8 crore in india now once you grow that number then you are, you really can grow because you have kind of got certain kind of a maturity your maturity in people maturity in strategy maturity in resources and then you can actually grow really really well so we basically i think we should focus more on these uh, small enterprises which are more than 5 to 7 crores in revenue but not gone beyond 50 60 crores and those are the kind of companies which can invest into a better strategy a better kind of structure on resources a better structure on utilization of resources and grow to become say a medium entrepreneur enterprises where they can go up to 200 250 crore turnover middle stand medium is basically uh, 50 million is roughly around 500 crore what we are talking about but 200 250 300 crore is the right member and these companies are where the uh, it is they are owner driven so value system is uh, much better in place uh, if the owners really uh, kind of invest their time and their thought processes well then they can create good enough jobs uh, they are not focused on kind of only money 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 they basically want to do growth of uh, pe- people around there the areas around there and local development also happens with this small and medium small enterprises are generally uh, they come from tier 2 tier b b and c class cities it's not kind of focused on to cities like uh, bombay or bangalore delhi like that so the regional development is something which is kind of interest uh, important for growth of any country uh, if you look at germany the the in germany is not concentrated growth at one place you go to small small villages and you will find one company which must be doing around 50 60 million but then it takes care of that village which is around town which is around 1000 1500 people town and maybe uh, 100 of them are working in this one particular factory so i think that is the kind of model that we are looking at but in india the share of uh, total msme uh, in the overall gdp is around 30% the uh, manufacturing gdp is around 37% so msme that way is a kind of fairly big share and they can grow that share and i think for india to solve its employment problem the growth of msme is uh, important because only msme can solve the employment problem in india because they have that kind of a patience to train people kind of absorb people train people get them make them employable in our company also we get freshers and we basically push them through a training programs make them work with somebody who is senior for 3 to 6 months time and then they start doing independent work now this entire model is being done because we want good manpower and we are doing it at our own level but if there can be a infrastructure where these employability challenges are solved Uh, in in uh, kind of collaboration with industry you would get ready workforce available and that that is very important for growth of medium enterprises i i believe into that and given that you're targeting uh, these firms essentially mm-hmm. with your venture and given that your venture is uh, uh, again focused around frameworks and and their utility the the, the implicit assumption there is that a significant lack a significant gap 
in uh, what the uh, within these firms and in what these firms can do is exactly in this area in frameworks and the way they think about business and that kind of expertise and understanding and so on and so forth so can you elaborate a bit on that like what are the typical kinds of mistakes that these firms make that you know using better frameworks would help them avoid like what are the challenges they face what are the kind of mistakes they may give me a sense of that that landscape so uh if you look at uh, business you you need to think the way one needs to think in framework what is, there is one framework that we have so we have put up around 10 frameworks right now onto our website and there is going to be a subscription model over a period of time one framework is basically the basic basic framework is how do you look at your business and then we say that key there is one leadership which is basically uh, how the entrepreneur kind of leads the company uh, what kind of values what kind of vision that he puts forth uh, he or she put forth and takes the company forward second is what kind of people you attract what kind of people you get into your company and how do you kind of grow them how do you kind of uh, delegate uh, authorities uh delegate uh, work to them and make them empower them to do better so that the uh, leadership gets freed to do a larger uh, growth related strategy related work third is uh, important is strategy we basically what we see with sme is that uh, they basically move from one thing to other they don't have the overall plan in place okay fine uh, this is a particular industry that i am in what is the kind of market share that i want to earn what is the kind of uh, growth that i want to plan how will i have my growth how will i expand my product how will i expand my geography those kind of thought process those kind of strategy is not in place uh, sales and marketing again very important part but this this sales and marketing at what stage one should invest into uh, uh, sales at what stage one should invest into marketing and kind of grow your business and uh, there there are always this method where you do an internal integration and external integration so you will never see a constant growth uh, of any industry you will always see a growth then some taper and then some growth and then some taper and what is exactly happening is that you are basically doing an internal consolidation so you are actually working on your internal products or internal processes and improving them and at that point of time uh, you your external focus may be diluted and that's why you don't grow uh, the way you are growing but once you do that internal consolidation you again have gain momentum and then you grow again so you don't see a straight line growth you always see a taper straight taper straight taper straight and that's the way you need to kind of look at uh, you can't you can't do everything at all times so if you are focusing on sales and marketing and you are focusing on internal processes the owner is only one there is a empowered team that is there but focus you cannot do all things at a time so you need to kind of focus some time on internal processes focus some time on external integration and then uh, ultimately finance that's the most important part and that's uh, that's why you started a business because you wanted to earn returns but at the same time that's a major and that's a means of the business and that's a major of the business also so you see your business from the financial lens and see whether you are really doing well or not uh, how how are you kind of what are the, what is the metric that one is looking at so this six levers of business is one framework that we have a uh, given we have given another framework where how do you grow rapidly so how do you select 10 so you look at problem now you cannot solve all the problems so you do a simple pareto and look at what is most severe pain that you have so you use a 80 20 principle that key which pain is giving you a 80% issue and maybe one of the pain one one of the 10 or one of the five pains and you take that so if you have five pains one you pick up one which is most severe tackle that solve that and then move to other don't try and chew too much beyond your capacity or maybe how do you manage risk so basically uh, become risk literate understand what is risk understand what are your fears there typically uh, there is nothing called risk it is actually a fear that is underlying behind risk and one needs to understand what what you fear and uh, that fear is what we need to kind of address and figure figure out solution to address that fear uh, mitigate that fear and evaluate kind of strategies a uh, build financial muscle over a period of time ultimately uh, if you if you look at really all the risk they will they will the biggest risk that you would ha- have is the financial failure risk in the business and the moment you start building resources the moment you start building financial capital and financial strength your risk taking abilities 
improve. Uh, there are a lot of uh, contingency plans through insurance, through other mitigation techniques. Uh, one can basically keep the risk at bay. So, so we have one framework on how do you manage risk. We have another framework on how do you build your team. So. How do you optimize resources? How do you do employer branding? So as a small entrepreneur, I have always seen that I will always be fighting with the big uh, guys. So in my insurance broking firm, the people, the big brokers, the international brokers could. So we, we used to train people and kind of make them competent and great. And then they would be hired at 40% more salary by the biggies. Now, how do you still retain such people? So what big companies cannot do is basically uh, cannot create personalized benefits, small benefits. So we would work a lot more. Before the COVID, we used to do a lot on work from home, uh, flexible working hours, and give those kind of leverages to people. And the, create those uh, kind of, by, by these leverages, we could actually attract talent because there was a lot of flexibility that was given. Paid leave for mother-in-law, 75th yes, birthday. Yes, yes, yes. So those are the, those are, so these are the things. So we understand that uh, now a lot of our employees is, uh, they go on site and they are on site for months together and they don't get to kind of enjoy with their family and ultimately if uh, if you look at see we, we all can talk about higher principles and higher objectives of life but at at that level they are all working for their family and if they can't enjoy their uh, somebody's daughter's birthday fifth birthday or six, tenth birthday or 18th birthday i think that's something that they miss and we say that you know problem you don't have to you just have to you know this birthday is going to be there at certain point of time you just have to take a flight or take a train and come back you don't have to inform anybody and just spend time with your family and go back and manage a day's work or two days work and that's okay and companies paying for the flight so and companies paying for the flight and everything so those are the small small things that flexible things that you can do which large companies can ask a do. question yeah supposing i'm working in your company uh -huh. okay my colleague on the next desk who gets paid the same as me hmm. has three children. Hmm. Okay, one mother-in-law, one father-in-law, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So he's getting like a huge number of paid leaves mm -hmm. because of family. Mm -hmm. I have nobody. I'm all alone in this world. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this guy and thinking, this bugger gets 17 paid leaves mm -hmm. and I get none. It's not fair. Mm -hmm. that Will you also give me 17 paid leaves? No. The point is that he, the point is that he is going through living with all those relationships. You are not. You are enjoying. If you are not wanting to go go through those 16, 17 relationships or whatever that we are talking about. But Good answer. I, Good answer. Yeah, that's, that's, I think, we, we are basically... No, no, no. What we I'm said is that... No, I know. Life. I understand that. But... Uh, why third child is because I think if you go to rural India, the semi-urban India, there are three kids. Yeah, there are, there yeah. are, and I think that's a reality of life. And we cannot build systems or build benefits without keeping the reality in mind. So we, we built all that with that. So yeah, so these are the interesting kind of benefits that we build around so that we beat the uh, larger organizations on this because larger organizations will not they have to get approval from their US headquarter or maybe a German headquarter. We we don't uh, we, we can do it at our own stage. So these are different different kind of frameworks that we have built. Uh, we don't uh, say so now uh, okay I'll, I'll give you another example very concrete example. Now you want to kind of assign a task and most of the times because of the communication or the clarity of instruction is not there, you cannot really, a lot of things slip between the kind of instructions and things don't happen. Now, if you apply a simple framework like RASI, which is basically any task that is there, you put a, a kind of an Excel sheet and put who is responsible for that task. So the responsible is the person who will do the task. Now, accountability is the person who, that the manager of that person. So, he is accountable. That means, whatever may happen, if that person basically does not deliver, this person is accountable. He has to figure out results. So, he is, one is uh, responsible for action, while the other is responsible for result. So, there is a separation of power there. Then, we are talking about who should be consulted for doing this. So, while this work is being done, somebody should be asked uh, advice and all. So, that is done through consulting. And while these things are happening, somebody needs to be informed. Now, this might look very simple. But when you go to organizations and you see so many communication issues that are there because of this simple rule not being followed. Now, you use this RASI structure for so you take any action in the organization or any task in the organization and put a RASI. 
your success rate for task getting completed goes much 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 higher just apply this simple framework i'm going to apply it now like food lovers of bombay is you mean narain and subrat mm-hmm. now subrat is not in town right. but uh, we have to meet narain for dinner after this recording True. so it is therefore going to be my responsibility to choose where to go right it is your uh, but you are accountable no, you on are... making sure that uh, we get there True. and narain is a person who has to be consulted that can he make it in time True. and subrat has to be informed okay with the selfies yes we can do that so, okay, so we yeah, applied this i sorted framework. this out <laughs> but but tell me more so uh, so there is something called another uh, framework that is called rapid uh, framework that is basically a decision making uh, role clarity so what happens is that in organization everybody looks up to the top and says that ki that is the person who is going to do everything and then things don't happen so you can actually give roles to different different people so somebody can get a role to recommend somebody can uh, get a role to agree somebody can get a role to perform somebody can get a role to give input and somebody can re- get a role to decide now if we basically based on everybody's competencies if we can basically recommend is somebody who has a 360 degree of world who basically is into kind of research and all that person will kind of take a view of multiple things and recommend that okay, okay this is the right thing to do now somebody who is a good evaluator would say okay fine this is a person i have i have checked whatever he has done is right he has done his homework and he or she has done his homework and i can say okay i agree with what is being proposed so that is agree now somebody has to make that happen so that role is going to be performed so who is going to perform that thing and then there are inputs that are needed at various stages for that so there is somebody who will keep giving inputs for that and there is somebody who will decide on this so basically that decide person is the person who is the final authority on what should be happening now if you apply if you want kind of decision making for anything you apply this simple rapid framework and you can actually get decisions happening in the organization much faster so these are very small small interesting frameworks for business and i think we all are exposed to a lot of management books and lot of stuff available and we are evolved but if you really go to uh, an entrepreneur who is uh, just doing a business of 20 30 40 crore who is actually lost in today to day work and solving every day solving some problem or other if you give him small small frameworks like this and if they can establish his time gets free a lot and that person can then think about growth that can think about how can expand business and stuff like that so these are operational frameworks these are frameworks that you solve your day to day problems that you solve uh, structure problems in the organization and these are things that we are trying to build um, so bagway uh, is basically uh, through his learning over a period of time he has this uh, repository of frameworks many of them he has developed on his own and those are the things that we are trying to kind of structure into how frameworks Looking back at your own uh, sort of career and entrepreneurial journey in hindsight do you remember making mistakes or not doing things you should have done that could have been different had you had one of these frameworks available to you then Absolutely so there is a framework which talks about uh, how do you kind of grow within grow you, your company now there is something called the existing products and uh, new products and there is something called as existing market and new markets and you cannot go into new market with a new product ever because everything is unknown unknown now what you do ideally you should do is basically you have uh, existing customer that existing customer you have built a trust and you can basically introduce a new product to that so new product will go to existing customer first and then will go to a new customer or basically building new territory so in new territory you will always sell a existing product and a not a not a new product now this is such a simple framework but uh, when you at that point of time i never could see things in this manner now today when i am kind of looking at growth i always ask this question ki what whom i whom am i selling it to is it my existing customer or is the customer new is my product existing product which kind of is built and a very kind of a developed or very i would say established product or is it something new so it's a very simple small framework that that helps me a lot now something like rasi i i think i i if i would have built all the task in my organization and had applied to rasi that for or everything the life would have been much 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 simpler i think yes definitely i i i feel that ki 10 years back had i had access to these frameworks my life would have been much better maybe i would have created a much bigger company then or exited earlier and uh, i don't know 
yeah <laughs> So tell me what is a model? So one goes to your. Uh, so, so let's say I run a business which is thirty, forty, fifty crores, maybe started by my father or my uncle or whatever. It's kind of a family business. Has got into a certain size, but is plateaued. Right. Every day I'm spending time basically firefighting. Uh, the world okay. is changing really fast around me, and so what happens? I, I, how do I benefit from your services? So what we basically are looking at building so right now it's a mvp a minimal viable product just 10, 10 videos we have put in we plan to build at least 100 videos in next 3 to 6 months time and what we are going to do is that keep put a algorithm in the front and typically so over the last 20 years of experience of bagwe sir working with a teaching and learning community in with multiple uh, more than 1000 uh, such companies he has a structure in place in terms of uh, what could be your pain Uh, in the business, be it basically people management, be it basically growth, be it profitability, be it cash flow. This could be there. There are uh, a few more uh, typical problems that mid-size un- company would have. So we would ask you few questions, and we kind of zero down to. you are a problem and with that problem then we will say okay fine this problem if you need to solve you need to kind of think in this framework so we will give you a basic framework or maybe a set of frameworks let's say five or six frameworks in this sequence if you watch you will get some kind of a understanding now we are also uh, working towards so we are seeing that ki just giving frameworks is not going to work we need to give some kind of dashboards to people so that how can they track the progress we kind of give them a detailed instruction sheet which will basically give them a step by step execution we feel today we are all experimenting so we don't know what is uh, going to be the response we are basically giving our putting our best foot forward but we feel that ki somewhere we need to give them some kind of a remote consultancy or remote support in terms of email or in terms of whatsapp or something like that needs to be there so we, we are looking at keeping it uh, very uh, kind of not so expensive uh, maybe around 12 to 15000 rupees per year as a subscription and access to full ea and basically we are wanting them to uh, discuss uh, their challenges on a forum within uh, within the uh, portal and kind of share with each other their top challenges and learn from each other also so that's the kind of model that we have thought of but i think we will evolve the model going forward but the fundamental thing is basically give them kind of a thinking helping them think better i think that's the way we would like to put this venture to be uh, let them think better let them kind of be aware about uh, their problem and see the structure how do you fit that into a structure and get a kind of a holistic long term solution instead of just uh, solving the pain if they can solve the underlying problem the real uh, uh, kind of cause that would be better so the idea being that unlike what say a consultant would do or a mckinsey would do you're not going in there and saying this is your problem implement this a b c and things will get better instead you're just going there with frameworks and thinking tools and saying that okay think for yourself so they they can solve you know and therefore they are not just solving a problem by figuring it out but because they have that larger framework they can prevent future problems of the same kind and function better in every way true and then we will be so he, so they will solve one problem but that's not going to solve all the problems for them so they will have some other problem coming up there will have some other problem coming up also as a business we will also learn from people's problems so we will also evolve our model our service offering over a period of time see the whole point is we want them to have their growth much easier Uh, there is a lot of struggle that happens for growth i i think uh, with these thinking tools uh, their uh, struggle would be much lesser we are not saying there will not be struggles i think if there is no no struggles uh, everybody will become entrepreneur but that's not the case i think struggles will be there but we are trying to kind of elevate the pain we are trying to kind of give them a direction we are not uh, going to claim that we will solve their problems because again how does one in every individual learn and their pace of learning their pace of implementation all that matters but we are definitely giving them kind of nudge to think better and move forward so you know speaking of learning i want to kind of now shift the focus back to your personal learning mm-hmm. you know in the sense you've already spoken about your intellectual curiosity your iip mm-hmm. uh, intellectual investment plan and all of that how you subscribe to different podcasts and all of that and and what i'm also curious about is the different aspects of learning like 
what role does writing play and also i've been fascinated where i learned that uh, last year i think you also taught crypto and the reason that you taught crypto to a group of people i think it was the ascent finance special interest group <laughs> so the reason you taught crypto to this group of people is because you wanted to learn crypto yeah. and the moment i heard that mentally i started clapping because i just think that that's beautiful in fact these days when i try to learn something i try to tell myself ki mujhe aise seekhna hai ki main padha saku True. because you know as krishna shok said in his episode with me that there's a pyramid of learning True. and the shallowest form of learning is maybe just reading something casually True. and you're skimming over it but the deepest form of learning is to teach it right. and you decided because you really want to learn crypto you will offer to teach it make that commitment so you will be forced to learn it well yourself True. tell me about this philosophy and and uh, how this process was so Uh, there was a group of uh, people we were uh, discussing i i so there are multiple uh, uh, whatsapp groups that ascent has almost around 800 entrepreneurs uh, uh, with ascent now and there is a group called business and finance and i curated that group and uh, we wanted to engage uh, people uh, there in that group and we want to wanted to keep people together and keep coming back to that group again and again and so i just uh, had a poll i think whatsapp had just had poll that time uh, that that new feature had been like in, introduced and i asked people that what you would like to kind of learn and people said there are a lot of uh, noise around uh, crypto and people wanted to learn crypto and there was a lot of speculation around crypto and prices going up and all and as an entrepreneur everybody was like uh, can i risk and can i get into it but i want to know so i said fine no problem uh, we can do this and uh, then what i said that okay, okay fine if i have to teach uh, so make everybody teach i need to learn something first and i don't know anything about it and then i said okay fine i can do one thing is that ki i can teach while i am learning and maybe i have to be a, a week ahead or 10 days ahead of everybody else and that's how then and i think uh, everything is possible uh, with video, youtube youtube has such a reach uh, information and knowledge available that you kind of so i went on to uh, search i basically created so uh, city q compound ramanan uh, and harish that model was there so i said okay i'll use the same model uh, so we moved everything to telegram i said i don't want everybody to be there on linkedin uh, on uh, whatsapp so we moved to telegram made people so out of this 800 we had almost around 60 odd people subscribing to this and some people even asked that keep my friend interested who is not from ascent would you be okay having them and i said fine no problem and we had around 60 people there and what i did was that i went from so i created a structure in mind that ki what I, i look at like look at it like i don't know anything about crypto so then you need to basically go to the basics of what is currency what is money so so i started with that basic as a yeah, see what is money what is currency how did currency come into a play how did transaction happen what is the store of value what is speculation so all those things i get got into that i built create got so there is a lot of material available on to internet uh, so basically uh, i use the simple model of why and how and what so i said that ki why crypto is the first thing so what is happening currently in the market what is the currency that is there in the market and so picked up videos on that there are beautiful videos on money there are beautiful videos on currency so what i created is that ki i i i will i would take uh, one video and every alternate day i would post that so i created something like i think uh, around 50 videos i found out which are step by step so around 15 videos were on uh, why another 15 videos on uh, how and another 15 videos on what so we covered why and what is the need of crypto then we said that ki how so basically how the entire ecosystem of crypto has evolved what are the different different kinds so of what is platform uh, what are the different different currencies which are available and why wh- what do they do then speculation and then there are uh, basically people who are trying to dupe others and so so all those things were covered into the second why how and then we moved to what so now people wanted actual advice in terms of ki which cryptocurrencies they can buy uh, what they can buy for what other options are there so that entire structure was done and i just said that ki okay fine the way i would like to learn is the way i will teach so i i went like and i don't know anything about crypto i don't know anything about money and how would i kind of structure my learning same principles i applied there 
picked up videos from YouTube, uh, created links and delivered that in, delivered that entire course. And it was a very interesting course. Uh, I, I learned, uh, I, I understood that the way people were trying to kind of invest in crypto, there's a lot of speculation around it. I didn't invest into that. But I got a fairly good understanding of it. I can't uh, claim to be a crypto expert per se. But I think I had enough knowledge to understand what is kind of a lot of uh, hawa about it and what is really the stuff that can work. So today, I know what I can go after or where I can, uh, I, if I want to invest, where I can invest and where I can, I should not. I know that much, at least for sure. We should form a shadowy group called KKK. Uh-huh. Right, and I'll take the liberty of spelling crypto with a K. Uh-huh. And uh, what wh- what does it stand for? KKK. KKK. K, K. Oh, okay, tell me. Crypto ke kutte kamine. <laughs> I think it's yeah. No, I'm really pissed off because you didn't call me for this course, man. What the fuck? I think you better send me. Uh, apne playlist bana hai kya YouTube videos ka? Ha, pura playlist hai. I can send it to you now also. It is there. Uh, 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 can we show give, uh, offer it to our listeners? Yeah, yeah. Why not? I, I think I I have it on Notion. I can give a public creator public link and send it to them. Please do. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll uh, I'll link it from the show notes. Sure. So already there is deep excitement, but only someone who's already gotten five hours into the podcast will benefit from it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, remaining people don't deserve it. Uh, yeah. So no, it's fascinating. And and uh, so g- give me your top level. You know, after all the, the stuff that you've done on crypto, and I wish before I recorded my episode with Vitalik Buterin, I wish I had spoken to you because when that episode was scheduled, I was thinking, "Ki yeah, shit, I need a primer badly because I I know nothing about crypto." Luckily, Ajisha was with me. He gave me a bit of a primer, and he was my co-host. But what is your top level view of crypto as a whole? I. Don't see, uh, so so I think crypto as a currency, I see challenges because I think governments will always uh, keep their monopoly on the currency and they would not allow uh, their uh, control over currency to go. So crypto as a currency, I am not really sure how it will fly and that's why it will always remain as a speculative kind of instrument, people, whatever people may say. But the decentralization around crypto and the kind of contracts that one can build, uh, automatic serving contracts uh, where the once your conditions are fulfilled, uh, you kind of deliver the contracts the way it is there. I think those are the interesting applications. So as a platform, uh, the way decentralization operates is something which is very interesting for me. But as a currency, I think I'm not, I would not be bullish. I, I have not, not invested uh, in crypto per se, uh, my own money. Uh, I, I never could because I, I do not invest into something that I don't understand. So I have not, I, I cannot, though I did that primer and I learned about it. I learned enough to not invest into it is what I would say. But as a platform, I think uh, as a decentralization platform, as a cop platform where smart contracts can be built, it's a very wonderful application. I, I think it can work very well. Yeah, and in my limited learning, I kind of agree with that in the sense that I don't feel I really, uh, I don't see how it's a store of value. I don't grok its utility as a currency well enough to, I mean, I just don't understand enough to ever invest True. myself. Same. But the philosophy and the mechanics of decentralization are fascinating to me. And, you know, more than Ethereum, more than Ether as a currency, it's Ethereum as a platform on which you build things True. is something that's... Uh, deeply fascinating to me so we are on the same page and the same page is basically we're not gonna do it but <laughs> it's interesting but we're not gonna do it so I mean, that's the easiest page to actually come on to so shame on us and my penultimate question is really going to be a two-part one which is into penultimate two-part but anyway my penultimate question is going to be a two-part question and it's going to be about a the structure of your days and b the structure of broken down the structure of your learning within that time or your productive time like uh, a quote that i think is really beautiful and that we should all think about is by annie dillard where she says how we live our days is how we live our lives True. so i think that someone as intentional as you has surely put into put his thought into how you structure a typical day and that's what I want to ask about and obviously today you've completely wasted you spent the whole day talking to me so it's not wasted for me it's wasted for you but thank you for that but what is the structure of your typical day like how do you think about it in terms of priorities and how you divide your time and the second part is a much more I think mechanistic question about your knowledge stack your tech stack what are your tools so 
Last few years, I have been quite intentional about uh, my life. I get up at uh, five o'clock in the morning. Five to six is something which I basically give it to myself. A little bit of stretching and kind of exercise movement, and then I head for gym at around six o'clock. Uh, six to seven thirty, I spend uh, time in a gym. Or if I go for a walk, I generally uh, go for a walk or a, s- a slow run that I would do around eight uh, kilometers uh, is what wow. I do. Hopefully, uh, listening to podcasts. Yeah, yeah, all the time listening to podcasts. So I uh, seen and unseen is I finish it in couple of days now. Uh, earlier I used to listen at one x. Now I listen at one point five, one point six x. Yeah, so I, I do that. So uh, gym or uh, basically exercise. Uh, I feel that ki with uh, my age, uh, focusing on health is very important. That's the ball I cannot drop, and that's the focus that I have. Then at around eight to nine, then get ready and uh, move to. Office. I try and work for one one and a half hour at stretch, and then take a break and maybe read something or listen to something for half an hour. Yeah, I I'm trying to bring a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, intentionality on reading, on uh, listening, on acquiring knowledge. But I think I I keep fighting the distractions. Uh, one of the biggest distraction is. Uh, the messages the whatsapp and all that and i i am trying to kind of work uh, on that uh, typical day in set around uh, 5 5:30 i squeeze in uh, an hour or so on uh, thinking about ideas that i want to write about i believe that writing is the way you have been talking about it very uh, again and again that ki writing is basically a way of thinking so i i when i when i think I, my thoughts are all jumbled but when i write i kind of see the dissonance i kind of see that how they are not structured and when i start writing the structure uh, comes in place and uh, that that's kind of peaceful also it's a very writing for me is meditative actually when i'm writing i i get stuff that i have in my head onto a piece of paper or maybe mostly onto a screen uh, onto maybe word or whatever and i i spend that one one and a half hour of thinking about ideas thinking about what i can write i write mostly on business stuff i write mostly on uh, linkedin what twice a week is what i have kept as a routine for myself uh, evenings generally i feel so i i eat uh, two meals a day so uh, same like you after i think you talked about cgm i also um, bought cgm and uh, my i was around 6.6 6.7 on my hba1c which i have brought it down to 5.7 oh, after nice. yeah lost around i was around 80 kg now i am 68 kg i lost. put you on to cgm right? yes you put me onto and CGM. Ajay put me onto CGM. So you are like Ajay's CGM grandchild. Yes, I am CGM. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then congratulations, yeah, that's yeah, delightful. Yeah, so so from, I bought it from Ultra Human and use that, and now I I do it. So around six months I had uh, the CGM device, and now I know what works, what does not work. So I moved to intermittent fasting also. So I eat. I don't have anything until one thirty in the afternoon. I have my two meals between one thirty and. Seven thirty or eight max, eight eight thirty. But finish my meal early, uh, retire to bed early, and maybe read something uh, at least for half an hour, forty five minutes before that, uh, or uh, while going off to sleep, maybe listen to something. So I listen to podcast or I listen to story tell. So story tell is something that gives me a nice, comfortable sleep. So listen to something and go off to sleep with that. Get up at. Uh, five o'clock in the morning, so get around seven and a half hours sleep at least every day, because I think that's uh, very important if you want to have a productive day every day. Sleeping on time, sleeping uh, almost uh, winding down an hour before you sleep, very important. So a couple of hours between your last meal and sleep is very important. So seven thirty to nine thirty is the time that I generally consciously build. This has been. Happening for last at least uh, three, three and a half years now. That's the way I spend day. I have destroyed your schedule today. Ah, oh, no, your streak is gone. So once in a while I do that. That's What okay. is like your tech stack? So tech stack basically uh, very simple. I um, uh, use so I I basically will write down ideas and then kind of uh, expand them. Then I use uh, Grammarly. Uh, sometimes sometimes I will use ChatGPT and get some kind of a drafts uh, done. 
but i don't pick up regular the way i i don't write or i don't put whatever is chat gpt given i don't do that i use it as more of a prompts and more of a idea and kind of a structure points more most of the time points and then expand those points and build on that so i do that there my reading most of the time happens uh, through ctq compound uh, whatever articles that come or i have uh, so what i have done is that i have my regular email id and i have a specified email id from hey so hey is a service uh, email service uh, charges around 100 dollars a year and my all uh, newsletters go to hey so if i go to hey it's only newsletters and nothing else and they have interesting feature that you cannot get spam over there at all so every time there is a mail you have to first agree or rather kind of a uh, white label the mail coming from some source and only when you white label that mail will come into inbox otherwise it will not come it will just be deleted so you don't get spam at all so i have my email id which is on hey.com so that is a service that i use so all newsletters come there so i just go to hey uh, account and i can see my read my newsletters one below other i, I have just uh, my uh, my regular email id does not get uh, newsletters at all and, and apparently the engineers who built hey hmm. they uh, only worked in, uh, during the day time oh, they yeah. never worked at night because apparently the founder had read somewhere make hey while the sun shines <laughs> Sorry, apologies. <laughs> Sorry, you can. Yeah. So these are the same guys who created this app called Basecamp. Basecamp is a project oh, yeah, management course, tool. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. same guys who have built this Hey, very interesting uh, product that they have. So Hey is what I used, and uh, then basically, if I like something, then I cut paste and kind of push that to Readwise. So Readwise is something where I uh, store everything. I have almost around I think three thousand, three thousand five hundred nuggets. of that and i use those nuggets again for uh, my linkedin uh, post so sometimes i may not have something interesting to write about or maybe i am been too lazy then i pick up one of these interesting kind of quote from there and i would write around 100 words around that but i do that but i i ensure that i do two posts a week because i think that's a kind of a discipline that i wanted to want to keep so use that use uh, notion to create the entire sub kind of repository so i have some kind of a gold readings which i keep putting recently what i did is that i wanted to become regular on to linkedin and i wanted to be i wanted to learn from young so i now have one uh, intern whom i have hired that intern is from pune amazing guy called akash and uh, uh, he is just 20 year old uh, i think he is a student uh, with a computer science student at uh, bharti vidyapeeth pune and he interns with me and one more gentleman who is i think a vc and he does he helps me on uh, the kind of understanding the text uh, tech in a uh, linkedin he and he gives me a list of what i could write upon and he would bring me every day at least around five different posts which are interesting posts on linkedin so uh, he he basically kind of does lot of research work for me and i i i basically learn from him the way young people think today's people and a damn smart young kid he is very very smart kid he is and i i met him in pune a couple of months back uh, interviewing him kind of ki how can he intern for me and what can he bring on the table and uh, what a amazing maturity that boy has just 20 years and he says that ki i do not have enough life experience so i would not like to talk much about me and what i can do but uh, uh, i i will deliver i asked him how much time will you give me and he said no 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 i don't work on time so i will not be able to give you time per se or day per se but you give me task and i'll try and finish i'll ensure that it is finished within the time line that you have given to me what a smart way i, I was never smart like this at my yeah, age 20 amazing guy akash is the limit akash is the limit yeah <laughs> she's the limit so 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 that's another way i learn technology he's a very fast kid uh, he set up my entire notion for my linkedin with my past uh, links for my past post links uh, Uh, the kind of engagement repository and linkedin algorithm all all understanding about linkedin he has given to me that's another way i learn readwise i told you about 
I, I keep experimenting a lot of uh, apps. So I, I'm a big fan of subscription. So I, for this entire HowFrameworks.com, uh, we have not used uh, human voiceover. So it's a uh, AI voiceover. So there is a, a service called Murph AI. So basically, you put uh, your text in, you put your text, and then it gives you voice, and it gives you different different uh, kind of uh, Indian voice or American voice, male, female, deep or playful all those combinations are there so it's a paid subscription and learning it was very interesting because uh, i had to kind of create pause so short pause long pause and kind of very very interesting tool so that's something that i have learned over the last three to six months time that's basically a simple tech stack amazing apart from the software what's your hardware like I can see some of it in front of me now, but uh, so I basically moved to Mac uh, in 2011. I found it to be a easy option because everything is uh, at one place. So I use Mac for my work. I use uh, iPad for my reading, and my phone is iPhone. And uh, my entire uh, health, so checking about my sleep times, checking about my exercise and all that works on Apple Watch. So I, I think I know you call it uh, gated yeah, technology, but I'm, I'm OK. I'm, I'm willing to give some freedom to get some convenience. So I'm happy with that. Well, I mean, it's a voluntary interaction, so that's perfectly fine. OK, so final question, uh, the, the part that you knew would come. Uh, recommendations for me and my listeners, uh, books, films, music, stuff that you love. So do you want me to talk only about books and uh, movies or you want to talk about my other interests? I didn't talk about. So I enjoy uh, once in a while a nice pick of a single malt whiskey. You can recommend that by all means. Yeah, please do. Okay, fine. So when it comes to books, so I, I knew this question would come. So I had done some kind of a homework. But I think uh, every entrepreneur or everybody in this world must read one book. If they have to read only one book, they should read Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. My, the hot of uh, concepts got cleared by that one book. And I feel that key, it's, it's an absolute first principle thinking that he talks about. He and talks, it's, it's based on uh, Basia's essay, That Which Is Seen and That Which yeah, Is I Not know, Seen, I which is that. also the inspiration for this podcast. Yeah, yeah. So amazing, amazing book. In the way he talks about tariffs, the way he talks about supply demand, the way he talks about taxes. So when you are paying 30% tax, you are actually working for the government for four months and three months stuff. Very interesting stuff. I never I knew that. Varnam Street's uh, The Great Mental Models. These are the volume, three book volume. Amazing book. One must uh, read. Atomic Habit has a huge impact on me. James Clear's book. So I think my lot of habits and the structure of habits come from there. Morgan Housel's Psychology of Money. Interesting book. Ray Dalio's Principles is another interesting book that one should definitely read. Cal Newport's uh, Deep Work. Uh, we all know uh, you have, it has been recommendation on your podcast for many uh, times and I think that's an interesting book. Uh, Steve Job, I, I like that guy uh, for what he built, Apple, the Apple that he has built, the company that he has built and Walter Isaacson's uh, biography of Steve Jobs, I, I like that. Uh, unusual, uh, another recommendation is uh, Open Autobiography of Andrea Agassi, very nice uh, book. Then all posts by Paul Graham, all posts on Farnam Street, all posts on Collab Fund. These are great. Yeah. If you look at the fiction, I recently, last one, one and a half year, I have read a book called Gentleman in Moscow. I think I think someone uh, told you about that book a couple of episodes back. And I think people have read, recommended yeah, it. People yeah, have recommended yeah, it. I think that's an interesting book. I love Rowington Mystery, the way he writes about Parsi households in Bombay and the times of 60s and 70s and 80s. His uh, Family Matters and a Fine Balance, amazing books. I love them. Frederick Backman's A Man Called O, it, it became a movie also. I think Man Called Otto is the movie that has come. Interesting book. Uh, Eleanor Elephant is completely fine. Uh, Gail Honeyman's uh, book about a girl in London, beautiful. Uh, Gachar Gochar, we all know, amazing book again. If I have to go back to Marathi, then I will talk about uh, the everything that you can read from P.L. Deshpande, Pula Deshpande, we call him. 
व्यक्तियन वल्ली इज गुड बटटे चिचाळ अनदर गुड बुक असामी असामी अपूर्वाई पूर्वरंग मधुमंगेश कर्णिक्स माहीमची खाडी ब्युटिफुल बुक देर इज वन बुक आय रिमेंबर दिस बुक आय ड्रेड वे बॅक इन नाईन्टीन नाईन्टी टू ऑर नाईन्टी थ्री बुक कॉल्ड अविरत बाय गाय कॉल्ड ऑथर कॉल्ड अनंत सामंत ही इज अ शिपी अँड इट इज अ बुक अबाउट अ शिपी हू कम्स बॅक टू इंडिया अँड स्टार्ट्स अ बिझनेस अँड हाऊ यू गेट्स लॉस्ट इन टू दी ब्युरोक्रेसी आय थिंक आय बॉट अ बुक वन डे बिफोर अँड देन नेक्स्ट डे मॉर्निंग आय वॉज जस्ट काइंड ऑफ गोईंग थ्रू इट की क्या आहे लेट मी हॅव अ लुक अँड इट वॉज सच अ फंटॅस्टिक बुक i started reading it at 6 o'clock in the morning and i think some 11 o'clock in the night i finished it i didn't go out i didn't go to work i just finished that book in one go wow that's is the, there a translation of it uh, i don't think so that book is not available rather currently that it is out of print wow. and i'm not getting it and i don't know where is my copy that i had bought then i, I think it was left in my nasik house then mrutyunjay swami shriman yogi these are interesting books in marathi radheya which is uh, ranjit desai's book karna's point of view yayati visakhandekar it's a masterpiece in marathi literature Uh, Dunyadari is another book about college life of uh, f- friends in college Suhas Shirvalkar amazing book another book in marathi by author called Vapukale partner very good book a uh, movie is uh, uh, my my I, i i listen i watch everything uh, so my my uh, book is my movies that i love godfather is one movie that i love janabi do yaro आय लव दिल चाहता है आय लव आय लव दिल्ली बेली आय लव दिल धड़कने दो लंच बॉक्स इज अमेजिंग मूवी वेकअप सीद अ डिफरंट मूवी धोबी घाट आय डोंट नो वट आय लाईक दॅट मूवी मसान इज अनदर गुड मूवी गँग्स ऑफ वॉसेपूर आय नो इट्स इट्स व्हेरी टिपिकल बट दॅट्स आय लाईक आय लाईक अ वेनसडे ऑल्सो देन आय स्टार्टेड लिसनिंग वॉचिंग दीज नॉन मराठी नॉन इंग्लिश मूवीज ऑल्सो अँड नॉट दी मेन स्ट्रीम मूवीज सो दिज मंडेला इन तमिल इंटरेस्टिंग मूवी अबाउट अ गाय अ बाबर हु बेसिकली गेट्स इन टू क्रॉस फायर ऑफ वोट्स अँड हाऊ ही गेट्स ट्रान्सफॉर्म अ टाऊन फॉर बेटर दिज अ फंटॅस्टिक मूवी कॉल्ड दी ग्रेट इंडियन किचन इन मलयालम अबाउट अ लेडी हाऊ शी हॅज टू गो थ्रू द किचन 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 ऑल द टाईम अँड हाऊ शी इज फ्रस्ट्रेटेड with that kumbh langi nights is very good movie subrat had talked about gamak ghar uh, interesting movie he also talked about banshees of insirin uh, those two amazing recommendations by subrat i watched them fun your recommendations about decalog and three colors those fantastic movies if you go back to marathi movies then jaitre jay simhasan umbartha court which is chaitanya tamane's movie then harishchandrachi factory uh, about uh, life of dava saheb phalke then dogi and dombili is uh, dombili fast another interesting movie if we have to go to otts then typical i have watched all the the big uh, imdb high numbers so game of thrones mad men west wing wire newsroom breaking bad sopranos ted lasso mind hunter i watched all of them mini series i loved chernobyl and the queen's gambit Uh, Indian OTT recently I watched The Hard amazing OTT uh, Guns and Gulab is interesting I watched Kohra I watch Asur Modern Love Chennai is very interesting it has uh, one uh, episode on how a man uh, married man falls in love with another uh, lady and how that lady comes and they have a very decent talk on he is falling in love with that girl and this lady who is his wife he decides to move away from his life and everything done so beautifully and so nicely uh, i don't know but i i i loved that so that modern love chennai i think it is episode 4 i uh, watched uh, the bear uh, the the chef uh, the story about a chef very interesting that's basically about the movies and otts and books all about you know okay i'll ask you a quiz question you once made this brilliant graphic of the scene and the unseen which i'll link from the show notes and you put it up on twitter about you know it was this animated graphic which charted the first 200 episodes i think length and everything which is beautiful so i'll ask you a quiz question since you know the show so well there's an episode that i recorded with subrat mohanty and jay arjun singh right you are aware of this episode yes what is unique about the episode which cannot be said for any other episode what is unique about the episode which cannot be said uh that's a absolute difficult question unique there's no other episode like it 
what tell me it is the only episode where f- f- making the show notes took more time for me than recording the episode oh because oh. subrat kept naming film after film <laughs> after film and uh, there were 400 links in the show notes oh, is it? and for each one i had to find out which you know where you could ah, actually I see know, the I film know. and not lazily link to the imdb I know. page I know. and it took me 11 hours to make the show notes oh god So just now when you were rattling off films and books and all, I was like, "Bus, bus, bus!" That pagle rolaiga. I'll send you the links. No, no, no. No, I'll still have to put them in my format, so it'll take me that much time only. No, no, it will, it will. Restaurants. You are a foodie. Tell me about your relationship with food. So I think I I love experimenting food, and though my uh, tastes are very traditional, but I within that traditional thing I kind of uh, experiment a bit, and uh, I I love Indian food, so I'm I'm like I don't waver too much. So I, I I'm a biryani fan. I I would I I would love. Uh, experimented multiple biryanis i still remember one biryani that i had at khan chacha in delhi khan chacha is known for his rolls but then i loved his biryani at and at just plain rice uh, i think uh, it was cooked in the the the, the meat and the kind of uh, flavors were amazing not no no spices nothing it's a plain simple biryani white biryani it was amazing so I I I love uh, so I I if you ask me which biryani I like I look I like I love Kolkata biryani I, that's my uh, biggest uh, yeah I I I had traveled to Calcutta just to kind of go around the city because I love Cal- Calcutta and I love food culture over there I have gone there is a place uh, there is there is an agency called Calcutta Walks they take you on a uh, kind of uh, different different walks though so you will they will take you to the various uh, parts of calcutta and there is a food trip also that they take you around with so so i have done that and it's not something which is very huge but yes uh, wherever i get an opportunity i try and uh, kind of experiment so i love konkan cafe in bombay which is basically a konkan cuisine next to that and there is thai pavilion both these restaurants are ananda solomon restaurants he was is a Uh, kind of a legendary chef from uh, Taj Group, and he I think uh, recently retired, uh, moved out, and started on his own. He has this uh, restaurant called Thai Nam uh, near Bombay Airport, International Airport. Americano is another uh, favorite uh, that is in South Bombay, Bombay Canteen, O Pedro Masala Library. These are again another uh, the restaurants uh, here in Bombay. I love Sin Sin for. their italian food akasan for its asian pan asian food uh, nutcracker is a vegetarian place uh, they give yeah but then their turkish eggs are amazing so eggs and vegetarian mask when pratik sadhu was there was uh, a fantastic place uh, enjoyed that uh, unusual places in bombay i think there is a place uh, i think I, i don't know whether you have eaten there or not but me and naren we have eaten we are both fans of that place called uh, hotel surekha which is uh, between thane and bhainder there is a place called uh, chena it's a creek and this is this fisherman family two brothers have started this restaurant which is a small place then now it has become a big restaurant with a family section and all and air condition and all uh, amazing prawns no one's taken me there this is very sad yeah. the restaurant should actually have been called bhatura because then you could have named that location chena bhatura <laughs> Carry on. What jokes? Carry on. Okay, so this on. is basically hotel Sureka. So I have always been in Dadar because of my school, and then there is a place uh, called Hotel Prakash. I had once taken Naren to that Dadar tour. So there is Hotel Prakash, which gives amazing sabudana vada, best sabudana vada in the world wow. you can get. So I still remember uh, when I used to be in school, I used to eat that sabudana vada once in fifteen days. So father used to give. Two rupees uh, as a pocket money, and uh, we would. I had a friend uh, who who used to travel from Vikroli uh, to Sadashram with me, and every fifteen days on Saturday we would splurge that on sabudana vada. So sabudana vada was one rupee a plate then. Wow, one rupee a plate. And now I I keep going there. So recently, I think a couple of months back, I must have gone there. It is I think seventy three rupees a plate now. Did you have your CGM on? Like uh, pure starch. I know that, but once in a while it's fine. It's okay. I do that once in a while just for the sake of it. So Prakash is amazing. There is Ashok Vada Pav. I think everybody loves near Kirti College. That's an amazing Vada Pav. Then, uh, if you ask all cricketers, so Sachin or maybe even Vinod Kamli, they would swear by uh, there is Bhaji Pav, so Batata Bhaji and Pav. 
at Udyan Ganesh. There is a temple in Shivaji Park called Udyan Ganesh Mandir. And next to that temple, there is a Bhaji Vada Pawala. And he has a, this Bhaji Pao, which is very famous. All the cricketers uh, who played at Shivaji Park would know them. And then there is this uh, Chabil Das Vada that everybody knows, which is called Shri Krishna Vada, which is amazing. Uh, used to be around 55 paise then. Uh, in 1983-84, I think it's some 40 bucks now a plate. And they have amazing samosa, which is filled with kanda poa. It's a very different. These are all full of carbs, full of carbs. But once in a while, I go for the nostalgia that is there. Then there is this uh, Thane, we have Mamledar misal, which is basically very spicy misal. And they're there. So they, the way they say is that ki, it is uh, tikhat, it is khup tikhat. And bharpur tikat. So, which is basically <laughs> spicy, super spicy and super, super spicy. And super spicy is really, really a thing. Narendra and me, we have thought of going there next time when he is around in Thane. Then there are some interesting restaurants in Thane, in Nasik. Uh, so, we have been there. There are all, again, mutton restaurants. Uh, Puna, I love Marzorin, which is sandwiches, amazing sandwiches that are there. I have, when I was in Blue Star, I used to go to a restaurant called Cafe Naz in Pune. I think it is still there. Amazing samosas. And the speciality of that is that you won't order a plate of samosa. They will always get you a dozen samosas and you eat and whatever is remaining, then they will bill it. So they will remaining, they will take back and bill you for the rest. So if your remaining is two, that means you have eaten 10, they will always give you a dozen samosas. If there are three, four people, they'll give you a dozen samosas. But they'll bill you for 10 if you've eaten 10. Yeah, or they'll yeah, bill you yeah. for all 12. No, they will they bill you for 10 only. They'll bill you for 10. <laughs> but they'll put 12 in front of yeah, you. But they will put 12 in front of you. So this what is, a marketing strategy. This is both very good and very bad. Very <laughs> bad. But interesting, Cafe Naz in Pune. In Bangalore, interesting restaurant called Karavli, which is at Taj. Then there is Spunu Swami in Chennai. Kolkata, there is Arsalan, amazing food. Flurries is amazing breakfast. Peter Cat uh, has chelo kebabs there. There is typical Bangla food if you want to eat a thali. There is a place called Aheli and Six Baliganj place. Uh, there are famous Nizam rolls there. And then there is a Typical Jalmuri, which is what we call uh, Bhel in Bombay, but they call Jalmuri a, a different test. The Middleton and Camac Street Junction. Recently, I think Did you enjoy Shubhat this episode of the Serial MC? If so, would you place. like to support the I production of the show? You can go over That's to Serial MC if you want to support and support on it and contribute cat, what any you amount you like to keep this podcast <laughs> alive <laughs> and <laughs> kicking. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, carry on. So I think that's it. Basically, I think I would not like to take too much of time. Uh, this, these are the things that I enjoy and love. Perfumes. You told me something very interesting about perfumes once. And you know the importance they have in your life. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. So uh, I have this uh, association with perfumes that I always felt uh, anybody who is rich uh, smelled better. And uh, that's what my kind of aspiration to be. I, if I have made money, then I should smell better. And uh, that's how I had seen people, my my boss, I used to, my super boss, one Mr. Garde, uh, who used to be in Blue Star, had amazing uh, perfumes on him. And I always used to wonder about those perfumes. And that kind of became kind of obsession for me. And when I had some money uh, and when I had some kind of a, a kind of affluence in life, I bought a lot of perfume. I, I love perfumes and I buy Ami, Chanel, Giorgio Armani, Calvin Klein, Dior, Hugo. I, I have... Uh, what is a desert island perfume? Desert island perfume is what? That? Like the one perfume, you only allowed one perfume for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's Ami's, uh, Te De Ami is a beautiful perfume. I have, I think three bottles of them. I have them. I, I love that perfume. That's, that's the perfume that I can always wear anytime. Beautiful. Marvelous. On that note, uh, Sudhir, uh, thank you so much. I've had, you know, I don't know where the day went. It's been such a wonderful time. And yeah. And this is the first time you're here, obviously not the last time. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, check out the show notes center rabbit holes at will. You can follow Sudhir on Twitter at Sudhir Sarnobar. That's one word. You can follow me on Twitter at Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-B-A-R-M-A. -A. You can browse past episodes of The Scene and the Unseen at sceneunseen.in. Thank you for listening. 
Did you enjoy this episode of The Scene and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to sceneunseen.in/support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.